Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening. I hereby call the Palm Springs regular city council meeting of May 27th, 2021 to order. Council member Woods, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight? <laughs> Certainly. Thank you. Certainly, you got it. As we all rise, face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. City Clerk, if you could please conduct a roll call. Council Member Garner. Here. Council Member Kors. Yeah, here. Council Member Woods. Here. Mayor Pro Tim Middleton. Present. Mayor Holstedge. Here. All council members are present. Thank you. Tonight we have two presentations. So the first is a COVID-19 case update from Emergency Management Coordinator Danny DeSelm. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council. Uh, just a quick update on COVID stats. Uh, the county continues to hover just above the threshold to break into the yellow tier. Uh, it's actually unlikely that we will break two cases uh, per day per 100,000 prior to the uh, June 15th uh, line in the sand. Uh, on, the, on the good side though, numbers are continuing to stay relatively consistent uh, and deaths have drastically gone down. So far this week, the county has only had four deaths from COVID. Uh, the city of Palm Springs is actually going on its seventh week without a, a COVID fatality, which is actually pretty fantastic. Uh, as of right now, the city's tracking 144 active cases of COVID. Uh, that is for residents, so when uh, the assistant city manager gives a brief on the wastewater treatment, those numbers are gonna look a little bit different because uh, if anybody's seen downtown, we have a lot of visitors, which is gonna throw off uh, that metric. Some interesting uh, stuff on uh, vaccinations. As we know, all people 12 and older can get the vaccine now. Um, Moderna is on track to be able to be given to children 12 to 17. Uh, and then as of today, California, California has started a lottery for uh, COVID vaccines. If you've already gotten the vaccine, you are entered into that lottery. Uh, the, Top prize is $1.5 million uh, as an incentive for those that haven't gotten the vaccine to get it. Uh, <laughs> so for Palm Springs, that's actually pretty good because 80% or just above 80% of our residents have the vaccine. So hopefully we get uh, some of that prize money coming to the city. Uh, that's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Are there any questions? I don't see any. Thank you for the presentation. The next presentation is a COVID-19 wastewater treatment update from Assistant City Manager Marcus Fuller. Thank you, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> uh, following up on Mr. DeSelms, uh, we are continuing to see metrics in our wastewater flow consistent with county and state metrics. Uh, as a reminder, our, our lowest uh, rate of the COVID viral load in our wastewater stream, which is measured uh, per liter, was uh, back on Labor Day last September of 66.85. We spiked around Christmas to over 2.6 million. And we had our lowest ever last week uh, at 32.09. It was a, a, a level that they can't even quantify the number of cases, which is awesome. Um, and so you can see here, we've just continued that slow, gradual decline <clears throat> that's uh, consistent with what you heard in the last report. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, last Monday, Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday, they did have a viral load of 9,100, which in their modeling is 140 cases. But the day before, it was uh, so low that they couldn't quantify in their model any number of cases. Um, as compared to the week before, 
Um, again, a slight gradual reduction. We did get results for this last Monday, uh, and it was 13,000. So it's around the same level, uh, real low number of cases. Uh, and we might <clears throat> give some thought to suspending the testing after June 15th, uh, and, um, and then hopefully we don't see any spikes. And if we were to see any kind of increase or uptick, we could restart the, the tests. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, we've been testing for any of the mutations because we were concerned with our uh, transient population, with our tourists, that that might be introduced into our community. Um, the samples from last week showed very low levels of the mutations, and the good news is that the, uh, the other mutations are no longer present, but the UK variant is continuing to be present, but at very low levels. Uh, and in fact, May 18th, we had no detection of any mutations. And so this is the Venn diagram for the various gene mutations. You need two mutations to be present to confirm that the variant is present in the community. So we've consistently had those two mutations for the UK variant, but in the last week, the two, two days that were tested, neither of those mutations were present, so that South African and Brazilian variant, which did show up in the past, uh, is no longer present. So we just continue to indicate that uh, we have to remain vigilant and use face masks and social distancing and other measures so we can continue to reduce the presence of COVID in our community. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for the presentation. The next item is acceptance of the agenda. The city council will discuss the order of the agenda, may amend the order, add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items or request consent calendar items be removed for separate discussion. I'd like to entertain a motion for acceptance of the agenda and are there any items that staff or a council member would like removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion or separate vote. Council member Kors. Um, yeah, I'd like to remove item 1L. Thank you. Council member Wood. I'd like to remove item 1Z as in zebra. Thank you. Any other items from council members? Com Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Uh, I would like to remove item 1AA. Thank you. Council Member Garner, any items you'd like to pull? Staff, are there any items that you would like to pull for separate discussion? Um, Madam Mayor, uh, regarding item uh, 1AA, uh, staff is requesting that the City Council add consideration of issuing a letter of support for Assembly Bill 339 as consent calendar item 1AA due to the matter coming to the attention of the city after the posting of the agenda. And there's a need for immediate action and a staff report has been distributed to the city council and posted online. Thank you. Is there a motion to accept the agenda with the addition of item 1AA and item 1AA, 1L and 1Z? Um, remove for separate discussion and vote. Move to accept. Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Garner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton? Aye. Council Member Kors? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Mayor Holstedge? Yes. M motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is report of closed session from the city attorney. Yes, Honorable Mayor, members of the city council, uh, members of the public, the city council met earlier this afternoon in closed session uh, to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda. There was reportable action in the form of approval by the city council by a 5-0 vote uh, with regard to a conflict waiver letter for um, one of the open session items, uh, and that has to do with uh, Best Bess and Krieger's uh, performance of legal services, both as city attorney as well as a legal counsel for the independent city's financing authority. Uh, a copy of that document is available to the public if they're so interested. Uh, other than that, there's no reportable action. 
Thank you, City Attorney. If you could just explain what a conflict waiver is for members of the public who might not have followed what that means. Sure, absolutely. So under California uh, uh, legal ethics rules, uh, if a law firm is representing two parties uh, that have a potential for a clash of duties, uh, they're required to give uh, informed uh, consent or provide uh, informed consent from uh, those clients. Uh, in this case, uh, the other agency, the other public agency, Independent Cities Financing Authority, has provided that waiver and um, uh, the item that was uh, discussed and acted on tonight uh, would be uh, approval from the City Council on that item. Thank you. The next item is public testimony. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You are asked to please begin your time by telling us what agenda item or agenda items you are speaking about. Please note that testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comment for subjects not on the agenda will be taken later in the evening. Tonight, the city clerk will be contacting speakers by telephone. City clerk, if you could please begin. Richard Markusen, you're live with the Palm Springs Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. I'm sorry? Uh, you can begin, you have two minutes. Oh, thank you. Uh, council members, uh, I'm Richard Markison, uh, and I represent uh, the Western Electrical Contractors Association, the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors of California, the American Fire Sprinkler Association, and the Independent Roofing Contractors of California. Uh, your staff work uh, has been, I think, exceptional uh, in analyzing the benefits to the city uh, from a, a committee workforce agreement, or as we prefer to call them, a project labor agreement. But I, I think the important thing for you to consider tonight is, do you want to advance an agreement with a party uh, that has basically told uh, your city staff, uh, who uh, essentially work for you and the city manager, to pound sand and have completely refused to incorporate in a community workforce agreement, PLA, provisions that would protect local contractors from the deleterious effects of a project labor agreement or protect the city itself from potential litigation. I think it is clear that the ostensible uh, a counterparty uh, in this case has no interest uh, in uh, being a collaborative partner uh, with the city council. And so accordingly, on behalf of my clients, uh, I would encourage you uh, to simply reject the proposal for a project labor agreement, community workforce agreement for the city of Palm Springs. Let the existing system work, uh, which uh, seems to be working fine, and uh, embrace local contractors and local workers, irrespective of their participation in a uh, collective bargaining agreement, and embrace fair and open competition. Thanks very much, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and remember what we are celebrating uh, this three-day event. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Megan Goring, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Good evening, council members. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on a subject that's important to me and many others in our community. My name is Megan Goring and I manage the certified farmer's market here in Palm Springs. For the ninth year, our market folks are preparing to make the transition from our outdoor home next to the nonprofit that runs our organization, the Palm Springs Cultural Center, to the Palm Springs Pavilion. This shift in shelter, which occurs from June to September, not only keeps our produce perky, but allows our participants and customers to shop and not break a sweat. Our farmer's market is a resource to the community for a variety of reasons, but primarily as a conduit for fruits and vegetables grown by small-scale farmers from Southern California and prepared products made by culinary entrepreneurs. During the past pandemic year, we were allowed to remain open as an essential service as we provide not only an economic launch pad for small businesses, but also access to one of our most important needs, food. 
The pavilion is perfect for our event because of the miracle of climate control and abundant space, but we also help distribute important nutrition funds, such as the summer women, infant, and children vouchers, senior vouchers, and Snap CalFresh. Plus, the 10 for 10 matching funds we offer to all of these programs. We're also looking forward to collaborating for the first time with the Monday through Friday inhabitant of the pavilion, the Palm Springs Parks and Recreation Summer Day Camp. This year, the first week of July is dubbed Farm to Camp, and we can't wait to share our yummy food and brand new nutrition education video series with the kids of Camp Palm Springs. Without the city's generous sponsorship in the yearly waiver of pavilion fees, none of this would be possible. I ask you on behalf of my farmers, vendors, and customers to give consent to item 1T. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Albright? Jimmy Elrod, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, honorable uh, council members. Uh, my name is Jimmy Elrod. Uh, I'm a representative with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters, <clears throat> having the uh, honor of representing uh, roughly 58,000 hardworking, highly skilled uh, carpenters all throughout the Southwest. Uh, most importantly, uh, locally there within the Coachella Valley, we represent upwards of uh, about 700 members. Um, these are members that more often than not have to make long commutes uh, to distance areas in order to get meaningful employment and uh, are excited uh, about the possibility of having opportunities work closer to home, especially uh, within the city of Palm Springs where uh, they find themselves more often than not uh, spending quality time with their families and uh, spending their hard-earned monies uh, there in the city. Um, beyond uh, our existing uh, workforce in the local uh, region and area, uh, such an agreement uh, such as proposed with 4A, um, this would also create more opportunities for uh, future workforce. And ultimately, uh, we at the Carpenters look forward to uh, doing you know, some community outreach and uh, job fairs to expand upon the awareness of the opportunities that we had within the construction trades. On that note, I respectfully ask that you please consider uh, voting in favor of item 4A greatly appreciate your time and it's been a, a great pleasure and an honor getting to work with your staff during the process of, of this whole um, agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Jay Huggins, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Okay, awesome. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, to everybody for having me on. So my name's uh, Jay Huggins, also uh, by Jack. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of the Valley, and um, I, <laughs> I've done a lot with Palm Springs, guys. I've, uh, I joined a, a, a carpenter's union in, in Palm Springs. I was married in Palm Springs. My kids are born in Palm Springs. But also, I'm the president of a gem and mineral society out of Palm Springs. We meet in the church in Palm Springs. Um, just celebrated my 25th wedding anniversary. We ate in Palm Springs is the same place we got married. So I'm a, I guess I'm a good example of a, a Palm Springs resident. And I'll, I'm speaking tonight on favor of a measure or item uh, 4A. Uh, agreements like this will support someone like me. Because in my 28 years in the trade, I've only worked in the city of Palm Springs one day. I generally drive out of town. And um, I, need, uh, I need to stay closer to home. I need to work in the community uh, that I support, that my tax dollars goes to support, um, that I want to volunteer in, that I want to be a part of. So this measure will help, without a doubt, the local hire, um, also a skilled and trained workforce, which is what I am. You can have your projects built better, safer, 
and a greater generation of community wealth, right? By keeping our funds here and not shipping it off to Arizona where these foreign workers come in and work from. And then obviously more career opportunities for our citizens uh, within the trades for our future. Uh, Building's not going away. You guys know this. We're going to continue to build. So um, I just appreciate your support. I appreciate your guys' time. And uh, again, thank you guys very much. And please support uh, Agenda Item 4A. Thank Thank you. Simone Sandoval, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hi, thank you, and good evening. My name is Simone Sandoval. I am a Palm Springs resident. I am a CVKN board member, and I'm director of the licensing and compliance for Global Go, which is a cannabis consulting company. I'm here to speak on behalf of item 3A, which is the labor peace agreement section. Um, It appears that Palm Springs is seeking to reduce the number of employees required to trigger a labor peace agreement to five employees instead of the top 20 non-supervisory employees set by the state. And it appears that the purpose is to afford unions greater rights than provided under state or federal law and to make it easier for these unions to organize these cannabis businesses. If you reduce this to five employees, which is a very low number, Palm Springs cannabis businesses would face basically an all or nothing choice. If a business refuses to negotiate an LPA, it effectively bruises the right to do business in Palm Springs. But if the cannabis business negotiates the LPA, then now the union knows full well that it can hold out for significant concessions in exchange for members giving up the power to strike. This essentially disrupts the balance of power between cannabis businesses and unions. And for those reasons, uh, we are opposed to this policy change, and we respectfully request that you do not lower uh, the employee number. I would also like to speak on item 2C, uh, but I was told I, I'm only supposed to speak on 3A. Would I have a callback to yes, give you... my comments on 2C? Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Okay, great. Thank you. That is all. Thank you. Russell Johnson, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. My name is Russell Johnson. I'm with the Associated Builders and Contractors Southern California Chapter. Uh, Thank you again for the opportunity to comment on item 4A, the Community Workforce Agreement. Uh, ABC uh, believes that you need to make some revisions to the Community Workforce Agreement that has been presented before you this evening. Uh, We run four apprenticeship programs and four different crafts in Southern California, and currently our apprentices would be shut out from participating if the uh, Community Workforce Agreement were to pass in its current form. Also, we believe that amendments should be made to not only protect the city, but also to protect um, uh, the fact that you have local contractors that should be exempted from uh, being having to comply with the Community Workforce Agreement. After all, one of the purported goals of the Community Workforce Agreement was that you would have local hire. And if you've got a local contractor, you're, you're achieving your local hire goals because they have local employees. Uh, with that, we ask that you please continue to ask the building trades to negotiate in good faith, meet you in the middle, and uh, make amendments so that the community workforce agreement can serve the entire community and not just a fraction of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Omar Kobian, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Uh, fellow city council members and staff, my name is Omar Kobian. I'm a resident of the Coachella Valley. Uh, I'm excited to hear that the city of Palm Springs is taking steps to create this opportunity to hire locally trained and skilled workforce. I've lived in the Coachella Valley for over 20 years, and um, being a union carpenter, this requirement would give my family and I more quality time allowing me to be uh, the opportunity to work closer to home and not be stuck in the freeway for over 20 to 30 hours a week in traffic. <clears throat> My son will be 18 next year and he wants to get into the trades. For a young adult to be able to start his career close to home is very important. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your decision and uh, I am in full support of item 4A. Thank you. Thank you.
Aaron Valverde, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor and... Hi, sorry about that. Um, good evening, Mayor Holstage and members of the council. My name is Aaron Velarde and I'm an organizer with UFCW Local 1167. I'm calling in tonight in support of item 3A, which would require cannabis businesses to enter into a worker peace agreement. LPAs help create a true partnership between employers, workers, and the union. We work to offer working trainings, worker trainings, and jobs with access to health benefits and good wages, which help set the standards for the types of jobs that are being created by the cannabis industry. For these reasons, I strongly urge the city council to vote to approve agenda item 3A as written requiring that employers with five or more employees enter into an LPA, uh, which will result in a more stable and pros prosperous industry, allowing tax revenue to grow without fear of disruption. A lower threshold also will increase the opportunity for more workers in Palm Springs to have family sustaining wages and benefits such as healthcare, pension, apprenticeship programs, and health and safety training. Thank you for all that you do for the city and residents of Palm Springs. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bill Perez, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, I'm Bill Perez with the Building Construction Trades Council, covering the Allen Empire, San and Riverside Counties. Um, calling to uh, uh, ask you to please uh, move forward uh, with your consideration on Item 4A, the Community Workforce Agreement. And I'd like to take this opportunity ahead of time to thank the council members, mayor, and especially the staff for all the calls, uh, conversations, and the work that's been put into what, uh, what I think is, uh, is a comprehensive agreement that serves uh, the community, serves the trades, and uh, the city of Palm Springs. Uh, thank you for your consideration, and uh, hope you will pass the community workforce agreement on item 4A. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Christian, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Greetings, Council. Greetings, Council members. Sorry. Greetings, Council members. Eric Christian with the Coalition for Fair Employment and Consumption. And I appreciate the uh, time you've put into this discussion and hearing from both sides. I appreciate your listening to our members on the Zoom calls where we've had meetings. Um, tonight, I just want to encourage you, uh, labor has not uh, budged at all on two very important issues that are just basic fairness. Um, union, uh, non-union apprenticeship programs and the young men and women in those apprentice pr apprenticeship programs need to be allowed to work on your projects. They should not be explicitly excluded. Discrimination is not a good look and it doesn't need to happen here in, in Palm Springs. Secondly, they're not allowing for the wages that go towards people's benefit packages to go to the worker versus into the union benefits that they will not vest in. They will not vest in those. Those monies will be lost to the workers. Those are two very simple, non-controversial issues. And it really... I think highlights the issue, what's at issue here. Is this really about local hire or is this about making it more difficult for the 86% of the construction workforce that's union free to be able to work on Palm Springs city projects? So please fight for the rights of the workers and the young men and women in the apprenticeship programs, state approved apprenticeship programs, and allow them all to keep their money that they earn and to work free of the discrimination of those provisions that exclude them uh, as your PLA is currently construed. So thank you for your time. And again, for the amount of time and effort you put into this and hearing from uh, both sides. Have a good night. Thank you. Raul Gadea, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. 
Good evening, council members. Uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to, to speak. Uh, my name is Raul Gadea Jr. I'm with Associated General Contractors Apprenticeship and Training. We are a non-union apprenticeship program. Uh, our facility is based out of Riverside. Uh, so we part of our uh, jurisdiction is Riverside County, San Bernardino County. And I'm speaking on the uh, Community Workforce Agreement, or Agenda Item 4A. And I want to strongly urge you to vote no. Uh, contrary to what the building trades have painted this to be, it is highly discriminatory to programs such as ours. And one of the things that uh, I'm hoping that you do your due diligence, again, a non-union contractor working on these, although they claim they're non-discriminatory, uh, they, their workers will lose out on all of their a portion of their fringe benefits, or if not all. And so one of the biggest things that affects us directly is that none of our apprentices are allowed to work on any project that has that type of agreement on it. We refer to them as project labor agreements or PLAs. And they're the same thing, CWA, PLA, it's the same thing. Uh, so again, I thank you for uh, giving me your time. And I, again, strongly hope that you reconsider and vote no on this community workforce agreement. Thank you again for your time. Good evening. Thank you. Madam Mayor and City Council, uh, I was able to reach everyone who registered for public comment tonight. Uh, I'll note that for those people who uh, desire to speak on item 2C, which is uh, related to the user and regulatory fees, uh, we will be calling you when that public hearing begins. And for those of you who wanted to speak on non-agenda public comment, uh, we will be giving you a call um, at or around 9 o'clock. Thank you, City Clerk, and thank you to everyone who called in. The next item is City Council and City Manager comments and reports. Do any council members have reports at this time? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, and then Council Member Garner, and then Council Member Kors. All right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a few things to uh, discuss. Uh, earlier this week, we had a Sunline Transit uh, uh, Board of Directors meeting as well as various committee meetings. And one of the uh, programs that was initiated uh, about three years ago uh, by uh, Sunline was working in collaboration with the College of the Desert to provide what was known as the Hall Pass program, whereby students at COD could ride for free on uh, any Sunline uh, Transit bus. Uh, and it did not matter whether they were going to school, going to work, going to uh, recreation, going to uh, the market, whatever it may be, uh, as a student at COD, uh, that program was, or those buses were free for them. Uh, then uh, within the last year and a half, that was expanded to students that are at the Cal State uh, San Bernardino campus in Palm Desert. And I am very pleased to report that uh, beginning September 1st, that program will be expanded to all to students at all 19 high schools throughout the Coachella Valley that they will be able uh, to travel uh, anywhere uh, that a Sunline Transit uh, bus goes, which uh, extends not only here in the Coachella Valley, but there's a connection uh, that takes them to the Cal State uh, University San Bernardino campus, as well as to uh, the Metrolink uh, station in uh, uh, San Bernardino. Uh, the total cost of this program is approximately $775,000, uh, and uh, we will begin uh, with marketing the, and outreach for the program in June. Uh, there will be applications uh, that uh, students will get there will be a uh, app that they can use on uh, their uh, phones and they can find someone old like me and show them how an app actually works. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is just a really nice program that uh, uh, I want to thank everyone associated with Sunline uh, and all of our uh, high schools uh, for making possible. Uh, secondly, uh, 
earlier this month, we had a presentation at the Riverside County uh, Transportation Commission on the San Gorgonio Pass Rail Program. Uh, and that is a effort that goes back decades to try to bring uh, regular rail service uh, to the Coachella Valley. It was a really good presentation that we received. We've gone through some of the uh, most important environmental work. Uh, there's one very, very important issue still outstanding, and that's obtaining uh, all of the funding that it will take to build this program, or excuse me, build this uh, rail. Uh, there is uh, a station in Palm Springs that is planned uh, in the environmental report uh, and I've asked the city manager to arrange with RCTC staff to give a presentation to city council on uh, this proposal. It will take about 10 minutes and uh, it will be uh, uh, one of the inspiring uh, potentials that we have. This is a generational uh, public works project uh, for our valley and uh, I was really pleased at RCTC with the uh, type of support uh, that we received, not only throughout the Coachella Valley, uh, but the San Gargonio Pass area as well. And RCTC staff have just been outstanding in their efforts uh, on this program. Uh, and a very last word uh, on this, uh, uh, the uh, wonderful uh, and deeply missed uh, City Council Member Greg Pettis. Uh, this was his project and his baby. Uh, and uh, if it gets built, he won't be here uh, to see uh, to see it ultimately come. But uh, he was remembered uh, during the RCTC meeting uh, with uh, incredible infection by numerous people. Uh, an issue uh, involving CalPERS that uh, I just want to draw some attention to. Uh, over the course of this past week, if you've been reading the national news, uh, ExxonMobil had a contested fight for two seats on their board of directors uh, and two individuals who are deeply associated with uh, climate change uh, programs and trying to address uh, climate change were elected in defiance of the uh, recommendations of the uh, chief executive and of the uh, board of directors of uh, ExxonMobil. And uh, many organizations came together to make uh, that vote happen. But uh, CalPERS, along with CalSTRS, the California Teachers Retirement System, New York Retirement, and frankly, working with some of the leading private equity uh, firms in uh, the world were responsible for putting together the votes that uh, put two climate action activists on Exxon's uh, board of directors. Uh, so really pleased by that. Lastly, uh, I don't want to go through all of the issues that have emerged uh, at the last city council meeting, but one of the things that happened is something that has happened before and that is uh, one group of individuals very responsibly stepping up on a consent item and providing testimony when many other individuals who also had an equally passionate uh, interest in that subject didn't realize that because it was on consent uh, that uh, there was the potential for something to be voted down. So I would like to ask staff to take a look at a procedural change for consent items that would allow an item that was on consent to be pulled and approved, pulled and deferred, but that would not allow something to be pulled and defeated uh, if it was on consent. Instead, it would have to be set for a second uh, uh, meeting to, uh, to discuss, at which time everyone in our community would uh, uh, be fully aware of uh, the debate that was emerging and have an opportunity to speak in a timely fashion. Uh, and again, that's a request for staff to look at that and come back to us. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Councilmember Garner. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, for all that information. A lot of good stuff. Uh, so I just had a few things to share. Uh, one of the things is a resident in Palm Springs reached out to me about speaking at her digital politics class at UCR. So I got to do that a couple of weeks ago. And, and I just, I've done this a few times at different, at elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, you name it. Uh, and so if anyone ever wants to um, have me or I'm sure others on the council talk to your, their classes, you know, reach out to us. I think it's, it's quite a joy to do and make sure that uh, our youth and our young people are aware of all of the opportunities that are uh, in front of them. So thank you for that opportunity. Uh, the other is that we had a Spanish language meeting uh, along with myself and Sergio Espericueta, who is the Palm Springs Unified board member um, for part of Palm Springs. He covers uh, most of Duluth Park and then into Dream Homes and Cathedral City. Um, so we did an, a joint event uh, with a small group of residents and it was also streamed on the Spanish language Facebook page. It was really interesting to have residents share and ask questions to us. And just a few of the things that got brought up were several issues were raised about the Golden Sands Mobile Home Park and needs for repairs in the community center and just around uh, throughout that community. And so I've, I've been talking to staff about that. And then the other was Wi-Fi connections. You know, there was a really robust discussion about the need for um, better Wi-Fi in the city, for um, the, the, that the cost is really expensive. Um, there's discussions about the need for multiple routers just to make things work. Uh, and this has really been burdensome because so many of pretty much everybody that was there that evening uh, had children and, and multiple kids that were trying to go through Zoom school. So just wanted to raise those issues to the council as things that I know that we've all been um, cognizant of, but that they're, they're being uh, um, elevated again as we discuss um, um, more in August and vision plan. The last thing is congratulations, class of 2021. Uh, Palm Springs High School's graduation is tonight. Uh, I am just so proud to be a Palm Springs High alum. And I'm, I'm just so excited to all for all of the graduates, not just in Palm Springs, but throughout the Coachella Valley. Uh, there's just so much opportunity for you, and we hope that uh, you'll consider uh, staying around sometime and, and joining us here in the city with your work or, um, or, or just somewhere nearby. So if you ever want to talk about jobs or next steps, you know, reach out. But we're all just so proud of you. Well said. Thank you, Councilmember Garner. Councilmember Kors. Um. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Council Member Garner. And we're thrilled to have a Palm Springs High School grad on the council. Um, and we hope to have more from this graduating class in the years ahead. A uh, couple of things I want to share. So one, for quite some time, I've been in conversation with the Blue Zone Project. And just really briefly for council, uh, Blue Zones uh, was founded by someone who worked with National Geographic and did expeditions uh, to the places in the world where people live the longest, healthiest and really looked at what the common factors were in working with researchers for health and wellness um, and a purposeful life. And they currently work with 60 municipalities around the country, including in the beach cities, uh, Redondo Beach, Manhattan Beach, um, with some really amazing results. And so I did some outreach and they just did a first presentation, uh, which the city manager, assistant uh, city manager, and mayor were on as, long, as well as the CEOs of um, Desert Healthcare District, Eisenhower, uh, Coachella Valley Association of Governments, and the Greater Palm Springs Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, really interesting, lots of questions, of course, um, but I'd like to, whether we want to schedule just a broader discussion uh, with council at some point, or when we do goal setting, just I think things we can do to improve the health and wellness of our residents is probably the most important thing we as a council and as a city can do. So it was really interesting. Um, I'll have staff share some information from that, but I just want to let folks know we had a meeting, initial presentation last week, uh, just to make those introductions and whether we want to do it in Palm Springs, we'll all discuss. 
whether it might be broad in the Coachella Valley, but just a real opportunity to focus on health and wellness. They focus on food deserts and policies uh, to really help end some of the health disparities that we see in our city and really throughout the country. Um, we had our quarterly, although I think it's becoming now monthly, business retention meeting a few weeks ago. Uh, it's normally Mayor Holstage and myself. Uh, um, it was Councilmember Woods and I, since the whole meeting was taken up talking about parklets. And since we've been working on that due to the Brown Act, uh, Councilmember Woods stepped in and we got just great feedback. We had probably 40, 50 people on the Zoom who just shared different ideas on how we move forward with parklets. And I want to let council know that the Senate bill, which we're supporting 314 to allow the parklets to continue for a year, has moved um, forward and it's not going to be on a special consent um, calendar item in the legislature. Um, next thing I want to touch on is um, lots of tourism meetings, but we had the uh, month May meeting of the um, Greater Palm Springs Convention of Visitors Bureau. I just want to show sort of two slides. Um, I'm going to look because I can see it better here. Um, one is the economic impact as, um, from COVID. And as you can see, really a more than 50% reduction in economic impact, loss of 38% of jobs, literally 20,000 tourism jobs in the Valley, 40% reduction in visitors, um, close to 50% in overnight visitors between 2019 and 2020. The one thing I just want to point out that we learned at the meeting is while 2021 is clearly better and a lot of people think everything's back to normal, we're not the earliest we can hope to be back to normal from an economic and jobs impact is not until 2022 because of the loss of uh, conventions and uh, meet, meetings in Palm Springs and the Valley. We're just not having the midweek folks coming uh, that we're used to. So we still have a ways to go to get out of um, the hole that you know happened because of COVID, but we are heading in the right direction. The other thing that was shared, which I think is really um, something that will help, is just our May to September seats on air, air flights. And as you can see from 614 in 2003, we're going to be at a record uh, over 2,600 uh, this year, which is literally over 1,000 more seats than we've ever had. And Southwest is a big part of that, but the more airlines that they're moving more to leisure from business travel and seeing Palm Springs as a successful destination. So I just wanted to share that with council. Um, there is a probably 70 page uh, presentation that is available on the CVV website for those who want to read it. We got a great presentation on what brings people to Palm Springs versus other areas. And last thing I wanted to share was um, we got a the analysis of our um, decade on greenhouse gas emissions. And we actually have achieved, um, achieved more than California's ambitious goals with a 16% reduction than a decade ago. And that's almost entirely uh, because of desert community energy and the fact that over 80% of our residents and businesses are choosing 100% carbon-free power. Without desert community energy, we would have seen a 5% increase in greenhouse gas emissions. So just in that one year, we had a 21% uh, swing. So really thank you to all the residents who are um, having 100% carbon-free power. And for those who want a less expensive option, Desert Community Saver, it's a phone call or online at Desert Community Energy to switch to that. And that is the lowest electricity that you can buy in Palm Springs, unless you have your own solar, of course. So just wanted to share, it's nice to have some good news on the sustainability front. Um, so much that our city has done to be a leader in sustainability in the Valley, but not just here, but throughout California. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. That's really incredible news. And thank you to Council Member Force for his leadership in getting DCE established and, and which led to those types of um, savings. Really appreciate your leadership there and for all our residents and businesses. Council Member Wood, do you have any reports at this time? Certainly, Madam Mayor. Um, and I won't repeat what's already been said, but it was great news we heard from each of the council members. Um, for those of you that are interested in the environment, I sit on the Coachella Valley Conservation Commission, and I also sit on the Coachella Valley Mountains Conservancy, and we continue to buy habitat to protect endangered species and wildlife throughout the valley. And we're continuing to do that with both money that's mitigation from development fees, as well as from state bonds. 
So we're continuing to, to do that. Also, just to let the council know, um, we reinforced our support for solutions to the Salton Sea. Many may have seen um, some news broadcasts about the Salton Sea, the dying of the Salton Sea, and we just reaffirmed our support to find a solution to mitigate um, the dying of the Salton Sea. And that's it, Madam Mayor, thank you. Thank you. City Manager, do you have a report at this time? Yes, thank you very much, Mayor and Council. I have a few things to cover this evening. First is that I'm excited to announce that the time has come to reopen uh, additional city facilities, including City Hall. So after the holiday weekend, we will open up our doors for the first time um, to open-ended for public. So pretty excited about that. You can see our hours of operation here for select facilities. Um, please check our website uh, next week, especially for those looking for building and development services. We're going to be using some new technology to hope eliminate long queues and address uh, the customer needs as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Next, I'd like to highlight that we've talked at previous council meetings about the uh, select general plan element updates, and so want to announce some meetings that are coming up. Uh, you can see there on your screen a handful of meetings. I want to highlight especially uh, meeting number three at Vista Del Monte Elementary School conducted in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking residents. For more information, please visit psgeneralplan.com uh, to learn more about this important update and to find other ways to participate. Uh, next, I want to just highlight a couple of things that were included in your consent calendar, the first of which is for the first time Council is approving the uh, receive and file of commission minutes. So that's one more element of transparency that for residents that want to see not only the good hard work of our boards and commissions, but how much input comes to Council and how much is involved in the decision making process. I welcome you to uh, look at future uh, agenda materials and you'll find those minutes and then at some point too we will uh, continue to upload those recent minutes to the city's website for your, your review. Next, you also approved uh, going out to bid for demolition of remaining structures at the Tova Hotel property. So this has been a long time coming. I think since at least 2017, that property has been in some stage of demolition. So thanks to the very hard work of our code enforcement team and the city attorney's office, we finally received uh, authorization from the court to proceed. So we're just at the bidding phase now with that approval, but in short order, especially compared to how long it's been, we will be able to complete the demolition of the property, uh, the structures on that site. You also approved $6 million for road rehabilitation. So I just want to emphasize, we do often hear from our residents about the importance of rehabilitating our roads. So this is part of a multi-year effort to improve the surface condition. $6 million of Measure J, that's also our hard tax dollars at work. So I want to thank uh, both the participation of the Measure J uh, Commission that's been doing a lot of work, but, but most importantly, citizens of Palm Springs who agreed to authorize that funding and help us complete those valuable and important projects. Now, on a slightly more somber note, I do want to recognize it's been announced publicly that we have two team members that are leaving the organization. The first of those is our Chief of Police, Brian Reyes, who after a very long and tenured career, uh, a beloved chief and someone who hold, held you know, most positions, I think, in the police force, is announcing his retirement later this summer. Uh, so I know that we are going to miss him dearly, uh, and, and he's left quite a legacy forever, whoever follows in his footsteps. And then also, I uh, want to recognize uh, Marcus Fuller, our very talented assistant city manager, who is leaving the organization to take a position as city manager, which is very exciting. Now, there's more to come on that, and there'll be more opportunities to recognize those two talented individuals, but I certainly wanted to take a moment uh, and just briefly um, thank them for service and also um, celebrate what they've done and uh, look forward to seeing them in this next journey in their life. And then lastly, on something slightly more celebratory, I want to make a couple brief announcements on 4th of July celebration. Our Parks and Recreation team has been working very hard to put together lots of family, fun, uh, free activities. So more information will be coming out, but I just want to start to get people excited that on the 4th we'll have activities really in multiple locations starting earlier in the day at Victoria Park with lots of water activities. Um, later midday we'll have Sunrise Park and Ruth Hardy Park with select activities. The Swim Center midday will also have lots of pool fun. And then I get uh, to also announce that our headline activity will include an evening activity, a laser show, accompanied with some good music 
music, uh, lots and lots of other details, fun interactive activities will be coming forward in communication probably next week. Um, so really want to recognize the hard work of our team to put all that together in, in pretty short time, and it's going to be a, a great day of activities. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to our police chief, Brian Reyes, and our assistant city manager, Marcus Fuller. You both have an incredible decades long, you know, commitment to the city and uh, public service. And we really applaud you and we will continue to um, celebrate everything that you've done for our city. And um, you will be sorely missed. And I'm sure we'll find a good ways in the upcoming meetings to um, honor everything that you've done for our residents and our community. I just have a few quick updates if I can. Um, one, I attended the CVAG Association of Government Public Safety Committee as well as the Homelessness Committee. Um, the Homelessness Committee reported about um, cooling centers that would be 24-hour possible cooling centers throughout the Coachella Valley and including in Palm Springs. So thank you to Greg Rodriguez and Supervisor Perez um, for spearheading that effort and ensuring that our homeless residents uh, will have a place to sleep um, and to get out of the heat uh, over the summer. Um, I also held a district town hall for District 4. That was earlier this week, and um, there was uh, 75 people or 80 people who attended when usually we have uh, 15 to 25. So uh, just to clarify, we talked about um, two different issues, one on homelessness, the consideration, the city council's consideration of the boxing club as a location um, near and in our district, and then two, uh, the appraisal of the city golf Courses. And I think there was a misunderstanding that people thought the city council was taking action, um, but really it was just an update that the final appraisal is coming on June 1st, and that will be made public. Um, and that's the only thing that's come before city council. And we got a lot of input about uh, the future of the city golf courses and, you know, a public process and clear, transparent process for everyone to join that conversation about Mesquite Desert Preserve and the future of the golf course and all of the options in front of us. Um, and last, I just wanted to note, um, I've been holding weekly COVID-19 working group meetings um, with Mizell Senior Center, the Jocelyn Center, DAP Health, Riverside County Public Health and Workforce Development, Jewish Family Services, TODEC, the LGBTQ Center, the Convention Center, Fine Food Bank, and Eisenhower and Desert Care Network and Desert Healthcare District. So just to um, say that group has done a lot of really incredible work, like the Vaccine Buddies Program, and also we're focused on doing um, vaccine clinics in neighborhoods and really reaching people where they're at. So I know Mizell has had a lot of successful vaccination clinics. Um, Eisen, er, Eisenhower has worked with the LGBTQ Center to vaccinate their clients and do it on site. Um, and we've also worked with the convention center and Fide Food Bank to vaccinate people when they go and get their food at the convention center as a mass distribution site and also mass vaccine clinic. So I'm really proud of everyone's work and commitment on that. Just to note that, you know, when 80% of people in Palm Springs have been vaccinated, um, it's still a conversation about equity and making sure that everyone who has act who wants the vaccine um, can have access, that people understand that it's free, they understand where to get it, they can get it in the language that they need. And so we are focusing on the zip codes um, where people are most in need of the vaccine. North Palm Springs is included in that, as well as Desert Hot Springs, Cathedral City, and parts of Palm Springs. Um, so we are focused on equity and making sure that everyone can get a vaccine. Um, just to note, the Convention Center has done a really incredible job, and thank you to the Convention Center staff for um, switching gears really quickly, and um, over 40,000 people have been vaccinated on site at the Palm Springs Convention Center. Demand has reduced, so it was you know, up to 1,200 a day, and now we're sort of down to 200 a day or so. So there is an offer from Curative to vaccinate uh, workers or employers. You, we, you can set up a separate clinic just for your groups. 
So if you're a nonprofit and you want your clients vaccinated, or if you're an employer and you need your workers vaccinated, they can set up a separate vaccination um, times and appointments just for you. So please do reach out to us if you would like to offer that uh, to your organization, because we still want to make sure that everyone can get vaccinated in Palm Springs. And um, that is all I have. So our next item is the consent calendar. So I will entertain a motion to accept the consent calendar without items 1L, 1Z, and 1AA, which are removed for separate discussion. So can I have a motion and a second to approve the rest of the consent calendar? So moved. A second. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Woods. Aye. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstedge. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The first item pulled for separate discussion from the consent calendar is item 1L which is the second reading and adoption of an ordinance amending chapter 5.55 of the Palm Springs Municipal Code regarding security measures at adult use cannabis businesses and allowing some visible cannabis goods and graphics. Council member Kors pulled this item. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just very briefly, I'd just like to ask uh, staff if uh, we can create sort of a one page or showing examples of what is allowed and what is it. Since I got a question, with a little confusion of uh, what was allowed to be seen and what isn't. Um, so maybe we can just have a sheet that we can have on the website so cannabis businesses understand the rules. Uh, some people respond better visually than they, than they do from trying to read an ordinance. So that's all I have, and I'm happy to move the motion. Um, yes, absolutely. We can um, prepare that. There's actually a lot of good visuals on um, the state's website with regard to other cities that have implemented similar rules. Terrific, thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's a motion, is there a second? Second. Thank you, can we have a roll call vote please? Council member Kors. Yes. Council member Woods. Yes. Council member Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstedge. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is item 1B, approval of Public Arts Commission Community Grant Project. Council Member Woods pulled this item for separate discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, or um, uh, Madam uh, Mayor, sorry. Um, I pulled the item for a couple of reasons. One is I want to acknowledge the great work that the Arts Commission has done during COVID to brighten people's lives. Um, with the painting of the benches and the painting of the, um, the utility boxes and whatnot. However, I think they've gone a little beyond what we originally directed them to do. Um, one of the things that we talked to them about was um, to actually take vacant storefronts and not so much paint the windows, but put in kind of a 3D look on vacant windows if, if we had lost businesses during COVID in particular. And a couple of the items here um, I just can't seem to support because it's about painting windows um, on businesses. And when we paint windows on businesses, not only does it go against our kind of the, what we're trying to do, which is to open our streets and open our businesses and make them transparent, but it uh, goes against our sign code and whatnot. So um, as an example, uh, the Skylark Hotel windows, I just don't think that we should be paying for painting private property um, and that public art should be in the public realm. And this goes beyond vacancy. This is actually a functioning full use thing. The same with the Hunter's K rails. Um, we are in discussions now whether we'll keep those K rails or not. So to spend $5,000 if we don't keep those K rails um, seems like uh, money not well spent um, when their actual charge is the acquisition of art. Um, and then um, the same thing with the temporary art window treatment. It's putting temporary art in windows of existing businesses. And again, it goes against our sign ordinance. Um, the rest of it I can support. I would like to see the utility box QR codes to not go to link not only to the Art Commission website, but the city's website. I think it's important that the Art Commission and city's website are linked together and that the QR code go to that. So I would move the item 
minus the Skylark Hotel windows, minus the Hunter's Palm Springs K rails, and minus the temporary art windows. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second or? I'll, I'll second it for discussion. Thank you. So now further discussion, Council Member Kors. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions on these, so um, I appreciate you pulling this, Council Member Woods. Uh, maybe I'm not sure. I presume this is a city attorney. Um, but when we're spending public arts dollars on private businesses, is that a gift to public funds? I, I don't know, yes or no. It just sort of jumped out to me as a question. That is a fair question. Um, the, the, the gift of public funds doctrine is, is fairly uh, am amorphous. And so uh, I think it's a very fair question to be, to be asking here. And uh, if the council would like a more right, in-depth <laughs> in -depth analysis, I can certainly provide that. Because um, uh, if it is, obviously, we shouldn't support it. So do, do you? Do you think it potentially is, in which case we might want to not make a decision on this tonight? I think it's safe to say that it potentially is, yes. Okay. And then from uh, the other issue, Council Member Woods, you raised um, is some of this would be in violation of our sign ordinance. Staff have a view on that? Um, to respond to Council Member Corps' questions, where there are graphics that don't have an advertising message or logo, they would not violate the sign ordinance. Where there are depictions of products that are sold on site, uh, logos or names of businesses, then it would be a violation of our sign ordinance. Uh, so we would need to look at each of those proposals individually. Okay. Um. Uh, okay, so um, I think I generally then my maybe a friendly amendment, Councilmember Woods, is in support of your motion, but to have staff look at those other items and if they believe they would be legitimate, to bring them back um, to the next meeting for further consideration. But I don't want to vote for things that might be a violation of our ordinance or legal rules. Um, friendly amendment accepted. Okay. And the only other comment I'd want to make is I, I was a little concerned um, on the K-Rails because there are, we have businesses who have spent a lot of money to paint and do things on theirs. Um, and at our business retention meeting, the issue of equity came up. So if we're going to pay for one business to pay K-Rails, we should really be looking at whether we want to do that more across the boards. But that's just an aside comment to the motion, but just wanted to raise that as well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Other discussion before we vote on that amended motion? Councilmember Garner. Uh, just one thing on this. I know that the art, what the Art Commission is supposed to do or not do has come up quite a few times with our council. And um, so I, I would just, while we're on this, say that we should decide <laughs> something in terms of moving forward, how we're going to uh, handle this because uh, I know we're also kind of divided on um, whether or not we think that they need to be reeled in or not. So uh, whether that happens at an upcoming meeting or that's just during our visioning session uh, later this year, um, I just want to make sure that we do that so we don't have to be you know pulling this kind of stuff all the time. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I want to thank Council Member Garner for raising uh, that question. I really think uh, our Public Arts Commission has done some outstanding work, but uh, that we have clear coordination as to what is expected, not expected, would be uh, a positive move forward for everyone. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we certainly always have various controversial debates uh, here. Uh, some of the ones over what constitutes art are ones that really uh, are frequently better left to individuals uh, like the Arts uh, Commission that has uh, folks who have really vested a tremendous amount of uh, their lifetime uh, energy into the arts. Thank you. 
Thank you. So there's a motion, and just to clarify, it's to approve all of the items except the Skylark Hotel, the Hunter's K Rails, and the temporary windows treatment, and to bring those items back to a date uncertain um, with staff recommendations to answer some of the questions that were raised, as well as possibly a discussion about the, the scope um, of oversight of the Arts Commission and, and potential projects. Is that right to the maker of the motion in the second? That's correct, Madam Mayor. Is there any further discussion? If we can have a roll call vote on that motion, please. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstedge. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The last item that was pulled for separate discussion from the consent calendar is item AA, the added starter, which is a letter of support for Assembly Bill 339, local government open and public meetings. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton uh, pulled this item. This would be to authorize the issuance of a letter of support to the authors of the Assembly Bill 339 um, with that title. So, and just to flag that I asked for this to be added to the agenda because I received a request as the mayor for the city to sign on to a letter. And um, I always think that it's best for those items to go to the full city council since um, the mayor does not speak on behalf of the policy for the city council, but really it's a city council decision. Um, so I wanted to make sure city council had an opportunity to weigh in before I issued a letter. So to Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Okay, uh, thank you. Madam Mayor, I thank you for bringing this issue. You always are very cognizant of uh, bringing things before us and it's greatly appreciated. Uh, I, I think that Assembly Bill 339, which would significantly uh, uh, extend uh, telephonic and internet-based uh, actions at city councils and at county supervisorial meetings is, is very well-intentioned but premature. Uh, we are still finishing up uh, meeting virtually. There are an awful lot of lessons to be learned from uh, the virtual meetings that have taken place. I think we will uh, see that there is going to be broad acceptance of some elements of this, but uh, uh, of meeting virtually and expanding the ability of people to participate. But uh, uh, this bill has uh, not had uh, any uh, consultation with uh, the League of California Cities, with the Association of County Supervisors, neither organization which would be significantly impact, uh, whose members would be significantly impacted, including ourselves, have been consulted uh, uh, with the bill. Uh, this is not something that needs to be passed uh, uh, this year. Uh, I think uh, as we emerge from meeting virtually and return to uh, meeting uh, in person again, which uh, is going to start to happen over the next uh, many months, uh, we're going to have a much better opportunity to assess what do we want to maintain from uh, virtual meetings, what do, uh, do we want to leave. So I would encourage... Uh, us to, uh, as a council, to stay neutral on uh, uh, this issue for the time being uh, and uh, allow for a fuller discussion of all of uh, the issues, most particularly one including uh, uh, the League of California Cities, the Association of uh, County Supervisors. I would note uh, that the bill as it stands right now does not include any of the commission meetings, does not uh, be they city commission meetings or county or regional uh, commission meetings. So I, I think we've, uh, uh, for very good reasons, gotten a, uh, ahead of ourselves here. Thank you. Thank you. Other discussion? Council Member Kors? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as Mayor Pro Tem was um, bringing this up, I wanted to look at something on the bill and went to our agenda online and don't see this on the website. So I just want to make sure that it exists somewhere and has so the public has an opportunity to, re to read this. 
Yes, um, Mr. Mayor, if uh, members of the public are on our website and they're on the page where uh, that links to the agenda, the one below it is um, uh, view City Council Agenda Correspondence Public Comment. Since this is an added starter and was not part of the original agenda, um, uh, it's, it's under Agenda Correspondence, and, and so there is a staff report uh, online. Mm. Well, I'm missing it then. Um, let me see. Oh, now it's th three links down. Uh, the fact that I couldn't find it just is a little concerning. I would hope we could add this to actually when people link on the agenda in the future. Um, that said, I just had a question for staff. Does this, it was unclear when I read this initially if this even would apply to a city the size of Palm Springs or not. Or are we taking position on something that doesn't apply to us? So I understand it. Yes, yeah, thanks for the question. My understanding is the bill in its current form is limited to cities with a population exceeding 250,000. Okay. And do we know, does anything prohibit us from doing this on our own, with or without the bill? Nothing that I'm aware of would prohibit us from continuing to provide the kind of um, connection with citizens that we've had during the COVID, um, both telephonic and remote through internet, uh, Zoom meetings, other things. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Is there a motion? I would move that we uh, defer this for future uh, discussion. Thank you. Is there a second? Um, I'll, I'll second that. I'm a bit neutral <laughs> on it as well. Thank you. Any further discussion? I'll just raise, I think, uh, this conversation about how we maintain act the public's access to um, technology and access to city council meetings and even county board of supervisor meetings because we've seen our residents and we've learned, I think, through this pandemic and, you know, the value of calling in and having electronic access to our board of supervisors meetings instead of driving back and forth to be there in person with maskless people. <laughs> we saw at their meetings, right, um, that that might be a relevant issue for our city and for our residents. And we might want to think through if we don't want to support or take a position right now on this bill, what we should do um, to lead the way in access and transparency, because I know that this is an issue that's so important to our city and to our residents, and we do want to lead the way for the state. Um, so I would just ask that we, you know, continue to have those conversations and, um, you know, implement that on our own and then look at legislation where it's at at that time. So I um, look forward to having all those conversations. So there's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Council Member Garner. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Holstech. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is item 2A, a public hearing to consider delinquent waste disposal charges. Can we have a staff report, please? Uh, Mayor and City Council members, uh, each year Palm Springs Disposal Services provides a list of delinquent accounts to the city for placement on the property tax rolls. And this process is authorized by municipal code, municipal code and the state of California. Uh, this year, a total of 1,072 delinquent accounts were identified. This includes residential customers that have been delinquent since July of 2020 and commercial customers since December of 2020. For the past two years, uh, the city has sent out a courtesy letter to those newly listed on the delinquent list. This resulted in payment of two, uh, 327 accounts this year. Uh, PSDS then sends a letter which has resulted in another 170 payments as of today. 
And that leaves 575 delinquent accounts totaling about $195,000. Um, any customers that still want to pay can pay by credit card or check by June 10th and June 17th by cash. Any account holders that comment during this public hearing and question their delinquency will be flagged for follow-up by PSDS, and any account holder that is willing to make a partial payment and a payment plan will be taken off the delinquent list. Any accounts that remain unpaid will be submitted to the county uh, and on June 28th. Any accounts still delinquent after that date will be placed on property tax rolls for collection. Uh, it's important to note that many delinquencies are repeats from year to year and are intentional. Customers, uh, some customers choose to pay these fees through the tax roll. Uh, with that, uh, Council, I would ask to open the public hearing and adopt the resolution. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Council Member Garner. Thank you. Um, I did want to just raise this. Um, Patrick, do you know, um, you know, what the monthly charges are for this and if there's any assistance for residents who are having trouble um, making those payments? Could you just provide some information about that? Sure. Actually, uh, we have Chris uh, Cunningham here from Palm Springs Disposal Services who can actually probably better answer that question. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, and staff, um, community listening. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, usually it's just, if you want to get off these rolls, there's a minimum payment. Um, if you're having trouble, just call us up. Um, like I said, mo most of these are repeats, but if, they're, if we're willing to help any of our customers. So if they want to call up and they have some trouble, absolutely we're willing to help them get off this roll. Thank you. And then um, what... What is the monthly charge? I'm I'm a renter, so I don't oh. <laughs> I don't know the monthly fees. Right. So, so the the monthly fee for let's say just an economy service for a single family home um, is about uh, eighteen sixty five I think right now a month. So it's billed quarterly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then do, the other question. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. One one more question. Is um, I did see that we had a, a public comment that was an, a homeowner disputing the charges. So when we're uh, approving this item, would that information be passed on a Palm Springs disposal? I just want to make sure that that that's taken care of, since there is a a concern there from from at least one person. Yes, yes. I, any comments or concerns that the residents have, it'll go through the city, go through us. We'll work in tandem to figure out a situation. Okay, thank you. Oh. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Thank you. And I think my question got asked by Councilmember Garner, but I just want to uh, make certain I understood. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, any of the names that are and people that are on this list uh, all of these individuals were offered an opportunity to have a payment plan and did not respond. Is that correct? Yes, all they have to do is call us up, and it usually is just a minimum payment to get off of those. You have to be at least nine months on, on residential, at least four, four to six on commercial. So it's usually just a minimum payment, and you could get off. Okay. What, what affirmative action do you take to make sure that... Uh, these individuals know that a payment plan option is available to them. So what we do is, is every year during March, this is when the letters go out, courtesy letters go out and say, okay, this is going to be going on the tax roll. If you, if you, you know, don't call and, and, and figure out the situation. So what they'll do is they'll call us up and then yes, we'll tell them at that point, all you have to do is make a minimum payment. It's not the whole thing. It at least pulls you off those tax rolls. So courtesy letters, from us and these past two years, the city as well. Okay. I think it's really important that we make sure everyone has that option, option and knows that they have that option. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham, you're providing information in Spanish as well as English, right? Yes, we are. Thank you so much for doing that. Other questions? 
seeing none, thank you so much. So at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. City Clerk, if you could contact public speakers. Uh, Madam Mayor, we have no public comment for this item. Thank you. There being no speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from city council members? Or a motion? I'll move the uh, item. I'll second Thank it. Thank you. There's a motion and a second to adopt the resolution. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Course. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Council Member Garner. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Holstech. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is item 2B, a public hearing to consider amendments to the Desert Palisade specific plan to revise the architectural review process. If we can have a staff report, please. Madam Mayor and members of council, the next public hearing item before you is a request by the City of Palm Springs to amend the Desert Palisades specific plan. These changes to the specific plan are being proposed in line with recent changes that we've made to the zoning code relative to the architectural review process. What we're attempting to do here is to standardize the review process uh, in the specific plan areas similar to what we're doing elsewhere in the city. This is the first of three specific plan amendments that you'll see over the next several council meetings. You'll also see an amendment to the downtown Palm Springs specific plan and then later uh, amendments to the section 14 specific plan all related to the architectural review process. In terms of what is being proposed, currently under the Desert Palisade specific plan, the process is as follows for approval of architectural review applications. Uh, step one is the formal submittal of the application. Step two, the architectural advisory committee reviews and make a rec makes a recommendation on the application. And then step three, the planning commission reviews the item and either approves or denies the application. What we are proposing to do is to modify it in line with the recent changes to our zoning code so that now step one would be a pre-submittal conference with staff wherein staff would sit down with applicants and review the development standards in the specific plan with the applicant. Step two, the applicant would then submit their formal application. And then step three, the architectural review committee would review and approve the application. We anticipate that making the change to the process as proposed would save applicants about 30 to 45 days in the entitlement process by eliminating the Planning Commission review. In addition, by having a pre-submittal conference with staff up front prior to submittal of the formal application, we're able to address any issues relative to conformance with development standards as the City Council recently saw at the last meeting relative to an encroachment and a setback. Uh, again, the pre-submittal conference would be used to uh, remedy those situations prior to formal submittal. The Planning Commission reviewed this at their meeting earlier in May and voted 6-0 to zero to recommend approval. Uh, the Planning Commission also recommend that we revisit the modifications to the process after 12 months, uh, just as we will do with the other changes that we've made to the zoning code, just to see if the process is as efficient uh, as we have anticipated. Because the Desert Palisade specific plan applies to a specific development, we did contact the developer, provided him copies of the proposed amendment. Uh, he has indicated that he is also in support of the amendments as proposed. With that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about this proposed amendment. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Seeing none, I'd like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. City Clerk, are there any pu public speakers? Madam Mayor, there is no public comment for this item. There being no speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from council or is there a motion?
I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Woods. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstich. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is item 2C, a public hearing to consider modifying user fees and regulatory fees for various programs, applications, and services, and amending the comprehensive fee schedule. Can we have a staff report, please? Madam Mayor and members of council, our next item is relative to modifications to the city's adopted fee schedule. Based on recent amendments to your municipal code and your zoning code, and also consideration of changes to certain programs, we're proposing a number of modifications to fees in the following areas. Uh, number one is relative to the zoning entitlement fees, as we just discussed, relative to our architectural review process. We're also proposing changes to our sewer facility fees, establishing fees for extending sewer to areas that currently don't have them. You've recently adopted a uh, responsible breeding uh, program and we need to establish a fee for that. And then finally, we are proposing modifications to the fees for our cannabis related businesses and activities. In accordance with California government code and developer fees, we are required to provide notice with those who have registered with the city clerk uh, in regards to notification to any changes to those fees. Uh, we provided the notice 14 days in advance of this hearing in accordance with the code. Uh, we heard back from only one of those, and that was from the Desert Valley's Builders Association. They indicated that they had no objection to the fee changes as proposed. With that, I'd like to go into a discussion of the specific changes that we'll be making. First of all, as you're aware, we've recently made changes to our architectural review process. One of the key changes that we made is that we divided our current architectural review process into two separate uh, applications. The first is the development permit application, which will, re will be reviewed and approved by the Planning Commission. And then secondly, the architectural review application, which will re be reviewed by the Architectural Review Committee. Uh, in terms of the fees for those two applications, the cost will be approximately the same to applicants as is currently charged, even though that we've divided this into two separate applications. We wanted to keep that fee generally the same so that there would be uh, little or no impact to our applicants. Uh, there is a slight increase in that fee for the pre-submittal conferences that we'll be conducting with the applicants, but it, that is only to recoup the city's cost in performance those conferences. We've also got some modifications to other processes. Uh, for example, we just talked about the architectural review process in Desert Palisades. Because we're eliminating the second step in that process of planning commission review, uh, applicants will see those fees reduced because it is a reduction in staff time to process those applications. Similarly, for sign programs where now the architectural advisory committee uh, will have final approval on those and tentative maps where the planning commission will have final approval, fees for those types of applications will also be reduced because we're shortening the process and reducing the staff time necessary to process those applications. One of the fees that we're proposing relative to zoning entitlements that is not related to the architectural review process or streamlining of process is relative to notification fees. When we last performed our time and motion study for notification fees back in 2018-2019, the fee for public hearing notices for planning commission was set at approximately $1,800. And where an application had to go to both the planning commission and city council, that notification fee is $2,600. 
in comparing the fee with the fees charged by other agencies in the Valley, uh, our fee vastly exceeds that charged by other agencies. And while we do have an extended notification radius that's greater than what the other cities do, and we also include notifications to renters and businesses in addition to property owners, which other agencies don't do, there is added time and cost relative to that. But because there is a benefit in this additional notification, what we're proposing is that the fee be subsidized so that we would charge only 750 for planning commission consideration and 1500 for applications that have to go to both planning commission and city council. Uh, so this represents approximately 50% reduction for the planning commission fees. Uh, and again, we believe this is warranted uh, because our fee vastly exceeds that charged by other agencies, and this is a general benefit to the public. Moving on to our sewer facility fees, uh, sewer facility fees are charged for new construction as a means to maintain our sewer system and provide the service to customers. The sewer facility fee has not been modified since 2006. Uh, the city engaged a consultant, Stantec, who analyzed our current costs and our system and has proposed that we modify our fees accordingly. What we're proposing for residential units is to reduce our fee to $1,006 from the current fee of $3,000. Uh, so you can see that that's a substantial uh, reduction in the proposed fee. Similarly, the fees for commercial properties, hotels, recreational vehicle parks uh, will also be reduced accordingly based on the study provided to us by Stantec. We're also providing a modification to the septage dumping fee uh, at the city facility, which will become a more standardized fee. Uh, again, we did the analysis, and even with these reductions in the fees, it will still allow us to properly maintain our sewer system uh, while providing a benefit to uh, our applicants who are building new development. One of the other fees that we're proposing to establish is relative to extending sewer to areas where they don't currently have it. There are a number of areas within the city uh, that are currently on septic systems. We have not established a fee to extend sewer to those areas in the past. What we're proposing to do is to establish that for those areas. So if at any point in the future, residents or businesses within those areas choose to have the sewer extended, uh, that we have the ability to do that based on this adopted schedule. Please note that we will not extend the sewer service until uh, requested to do so by the neighborhood or by the area. Also as part of this, in terms of payment of the fees, the city can enter into agreements with the property owners to establish a payment schedule for those fees and also to provide a method for the city to recoup those costs in extending the service. The actual fees themselves are based on the cost to uh, extend service. Uh, as you can see, we're using a standardized cost per lineal foot of the extension of the sewer line. With the exception of Indian Canyon Drive, we did perform a study in terms of that extension. Uh, the fee is going to be more costly based on uh, the distance that we have to extend the sewer line for that area. So that one fee is different than the others. Again, there is no proposal to extend the sewer to these areas until requested to do so by residents uh, or businesses and property owners of those areas. Next is relative to the responsible breeding regulations that were adopted by the City Council in April. Uh, pursuant to that ordinance, an annual breeding permit will be required. Uh, we have uh, entered into an agreement with the Palm Springs Animal Shelter that they will be the ones who administer that program and issue those permits. Uh, based on the expenses of uh, operating that program and issuing those permits, we would propose to establish the cost of the annual permit at $100. With that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Veronica Goodhart, uh, who is over the special um, uh, 
Programs Compliance Department with the city to discuss the cannabis fee increases. Um, what is being proposed is an increase for both the initial application fee from 4,092 to 10,984, and also for the renewal, which was set at 1,000 to 10,984. Um, I would like to point out that at the time the initial fee was adopted, the cannabis licensing was administered by the former city attorney's office. So it only captured the actual licensing process. It did not encompass the complete fee associated with administering cannabis administration and regulation. So what the fee proposes now would cover the complete administrative costs for the program. It would also provide for code compliance officers. Um, this is really critical. We our business, county's businesses have grown tremendously. Um, they also have a lot of inspections that are mandated by state and local regulation. Um, the two officers will be very busy because the inspections that they perform due to the complexity require two to four hours each. Additional time is needed if there are findings of of any wrongdoings. Um, this was taken into consideration after speaking with um, Santa Ana, who has dedicated code compliance for cannabis. Um, it would also provide the ability to proactively monitor odor compliance in the city, um, not just responding to complaints of odor, but actually going to our facilities, inspecting equipment, checking logs, ensuring that they are in compliance with the plans provided to the city to become operational. Um, there are also other complaints. Um, that are received with regard to hours, security, staffing, all of this would be handled by code enforcement. So it's really critical that we do have the ability to do that. With regard to the administrative program costs, there are the department operational administrative costs. As stated, when the fee was established, it was under the city attorney with essentially only two employees per completing all the work. There is now a complete staff that assists with the various day-to-day -day administration of the program. Uh, we also receive assistance from our finance department. Um, one of the things that they are responsible for um, are the financial audits of the businesses, cannabis tax collection, overseeing our contracts with various vendors for um, services such as odor control. Um, it also includes police oversight and supervision. As um, many are aware, our code compliance are supervised um, by the police department and it they actually, for this particular subject matter, it's very important that they continue to do so um, due to the complexity, again, and the additional illicit market that exists. Uh, we also have special charges, such as legal fees, um, consultant fees that are included in the um, fee as well. Madam Mayor, that concludes our presentation on the proposed modifications to the fee schedule. Uh, Ms. Goodhart and I are available to answer any questions you might have about the proposed changes. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions for city staff? Councilmember Garner. Um, in terms of the the fee increases for cannabis, um, how does that impact equity applicants? It would not impact them because of the grant funding that we have secured for the city. There's actual fees that are set aside specifically for currently permitted businesses for renewal fees. So it would be covered completely. Okay, thank you. I have a follow-up question. I have the same question, so thank you, Councilmember Garner. So would those be just applicants that are selected as equity applicants? How would that work if people were interested um, in, they thought they were eligible under that program and wanted to apply um, to have the fees waived? Is that how it would work? Yes, so existing businesses who qualify would be able to submit an application and that would be able to assist them with future fees, such as the renewal fees. Existing businesses that qualify, what about future applicants? Yes, we are opening up the application process. It actually will be opening June 1st, so prospective businesses, um, anyone interested can apply. Great, thank you. Other questions for city staff? I don't see any others. I have a question on the sewage, sewer street fee. So 
Flynn, could you just describe, you said that if neighborhoods request this or neighbors or property owners, could you just explain how this would work in practice and sort of if this cost is feasible per unit for any neighborhoods? It seems incredibly expensive, and I'm just wondering if this is the best practice to get our areas linked up uh, to sewer. So I've invited Mr. Joel Montalvo, our city engineer, to respond to that question. Mr. Montalvo. So I was trying to, to understand the question as I was walking towards the, the podium. So the question really is, is how we would incorporate or how would we actually um, apply that to the, the residents? I think the, 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 the real uh, ability that the city is going to have is we're going to have the ability to to come into an agreement with each resident and to actually prorate the the actual fees over a long period of time. So there's actually an agreement that's going to be taking place with the residents. Uh, first of all, the community itself has to agree that they want to, to impose these fees and, and wants the city to come forward to create this project and to actually uh, install the sewer lines within the community. After that, we would move to actually getting, getting a consensus from the community and then uh, moving towards agreements where we would then set the fees and try to ex uh, make those fees feasible through a long period of time for, for the community. Thank you for the succinct answer to my convoluted question. I appreciate it. So would you need then agreement from all of the housing units on that street or in that location? You need unanimous consensus or how would that work if there are holdouts? I don't believe we've established the, the, the true process, but I, I would imagine it would be consensus from the community. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, any other questions for city staff? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Thank you. And thank you, uh, my colleagues for the, the previous questions. Uh, Joel, uh, what process would we use when it comes to individuals that uh, have limited income or on fixed income or uh, are disadvantaged in trying to uh, make that sewer connection because from a public policy standpoint, it's healthier for all of us if uh, the more individuals that we get uh, connected to the sewer system. One of the ways that we mention in the staff report is relative to the ability to require the fee to be paid upon transfer of title. Uh, and I might ask the city attorney or the assistant city manager uh, if uh, they have any additional comments relative to those who might be disadvantaged. Well, I think I'll, I'll take a step back and explain that um, the city back in the 1970s and 80s extended sewers throughout most of the city at the cost of the property owner. And at that time, it was before Proposition um, 218 uh, when the city could form assessment districts uh, through a majority protest process, not requiring an actual election and a majority vote. Uh, and so that imposed the financial obligation on the homeowner through uh, special assessments where the city then issued bonds that provided the financing to extend sewers. <clears throat> and then those homeowners paid the assessment over 20 or 30 years or whatever the term was uh, for their cost. Uh, Prop 218 changed the way that cities can finance those kinds of public improvements. And so the reason you see these areas without sewers is because of Prop 218, because the cities essentially, uh, unless those homeowners, a majority of those homeowners vote to assess themselves, and that generates the revenue for us to issue bonds, uh, unless that happens, uh, we're left with an inability to finance that construction. This was a creative way to provide an opportunity for those pockets of neighborhoods that are on septic to voluntarily approach the city and say, hey, we now want to uh, have the city consider advancing the funds to extend sewers. We understand that the, um, the fee for us is, is set by these special connection fees. 
uh, and w we want the city to consider moving forward with that. At that time, and I don't know that any of these neighborhoods will ever voluntarily come forward, but to the extent they did, at that time, city council would have to weigh the risk of advancing some significant funds from the wastewater fund on the premise that once those sewers are extended, those homeowners will actually connect to the sewer. In reality, <clears throat> Once a sewer is installed, you, we can only force a homeowner to connect if their septic system fails. Once the sewer is available, they don't have a choice to repair the septic system. They're forced to connect. Um, the idea there is once they connect, then the city would enter into a, a long-term 20-year agreement recorded on title to provide a mechanism for amortizing that cost, much in the way that it would have been done through an assessment district. So uh, if there's a, a, um, a lower income resident, I think at the time that this would ever approach city council, those kinds of considerations can be weighed by the council and policies and procedures can be drafted and adopted that perhaps provides assistance or subsidize the cost through some mechanism of reduced cost to those, those residents. But um, the reality is, is this just going to provide uh, a mechanism for uh, those residents to uh, come forward and say, hey, we see you have a, an option for us to consider getting sewers extended and we want to avail ourselves of that, uh, of that new process. But again, I don't know that it will happen or when it will happen that that occurs? Those are two really good answers. And uh, uh, I don't want to hold up this process uh, any further, uh, but uh, I think all of us uh, recognize that uh, uh, connecting as many homes in our community as we can is going to be a positive for, for all of us. And uh, as we move forward, uh, where we can find creative, inventive ways to help individuals make those connections. Uh, that, that's good public policy. Well said, I agree, thank you. I have one final question if I can about mobile home parks. So if there are mobile home parks that are on uh, septic and want to connect, I guess there aren't any in the sewer line extension areas or are there? No, I believe all of them are on sewer. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions for staff, I'd like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. City Clerk, are there any speakers? Yes, and I'll begin calling. Rick Pintelli, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, taking my call, Mayor and City Council. I only have two minutes, so I'll be quick. Your full comments are in my in your package that I wrote this afternoon. I've been working on both medical marijuana and cannabis in the city of Palm Springs since day one. And I can tell you that Palm Springs is known throughout the cannabis industry as a fair extremely fair and honest city government to do business with. I feel we want to maintain that reputation. We started by trying to help patients get safe, affordable access to their medication, and it become a nascent and growing business, which provides the most important of needed products to our residents. I think it's important to remember that these businesses are not just businesses, but they are people with families who depend on these jobs to support their families. It is their livelihood. It is their means of securing the necessities of life. And that is why I ask the city council not to rush this decision and continue to embrace, not stagnate, our nascent cannabis industry with smart changes that do no harm. Please keep in mind that while the larger industries might be doing well, many of the smaller operations here in Palm Springs are barely able to keep up with the competition and make ends meet. The black market isn't helping that. And if the city can find some time and put together a program with money's coming from these fees, or even better yet, with strict hefty fines, we can address the real problem head-on, the black market. 
And by doing so, by increasing the fines and not the fees, you hurt the bad guys and help the budget. My suggestion is to have an increase of possibly $2,000 a year each year for over a three to four year period in the amount of $2,000 each year. As far as renewal fees, I for the life of me nor can anyone I find figure out how it's possible to charge $10,000 to renew an existing business permit. I want them, I want our industry to be treated like everyone else. Fortunately, math is math, numbers are numbers, and they will tell the truth. And with the guidance of council persons Woods and Garner, a transparent study could put, be put to, to, in action to determine exactly what is needed for Veronica, Lieutenant Villegas, and to do the, have the proper funding to do their job right and run an effective code compliance department. Thank you so much for taking your time, keeping the government fair, safe, and transparent. My best to all of you. Stay happy and safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Simone Sandoval, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Great, thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Simone. I am a Palm Springs resident. I'm a CVCAN board member, and I'm director of licensing and compliance for Global Go. Um, so as you heard, staff is proposing $11,000 fee increases for both initial application permitting and renewals for cannabis businesses. This is a 168 increase for initial applications and a 1,000% increase for renewals. And the reasoning behind this, I guess, is to cover the costs of two additional code enforcement officers to respond to cannabis odor complaints, the cost of the vehicle, and um, by staff's own calculation, this would cost about $290,000. However, back in 2018, when Measure E was passed, the reasoning for the cannabis tax was to ensure proper monitoring and licensing of these businesses. The budget doc shown in item 4B on the agenda show that the cannabis tax and fees collected in fiscal year 19 and 20 were 2.3 million, and the proposed budget numbers for fiscal year 21 to 22 is 3.3 million, which is up 50%. It seems that based on these numbers, there should be enough money to cover the cost of what the special programs department is asking for without increasing the fees. So we respectfully ask that before you increase these fees, we ask for a transparent accounting of the cannabis tax expenditures in order to verify where the money is going, if not to support enforcement, proper monitoring, and licensing of these businesses. Since the impetus of needing these additional officers is to respond to odor complaints and proactively monitor for odor, we'd also like a full accounting of how many verified odor complaints occurred during the past year. It's no secret that there are those people out there with personal feelings and biases against cannabis, which could lead and has led to overzealous people calling in overwhelming code enforcement with frivolous complaints. Last year, it was reported that 70% of these complaints came from a single source. So I, you guys know this is a highly regulated industry and existing operators like the rest of the world have been affected by COVID and have limited resources to pay 1,000% increases for local permitting fees. You know, by your own slides, you can see how deeply Palm Springs tourism has been affected by COVID and the cannabis industry is not insulated from this. So please, we respectfully ask that you ensure transparent accounting of these cannabis expenditures and that are available to the public and industry stakeholders before you take further action on this cannabis item. Thank you. And um, I yield the rest of my time. Joy Brown Meredith, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for hearing my comments this evening. I just wanted to touch on to uh, see here in regards to cannabis, uh, additional fees for cannabis. First of all, I do want to just say in terms of uh, keeping on time here, I do agree with everything that Rick Pantelli and Jocelyn Kane just said. And also to be bringing up that the you know, Bureau of Cannabis Control is looking for uh, to is looking to uh, approve some grants for cities to help with licensing applications and other fees that are uh, that can sometimes be incurred by cities. And so I think that that's something that the city should look into. Also, uh, Jocelyn's mention of Measure D is absolutely right on. At the time when we were meeting with the city and meeting with uh, the city manager, it was certainly put about that uh, we were going to be supporting Measure D, the half percent sales tax, to help with any fees that might be uh, that might be coming to the city. 
in regards to cannabis. Also, please keep in mind that retail businesses are already giving 10% of our sales to the city. Uh, and in some cases, distribution is paying nothing. Uh, manufacturing pays a small percentage and cultivation uh, pays a small, a small fee as well. But retail is already giving 10%. Uh, of all of our sales to the city for uh, cannabis sales, which is quite quite a bit of money for much of us. And so I just would really like you to consider that on renewals, which seem like they should have uh, not uh, as extensive of work required by the city and city staff, that in renewals that you not uh, increase this fee by this much money, it is an awful lot uh to pay and i think you know a lot of people might not realize that cannabis businesses were hurting right along with everybody else and uh, oftentimes you might hear a different story than that but oftentimes that's also because uh, people don't want their investors to really uh know to what extent uh business might have been off but i hope that you will consider to not be raising this uh this fee on existing businesses and renewal. Thank you very much for your time. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, uh, that does conclude public comment for this public hearing. Thank you, City Clerk, and everyone who called in. There being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from City Council members? Councilmember Garner. Um, thank you. So I'm I'm also concerned about the cannabis uh, fee increase, just how dramatic it is. Uh, I know Councilmember Woods and I met with um, different cannabis stakeholders earlier this week, and you know they raised a lot of the same questions that they they just raised now in the public comments. Um, and I do know that from staff that there, in terms of odor complaints, there has only been one business that has caused significant odor issues. And while there have been other minor complaints from other cannabis operators, um, there's not nearly to the extent of this one business. So I, I am concerned that we are moving forward a bit too drastically. Uh, instead of perhaps uh, having greater enforcement on this this one particular business and getting them into compliance, especially because in terms of cultivation, we don't have um, any that are open yet. So we don't even know what is going to happen or not, especially since the business causing the problems didn't have to comply with our odor regulations and all of these other businesses that are going to open up do have to comply with our odor regulations. Uh, I do think that there is need, and I obviously from um, Veronica explaining it, there is a need for greater assistance in this department, but I am wondering if we can um, phase in <laughs> these fees instead of doing it all, all at once. And I am concerned too for some of those uh, businesses that are on the smaller side and they're not necessarily equity applicants, but they're not um, the businesses that have come in with millions of dollars in capital already. So we have quite a diverse um, group of cannabis businesses in the city right now. Other comments or questions? I have a few in the same vein, if I can. So I share some of those concerns with Councilmember Garner, and that was my thought too is sort of are there a few bad actors in terms of odor or other enforcement um, that need additional attention either from the city attorney's office or from city staff versus needing additional enforcement throughout the city. Um, I think we have heard from residents that they do want additional enforcement, um, but I'm just wondering if that is being done in a data-driven way about how many complaints there are and, you know, how those are spread throughout the city and those types of concerns, kind of like we talked about vacation rentals, making sure it's data-driven and we're not just adding to add enforcement um, when, you know, there are, might be other ways to do that. Um, and 
it's an 80, 20 problem, right? Um, and then, so I just have questions about the timing of this. Um, you know, I, it sounds like a lot of notice was actually provided compared to what's required by law, but I'm just wondering about the outreach done and the um, timing and the timeline. And then if there's a sense if um, cannabis businesses might be able to afford this during COVID and if there's a sense of how that might impact um, our existing and up you know, applicant businesses in Palm Springs. I mean, I do think it's nice and important to have fees that are comparable to other cities. I think there's a sense from the city council and um, the community that we have a lot of cannabis businesses. And yeah, if it's a tenth of the cost in part um, to apply for a business here, you know, I think that that's a problem um, and that it should be comparable to other locations. Um, so maybe if city staff could talk a little bit about the outreach that was done, the timing of this, um, what's the sense about, you know, why this increase is required right now, if it could be a phased approach, if we should do more outreach, considering that there's um, some public comment in opposition of this. Yeah, Mayor and Council, I'll, I'll, I'll address some of those questions and concerns. You do have alternatives, but... Um, what we're seeing in terms of the cannabis tax revenues, even through COVID, is quite the opposite of what you're hearing. We're seeing that the cannabis businesses are booming and have boomed through the co whole COVID pandemic, which is why your budget shows a, a significant increase in that tax revenue. Uh, Measure D was a general tax, so that tax revenue goes to the general fund to support all public services. So it's really a policy question for you because we are telling you we have a need to ramp up our administrative program to live up to our obligations to administer the regulations that are imposed by the state and the city on these businesses. So it's more than just odor complaints. It's uh, proactive uh, site inspections, confirming that they're labeling properly. Um, there's a whole host of regulations that need to be adhered to that we're responsible for ensuring uh, they comply with. Uh, so the decision is if you don't add staff to uh, address our growing cannabis operations in the city, you will be pulling can uh, code officers that are assigned to other duties, whether that's vacation rentals or just general code enforcement, which reduces our ability to address those citywide issues, uh, which have been uh, a problem, which makes us more and more reactive to those issues. Um, options you have, uh, at the first budget draft uh, session, we had identified that a lower fee of 4325 would at least cover the additional cost of the code officers, so that's an option for you tonight. You could consider uh, approving the fee at that lower rate. Or you could uh, approve the higher rate and phase it in over two or three or four years, whatever your pleasure is. Um, but we, we really would recommend uh, that in our upcoming uh, later tonight discussion on the budget that you continue to include the two code officers so we can have the resources to really uh, administer this program as it continues to grow and we see more and more dispensaries uh, being approved in, in Palm Springs. So, you have a couple of options. Um, as far as the outreach, uh, we have communicated with the stakeholders. Um, I believe they're aware of the issue. You've heard from some. I saw actually a comment letter from one of them supporting the increase. Um, so uh, we've been mindful. We, we realized that it was a significant increase, but we also showed that it was comparable to other cities that have a very robust program like we uh, have which we promised the community we would have in in you know being open for business for cannabis. So I'll leave it there with you. I, I think I gave you a lot of options, but we're we're open to any of those options that you might consider. Thank you. And could you explain a little bit about the proactive enforcement that would be able to be done with additional code? Officers, I'm trying to figure out sort of what the city is enforcing for city ordinances and plans that we've approved versus what we might be enforcing for the state with cannabis businesses, if that makes sense. What kind of state regulations is that our responsibility to enforce the labeling and those types of things from the state? Yeah, Ms. Goethert is uh, here to respond to that. Thank you. 
I'd like to start off by pointing out there's currently no proactive code enforcement. I did ask um, our code, um, Lieutenant Vegas Code Supervisor, to have one of the code officers a couple of weekends ago go check just the dispensaries on Palm Canyon alone to see if they're complying. Three of the businesses failed to have security guards, which is required by local and state law. And that was just one day going out and looking at just a small number of dispensaries on Palm Canyon. So you can imagine on a larger scale with no proactive enforcement, what may be found. I mean, there's none, so we don't have the numbers to present to you um, as far as why it's needed. It's definitely needed, but it's not being done at all. Um, state law is also mirrors our local laws. We are stricter in certain aspects, so it's our responsibility to make sure that we're adhering to those. Thank you. And then my last question is, is a set application and renewal fee per cannabis business and not per type of cannabis business like some other cities. Is that right? Could you just explain that difference? Um, yes, it is per business. Um, it isn't broken out because each business has a set of regulations and they all are lengthy and extensive and require specialized knowledge to enforce. Thank you, but I mean the fee isn't different if you're a dispensary versus if you're doing manufacturing versus you're you know doing a different type of use. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. That's how it currently is, and that's how it would remain. Thank you. Any other questions for Veronica or city staff? Councilmember Garner. Thank you. Um, Marcus, when you mentioned that the cannabis businesses are booming, are you seeing that across the board or is there are there any businesses that haven't been doing so well? I don't have the business by business specific tax revenue in front of me. And, and I think we have to keep that somewhat confidential, but just generally we're seeing a significant increase uh, you know, with, obviously it's due to more businesses, uh, but just more people are buying cannabis is what we're seeing in the tax revenue. Okay, thank you. Other questions for city staff? Or comments? In, in, just in, in terms of comments, I think that was helpful having those questions answered. Um, and, I, I, and I do want to make sure that we are proactive in this and that we are preventing problems from occurring, absolutely. Um, I, I, I still am a little bit, um, I still would like to see a phasing in of, of the fees um, just to give people an opportunity to get used to it. It is a, it is a big jump uh, for, for an annual fee. Uh, and it is a little bit higher, if I remember correctly, from the last time we saw the table of, of the fees across uh, the valley. So I think that a phasing in would be just a, a goodwill um, gesture. Other comments? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. And then yeah. Councilman Report. All right. Thank you. And I, I think uh, my colleagues and staff for some really good comments and questions. Uh, the, uh, the cannabis industry, uh, like some other industries, is one that clearly does need uh, regulation, the potentials for uh, very problematic uh, activity is something that we know. We've, we've encountered it in our community. Uh, but uh, a, a fee increase uh, that uh, is on the order of magnitude of uh, more than doubling and in some instances tripling is one of those that may argue for some phasing in. Of, uh, of those fees. So uh, I'm not sure if staff has a recommendation as to what uh, a phased in approach uh, would be, but uh, uh, I could certainly uh, support uh, uh, spreading out uh, the impact of this uh, very significant uh, increase in fees over a longer period of time. Thank you. I think that was a question to city staff about a recommendation for a phase in approach, but first I'll go to council member course. 
thank you, and I really appreciate uh, the comments thus far. Uh, and I, I think uh, Mr. Fuller sort of said one option would be to cover the cost of the two additional code enforcement officers um, and not the other pieces, uh, which we would then subsidize, and that's then rest of taxpayer subsidizing the cost of this business, which always leaves me a little uncomfortable when we're picking and choosing businesses that we're subsidizing and ones we're not. But I think it, we should at least start with that. I do agree it's a big increase and maybe um, phasing it in sort of in the way that had been described for the first year um, might be a good solution. So. Thank you. Council Member Woods, and then we'll go to city staff to answer if there's a recommendation about what the phased in approach might look like. Um, you know, we, we took on cannabis and we have promoted cannabis and we've made cannabis a very viable business within our city due to a lot of the vendors that we have and to the city council for having the foresight to see that. And it started off with with medical marijuana, and we've come a long way from medical marijuana to recreational, where, as we've just heard from staff, it's become very popular. However, some of these cannabis facilities, uh, dispensaries and whatnot, are directly adjacent, directly adjacent, like a, a, an alleyway away from residential units, and we are not proactively out there making sure that they have security. This is a problem. This is a problem. Uh, and we need to ensure that what we said to our residents was that cannabis is a safe industry in your neighborhood is indeed the case. We thus need to pay for that. We need to pay for the regulations to assure that they're operating. And, and each cannabis business owes it to one another to assure that they're operating on the same field. We just heard testimony that they went around on just a casual thing and found three people without security guards as is required. What else is missing? It's more than just, you know, it's more than just having an extra uh, officer. It's having the tools that officer needs to do the job as well, be it that a vehicle, be that a computer, be it that access, be it that specialized training. So I understand the jump is really huge, but we really did make a commitment to our residents that they would operate in a very safe manner. We also have a problem in that the nasal ranger that we purchased really isn't effective with the high winds in Palm Springs. And thus, we need more people out there actually smelling at all hours of the day and night. And it may mean even more than just two officers are trained. So um, I'm in support, as are some of the other cannabis businesses, of increasing the fee as proposed by staff. Thank Mayor. you. So the city staff, do you have an answer about the phased-in approach and what that could look like? Yeah, I, I, I would I would suggest if, if it was the will of council to phase it in, it would be over three years, and we would, uh, if that was your pleasure, we would amend the resolution accordingly. Would it be equally split over the three years, or what would that look like? Yeah, we would divide the increase over three years, and then it would be stepped up every year till it reaches that maximum fee in the third year. And the reason you chose three years, I mean, it's a policy decision, so we could do two years or we could do additional time, but why is that your recommendation? It could be two, it could be four. It, it goes to the, the, the comment that Council Member Kors mentioned, which is if you phase it in, you're in part subsidizing those years that you're phasing it in. So if you didn't want to subsidize as long, you would do it in two years or you are okay with subsidizing, you could do three or four. But there, there's, no, there's no science to it, so it, it's the pleasure of the council. Thank you, Council Member Court. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, Marcus, just to follow up, if we phase it in over some number of years, we'll pick three for um, this discussion, uh, since you picked it, um, we would do the whole program, though, that's described, is that correct? Yes, we would just we, be subsidizing the cost of that program. That's correct. We would advocate to add those two code officers in the budget. Okay. And I do agree um, with Councilmember Woods about the importance that we're doing proactive. Um, and I hope the uh, CVCAN, the industry group, would also do outreach to the businesses about making sure they're following state and local laws. You know, if we have people not following the laws and we have 
a real serious incident. We could really hurt the entire industry and our city um, here. And, you know, when, we, when we're not making sure that, the, you know, this highly regulated business, which we've welcomed into the city, is operating legally, we're putting, you know, them in the city and our residents, you know, potential liability and risk. So I'll, I will support the sort of, I think three years seems fair. It gives people notice and new businesses and time to plan. I could support two as well. Uh, but I want to make sure that we, we move forward with doing this to make sure that this works for our residents, as we promised. I think that's, to me, the most important piece here. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Putin Middleton. Thank you. And, uh, I, I got a question, and I'm not sure if uh, Flynn will be able to answer it, but it, it's my memory is that we had uh, a very similar debate when it came to some building permit uh, fees uh, that we needed to increase, and we uh, reached that point where, uh, again, we felt it was just uh, an extraordinarily large increase that we were uh, imposing if we imposed it immediately. And uh, uh, if, if my memory is correct, Flynn, uh, what period of time did we choose to, uh, uh, to implement uh, that increase uh, in fees? Mayor Pro Tem, to respond to the question, that was relative to our fee increase that we did in early 2019. And if I remember correctly, we phased in those increases over uh, about a year and a half period, if I remember correctly. Mr. Fuller, is that about right? Yes. Okay. So about over an 18-month period is when we phased those in. I, I don't think that's necessarily... Uh, precedential uh, for this situation, but uh, uh, it, it gives us uh, an idea of what we did in the past when confronted with a similar issue. And uh, to the extent that this is uh, uh, a subsidy that we are in effect giving to uh, one industry that many other industries would uh, have to pay for, I I find myself thinking the Goldilocks number is closer to two years than three, but uh, that's uh, that's something that I'm willing to work with uh, everyone on. If I could ask city staff about the timing. So if it's required that we decide this issue and the phasing tonight, I understand that we have the whole user fee um, in front of us. But it is always nice to get input from stakeholders and from the community and business operators and workers when we decide these issues. So is it possible to, you know, either segregate out the cannabis fee for future decision or to, you know, do more outreach and then bring this back? I, I continue to be worried about if all cannabis businesses are doing well across the board or, you know, how these will impact um, all businesses, especially those who might be struggling right now because of the pandemic. And so um, that's my concern. If it's going to make a big difference, if it's two years or three years, you know, we're really not getting that input here tonight. Yes, you, you could pull this out and adopt the rest of them. Um, the fees, once you adopt them, the user fees, not the developer impact fees, are effective 30 days after adoption. Uh, I think the only developer impact fees that are affected here are the sewer connection fees, which would be 60 days after adoption. Um, it, it, it's your pleasure. We have reached out to the stakeholders. We believe that the ones that are most impacted by the cannabis fee increase are well aware. Uh, of it. Um, we can certainly do more outreach to them if that's your pleasure. And the timing is important because of the implementation of the budget? That's correct. We were trying to time this so that July 1st, the fee increases are effective and that revenue stream is included in next year's budget to fund the program. Thank you. Other comments, Council Member Kors. Yeah, um, my preference would be for us to decide this tonight for just a couple of reasons. One, there was a stakeholder meeting; all the cannabis businesses were notified, and uh, Council Members Woods and Garner did this. Um, 
if we look at the length of items on our future agendas to bring something back when there's been notice and public comment, and I've gotten calls on this from people on both sides of what we do. Um, and while I appreciate some businesses may not be doing as well as others, I don't think we would have lower fees for the businesses that weren't as successful, right? That's part of competition, just like we don't have lower TOT for the hotels that aren't doing well. Um, so I prefer we move forward and um, I'm happy to make a motion to do so if there are no other comments. Um, so I'd make a motion that we move forward with all the uh, recommendations in the resolution, but the phase in the cannabis fees over three years. Thank you. Just to clarify, equally over three years? Equally over three years. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. So there's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, can we have oh. Oh, Council Member Woods? I just wanted to report out a little bit about the subcommittee and um, Council Member Garner may want to do the same. Um, the fees were discussed. The attorney discussed the fees um, at length. Um, there were, the callers that called in tonight were on were as part of that as well. Um, but we also heard the other side that um, people wanted us to be proactive. And particularly, we heard from the residential side that they wanted us to be proactive as well. And with that, um, I'll let um, Councilmember Gardner add anything else. Fun trouble there. Uh, we, we did. We heard from quite a few people. There were, I think, about 50 people on, on that call. It was a mix of businesses and residents. Um, from what I could tell, there were more business owners than residents, but we don't Someone did ask on that call how many there were, and you know, we couldn't provide that um, specifically. But uh, that's just so that's just my recollection from what I could see of the, of the people's names. Uh, I think pretty much everybody on that call did not want a fee increase and quite had questions about those fee increases. I think that those have been answered tonight by Veronica. Um, and, and I think the most important part of that is, is this proactive enforcement with things like security guards. Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, for instance, I was uh, visiting with a cannabis business owner who was very concerned about doing everything exactly the right way. Um, and so then if we have people who are not hiring security guards, for instance, or not doing other things, they're... Um, it's it's really hurting these businesses that are legally being re legally responsible, and especially when it comes to hiring a whole other person. Um, so I'm I do want us to be proactive, and I just want to also balance that with um, being considerate of this new industry that's that's in our city, um, because we do get a good amount of revenue from them, and um, it is. There are a lot of possibilities for the future of, of cannabis in California and in Palm Springs. Um, so I think that the three years is a good uh, compromise. Thank you. So there's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Kors. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Council Member Garner. Yes. Council Member Kors. I'm sorry, Council Member Woods. I can vote twice. <laughs> yes. And Mayor Holstich. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. If council don't doesn't mind, I'm hoping to finish the public hearing items. We have two more short ones, Madam, and then we can take a break. And Madam Mayor, um, item D, uh, the Tefra hearing, uh, that does need to be postponed uh, to the meeting of June 10th. Uh, there is going to be some minor um, edits to the notice, and it will be re-noticed. And I would recommend a motion to continue that to the next meeting. Thank you. I'll make a motion to continue item 2D to the next meeting, June 10th. Second. There's a motion and a second. Can we have a call vote? Mayor Holstich. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Garner. 
Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero to continue the matter. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is item 2E, a public hearing to vacate a portion of the public right of way for Sunny Dunes Road. If we can have a staff report, please. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of City Council, Joel Montalvo, Engineering Services. The item before you today is for right-of-way vacation of excess, excess public right-of-way on Sunny Dunes Road just west of Thornhill Road. The existing right-of-way on Sunny Dunes Road um, at this location is 88 feet wide or 44 foot half width. The 88 foot right-of-way um, is required for a street that's designated as a secondary thoroughfare. Sunny Dunes is currently designated as a collector street that only requires a 30 foot half width right-of-way. Uh, staff has done all the research and communicated with all the utility companies and has determined that the excess right-of-way can be vacated. Um, the only uh, exception is Southern California gas requires a five-foot easement that can be easily accommodated within the, the uh, right-of-way vacation. Staff recommends approval of the right-of-way vacation. That concludes uh, my, my report. Thank you. Are there any questions for city staff? Seeing none, I'd like to open the public hearing that appellant will have up to five minutes to present their case. If requested, the appellant will have two additional minutes at the end for rebuttal. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing item for up to two minutes. City Clerk, if you could please begin. Uh, Madam Mayor, there is no public comment for this uh, hearing. Thank you. Thank you. There being no speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from council or is there a motion? Move to approve. I'll second. Thank you. There's a motion and second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Council Member Garner. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Holstich. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. We will now take a 10 minute break. So we will adjourn and come back at 8.15.
you. We will come back from recess and move to the next item, which is item 3A, consideration of an ordinance requiring labor peace agreements. If we can have a staff report, please. Yes, honorable mayor, members of the city council, uh, the item before you tonight is uh, a proposal uh, coming back to you from February of 2020, uh, where the council considered two items, uh, both of which are on the agenda tonight. The first is uh, an ordinance requiring labor peace agreements, and the second one, which will be heard later tonight, is community workforce agreements. <clears throat> a um, labor peace agreement is an agreement uh, between a proprietor and um, a, a union group uh, that contains four key elements. Uh, it prohibits labor organizations and members from engaging in picketing, work stoppages, boycotts, and other economic interference. Uh, it also provides that the business owner agrees not to disrupt efforts uh, by that bona fide labor organization to communicate with and attempt to organize and represent the business employees. Uh, the third element is uh, the bona fide labor organization must have access at reasonable times to areas in which the business employees work for the purpose of meeting with employees to discuss their right to representation, employment rights under state law in terms and in conditions of employment. And the fourth element is the labor peace agreement uh, does not need to mandate any particular method of, uh, of election or certification of the bona fide labor organization. Those are the four key elements of, uh, of a labor peace agreement as defined under state law, and the item before you incorporates that definition into the ordinance. Um, under state law, cannabis uh, businesses that have 20 or more employees are required to enter into a labor peace agreement. The ordinance before you tonight proposes to uh, reduce that number uh, below 20. Uh, as indicated in the staff report, other cities have adopted similar ordinances reducing the number uh, to something less than 20. For instance, Cathedral City recently adopted an ordinance that requires cannabis operators with 10 or more employees to enter into a labor peace agreement. The city of Pomona adopted an ordinance that set that threshold at five or more employees. The city of Corona uh, adopted an ordinance uh, within the last few years requiring labor peace agreements regardless of the number of employees. Uh, the ordinance before you uh, is similar to the city of Pomona's in terms of the threshold, and that is five. Uh, and so the, or the proposed ordinance establishes that uh, cannabis businesses with five or more employees uh, must enter a into a labor peace agreement. Uh, the, um, the proposed ordinance also does not d distinguish between uh, supervisorial employees or part-time employees. It, it just says... Uh, if a cannabis business has five or more employees, then it needs to enter into uh, a labor peace agreement. Uh, I believe that concludes uh, my staff presentation. If the council has any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Council Member Forrest. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I guess questions and comments. Um, and Glad to see this back. Just a reminder of how many things we were very close to doing before the pandemic and the shutdowns that we're finally um, getting to catch up on. Um, and this is one of them, which we already had a meeting on the business retention, economic development. Um, now I think task force, uh, Mayor Holstage and I um, met with stakeholders on this as well and got information. Um, and just some, from just a few of the comments and questions I had, I just want to uh, if you can just um, answer just some questions uh, so the public's aware. So these agreements do not require anyone, um, any employee to be a member of a union or any of these businesses to have to hire union employees. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. All right. So the obligation on businesses is simply not to try and disrupt an effort of a union to organize the workers and to provide um, a place and time for workers to meet with a union. Right? That's, That's the only obligation on the businesses? Correct, on the business. And, and as I mentioned, the obligation then on the labor organization is to avoid uh, work stoppages. And that really is the, the key um, 
key factor in this ordinance in terms of the city's interest in adopting it. Because of the significant source of revenue that the city receives from cannabis taxes, the city has that interest in, in preventing workshop stoppages. Yes, and thank you. And I, so I support this. I think that um, for two reasons. One, it, it does ensure that uh, the cannabis businesses don't end up with strikes or any work stoppages, which is important, obviously, for the city. And our cannabis businesses have a lot of Palm Springs residents in them. Uh, and this allows those residents to unionize if they so desire. Uh, and I think this is a really good move forward, uh, as we talked about cannabis earlier, which is a growing industry in our city and does provide, you know, opportunity for good paying jobs for our residents. So I really appreciate uh, your work on this uh, for the city attorney, um, and I'm looking forward to supporting it. Uh, but I won't make a motion until I hear from other council members. Council Member Garner. Thank you. Uh, my question is is just on the logistics of it. How does it work in terms of um, who's bringing these agreements to the businesses and, and making it all happen? Uh, Councilmember Gardner, that's a that's a fair question. Really, it is going to be incumbent on the business owners themselves. Uh, any business owner that either applies for a new permit or renews their permit is going to have to establish that they uh, have entered into this agreement or that they will do so within 180 days following the issuance of the permit. Uh, and so it, it's really in their interest to, to, to come up with the agreement and, and to negotiate the agreement. So who exactly are they negotiating the agreement with? Well, if there's a, a bona fide labor organization, uh, then they would negotiate with that organization. Uh, if there is not an organization, they would, uh, they would offer it to the employees. Okay. Um, so I know the UFCW is working on this. So the, that would be, I think, the, the main group to, to talk to for our businesses. But... Um, I, I did have a chance to talk to a rep from the UFCW earlier, and I forgot to ask this question. So I do know that they're really um, proactive and responsive, so I'm, I'm hoping that they'll be doing outreach to these businesses uh, if this passes. Uh, but that is just something that I want to kind of flag for us with any of these types of agreements is just making sure that, that our businesses actually know how it works to prevent any um, future issues. Other questions or comments? I'll move the item. I'll second it. Any further discussion? I jumped in there, Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Beat you to it. Uh, so if we could have a roll call vote, please. Council Member Kors? Yes. Mayor Holstich? Yes. Council Member Garner? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is item three B. I'm sorry, Mayor. Of an ordinance. Oh, sorry, the city clerk needs to read the title of the ordinance. Thank you. Uh, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Springs, California, adding Palm Springs adding Palm Springs Municipal Code Section 5.55.115 to require cannabis businesses to enter into labor peace agreements as a condition of canna cannabis business licensure, transfer, or renewal. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. Now the next item is item 3B, consideration of an ordinance to allow for the electronic service of government claims and notices. Staff report, please. Honorable Mayor and City Council, uh, Senate Bill 1473 amended the Government Torts Claims Act to authorize a person to present a claim uh, by ele electronically submitting it to a public entity, if expressly auth authorized to do so by an ordinance or resolution of that entity. Uh, in the beginning of COVID, uh, we did transition uh, to allow for uh, people to file their claims online, and this would just codify their option to do so. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Or is there a motion? Move to approve. I'll second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. 
Aye. Councilmember Gardner. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Mayor Holstedge. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. And this is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Springs, California, amending section 3.16.016B of the Palm Springs Municipal Code to allow for the electronic service of government claims and notices. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to unfinished business. So the next item is item 4A, a discussion of a community workforce agreement. Can we have a staff report, please? Yes, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, the item before you is a continuation of a discussion item that we had uh, last month regarding the Community Workforce Agreement. Uh, the Council discussed that at quite some length uh, in April, and so I will try and be brief in my uh, staff report tonight. A Community Workforce Agreement is a, a, an agreement that a city uh, can voluntarily enter into with uh, trade unions uh, in order to provide for certain community benefits. Uh, in exchange for um, uh, the uh, city requiring that uh, certain conditions be met as part of uh, public works contracts that the city, um, city lets. That is what is before you tonight, a community workforce agreement uh, for those public works projects over a million dollars that are bid by the city. As the council will recall from the discussion in April, there were five remaining issues that um, were sort of deal point issues that had not yet been agreed to between city representatives and the, uh, the Trades Council. Those are, uh, uh, to refresh your memory, an exemption from the applicability of the CWA for local contractors, uh, a provision allowing the city to terminate the agreement without cause, uh, an opportunity for the city to rebid a project without the CWA if the city doesn't receive adequate numbers uh, of bids or if the bids received uh, exceed the city's cost estimate. Uh, the fourth provision was a provision providing for the payment of benefits or amounts in lieu of benefits to non-union workers. And the uh, fifth provision was one protecting the city from being liable for monetary damages. Uh, uh, city representatives have had conversations with the Trades Council over the last month or so. We've traded uh, kind of dueling versions of the agreement. Uh, for the most part, those five issues are, remain outstanding uh, with, I, I would say, the uh, exception of the last issue. Um, that, that is the provision that protects the city from being liable for monetary damages. You, the council will recall that uh, in, at the April council meeting, uh, there was some discussion by the representatives from the uh, Trades Council uh, that they might be uh, amenable to some sort of limitation on monetary damages. Uh, including perhaps a, um, a mutual attorney's fees uh, provision. Uh, in recent days, we've had uh, additional conversations with the Trades Council. While they aren't agreeable to a flat-out um, uh, uh, waiver or limitation on monetary damages, they have proposed language that, that uh, I believe is, is reasonable. Um, and I can provide that to the, to the Council if you wish. It essentially provides that uh, if there are any knowing or willful uh, defaults or breaches by the city, uh, in those cases, the, um, the dispute can go to arbitration and it would be resolved by arbitration. And if there's a, if there's a, a knowing or willful breach by the city, then the city uh, could be subject to monetary damages. Um, again, I believe that it probably meets the intent uh, of the uh, city representatives as we've been negotiating this over the last year or so. The, the idea really was to avoid kind of an inadvertent or, or negligent uh, mistake on behalf of maybe the <coughs> CWA administrator or city staff uh, resulting in monetary damages to the city. Uh, and so I believe that's a, that's a reasonable compromise that the, that the unions have agreed to. In addition to that uh, compromise language, uh, the Trades Council have also uh, agreed to um, a kind of um, specification that city uh, re Palm Springs residents uh, will be the first in, uh, to be contacted for work under the CWA. So uh, it breaks down the current two-tier system into um, uh, uh, subcategories of the first tier so that Palm Springs residents are first called, then those zip codes that overlap Palm
Palm Springs but aren't entirely within Palm Springs, those would be the second to be called. And then uh, if sufficient workers weren't available uh, from that tier, then other uh, Coachella Valley and Riverside County workers would be called. In addition to that, the Trades Council uh, has recently agreed to commit to holding at least one annual career fair in the city of Palm Springs, and the purpose of that career fair would uh, be to provide an opportunity for Palm Springs residents to learn more about uh, careers in the, in the building trades. So that's where we are. Again, uh, we haven't necessarily uh, been able to meet eye to eye with, uh, with the Trades Council on all of the issues, but certainly on the one that was discussed, and I think uh, in my opinion, kind of agreed to at the April meeting, uh, they, have, uh, they have come to the table and, and provided some uh, reasonable language. That concludes my staff report. I'm certainly available to answer any questions. Thank you so much, the city attorney and city staff for all of your hard work on this and going back and forth multiple, multiple times and for resolving some of those issues ahead of this meeting. We very much appreciate your hard work. Are there questions? for city staff or comments from council members. Council member reports. Uh, uh, sure, a uh, couple things. First, I, I appreciate uh, all the work from staff on this. Um, I think uh, Mayor Hosage and I started having these conversations probably a year and a half ago. And again, the pandemic sort of delayed this, uh, but I think the last meeting was really helpful. We had a lot of questions from council members. Um, and I believe all the council members have a, had an opportunity to get those questions answered, which is really important uh, on an issue like this. Um, I really appreciate the trade unions one on, on the issues the city attorney mentioned, uh, most importantly, the legal uh, damages uh, issue, uh, which at least for me was a real stumbling block and I'm glad that was worked out. I think the career fairs will really be a good benefit to our residents. Uh, and I, I, I wanna point out the benefits of these, right? Because the goal of this is to have more of our residents and residents in the area um, get these jobs instead of, you know, we know we had one hotel, failed hotel project that had brought in people from Arizona. Uh, and we want the first rate of these jobs to go to our residents. And I think that's a really important benefit. And to be able to do career trainings and let people who are growing up here know there are really good careers available with good uh, paying jobs. Uh, is really important. So seeing this as a partnership uh, and moving forward in that way, uh, I think can really bring a lot of benefit. And I know this is new for the city. Um, other cities have been doing this for quite some time, but I think while there are pieces that are not ideally if I was drafting it, um, that's part of a negotiation. And I think this is moving forward in a good direction. The one other thing I would like uh, to add and just wanna share for council, if anyone has thoughts on this, is uh, the building trades have been able to, you know, pull together the number of members they have uh, who would be eligible to work on these contracts who are Palm Strings residents. And that we get that number up, you know, and once a year get an update. So we can see if we are having the success in getting people these jobs. And if we're not, then it's just a discussion with the building trades on what we and they can do to um, see more of these jobs uh, coming to residents and more residents getting good union paying jobs. So that's the only tweak I would make to this, whether it needs to be in the ordinance or somewhere else. Um, I just wanted to suggest that. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Garner. Thank you. And thank you to staff and council. Um, I know that I've had a lot of discussion with building and trades in the last month. Um, and we had you know, a very long hour and a half discussion at one meeting, two hour conversation at another meeting. Uh, and I thank them for answering all of my questions. Um, you know, part of my district has the highest unemployment in Palm Springs. So when we're talking about these types of issues, I really want to know everything that I can about it and how it's going to impact the district um, and the city as a whole. Um, so it, one of the things that I talked with the unions about is that outreach. So I am hearing you know, one event, <laughs> but that's certainly not enough. And I know in my discussions, we talked about a lot more than that. So I do hope that 
um, that is <laughs> far more because we do have really low union membership in terms of the building um, and trades in, in Palm Springs and in, in throughout the Valley. And so if we're going to develop that and provide these jobs for residents here, then it's going to take a lot more than one event um, to get people connected and understand the opportunities that are provided to them. Um, the one thing that was explained to me in terms of um, how to get people connected was if we're if we have this contract available with the city, then they can say, "Hey, these jobs are coming up in Palm Springs. You don't have to drive two hours, right?" So I think that is something that I just want to point out to the public is that um, that would be the benefit is that you would be able to. Um, Start your apprenticeship with a carpenters, for instance, and while you have to go to Ontario for some training, you would also be able to do on-the-job training, you know, here in Palm Springs with Palm Springs projects. Uh, in terms of uh, what Councilmember Kors said with the numbers, I do want to be able to track that, you know, how what is the impact, and as well as just the demographics on our projects, and not just the million-dollar projects that fall under uh, a million plus projects that fall under this, but all of our projects, where are the people coming from? Um, you know, who is benefiting from, from city contracts? Uh, that would be, that's information that we don't know right now. And that was information that I, I wanted, but I'm resigned to, <laughs> to not get it because we just don't have it. So if there is an ability to do that tracking um, in a way that isn't too burdensome for staff, I would really like to see that. And maybe that's something that the, um, contractor can provide us, right, and, and just a demographic list rather than the city staff needing to go out and do it. Uh, otherwise, um, I'm, I'm good with this and uh, just want to continue working with, you know, labor to, to be able to actually make sure that um, our residents are taking advantage of, of these opportunities. And, and Council Member Garner, I should point out wh when I um, specified the one annual career fair, um, th there is language in here that requires the unions to do other things, including participating in Village Fest, the annual Pride Festival, or One PS Picnic, um, providing industry speakers at city programs and outreach events. Um, so there is, uh, uh, there are other obligations of them to participate for sure. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, and, and I want to pick up on something that uh, Councilmember Garner said. Uh, one event is not enough. Uh, uh, this is this is an area for a variety of reasons. I feel really strongly, actually, very passionately about. Um, one experience. Uh, uh, that I'm going to name is uh, my son currently is uh, vice principal at a career technical education uh, high school in Ventura County. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the students at that school uh, are individuals that come from uh, the low-income community of Oxnard. Many are farm worker uh, children. Uh, numerous individuals are graduating each year uh, and going directly into uh, union trades, uh, making uh, in excess of uh, uh, many tens of thousands of dollars a year in a career that, uh, that they can build on. Uh, that didn't happen from one opportunity for them to interact. They started interacting with uh, uh, union leaders who are trustees of the school uh, along with other uh, individuals in education in their uh, eighth and ninth grades as they were making decisions as to what high school to go to, much less throughout uh, the course of their time. Uh, we're going to turn things around uh, for so many individuals who don't have the kind of opportunities for a financially secure uh, future. Uh, we've got to work with, uh, with kids at a very, very early age, and it needs to involve uh, the unions and employers. Uh, the other area that's personal to me is uh, I spent 36 years uh, in the workers' compensation field. Uh, and 
injuries on the job, horrific injuries, and payments under the table uh, were absolutely rife within the construction industry, and it only got worse over the course of my career. One place it did not get worse was in union jobs because the union was there making sure that the rules were followed. So uh, I'm very pleased that we are moving forward. Uh, and, uh, and I thank my colleagues and I thank everyone in the construction trades uh, for the work that, that you've done on this. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Councilmember Woods, would you like to go, or I'm happy to go as well. I do. Um, I, I think everything has been said, so there's no reason to re-say what has already been said. Um, and so, in the interest of time, I will just say that I agree. Thank you. Thank you. I should have gone first because now I'm going to be ashamed for speaking. Thank you for your brevity and getting us through this meeting, Councilmember Woods. Um, you know, I'll just say thank you to everyone for their hard work on this and for the building trades and all of the stakeholders really for going through this long process. I know the pandemic put a wrench in our plans of, of bringing this forward and it's been a long um, conversation and we really have gone back and forth and advocated for the best interests of our community and our residents and our workforce. So um, thank you to everyone. You know, I do think we should talk about the benefits of community workforce agreements like this. Um, I did submit a lot of academic articles into the public record that's part of the public comment about the benefits um, because we have heard, you know, some of the negative aspects or potential negative aspects, but um, looking at it from an academic perspective um, and really you know, non-biased information, there are a number of benefits to the community here um, to have taxpayer dollars for city projects go back into our own community. And that's the goal, right? To empower our workforce um, so people can um, have good careers and, and long careers in this industry. So someone called in and said the system is working fine, but that's not true because most of our um, jobs and for city projects that are taxpayer dollars are going to out of the area workers. Um, they're leaving town. I've sat here for almost four years and approved a lot of bids for projects that are city projects over a million dollars. Um, you know, and there have been few that have been local. Um, and we were talking about local workers. So, um, it's sort of like a chicken and an egg build it and they will come, you know, the, the duty to, create these jobs is not just on the union to do outreach, but it's actually on us as policymakers to make sure that when we're using taxpayer dollars and city funds to make sure that it's going into the community and creating good jobs and empowering a diverse workforce, all those things that we want. So I'm really hopeful in improving this policy and tracking the data, we will grow and grow these opportunities in Palm Springs, more and more workers in these trades will be able to afford to live in Palm Springs and be able to stay and raise their families. Like we heard in public comment and we got letters from people who worked in these industries for 41 years, I think someone wrote in, um, in the Coachella Valley, which is just so impressive. Um, and Mayor Pro Tem spoke personally, you know, I've represented dozens and dozens of workers who've worked in the construction in industry, um, typically um, non-union, and I've seen, you know, wage theft and injuries and all of the problems that can happen if you don't have a pension and other benefits. So um, I'm really hopeful that this will create a lot of benefit to the community in terms of local jobs and local wealth um, and local careers, because um, that's what our residents need access to. And I appreciate Council Member Garner for representing, um, you know, un people who are, um, you know, affected the most in our community. I think that's really important. So I'm very proud to support this and thank you. Thank you to everyone um, for all of your work on this. I will move the item. I'll second it. And, and just for clarification, is this uh, a motion to include uh, a requirement for annual reports on the number of skilled workers, including uh, permissible demographics? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. 
and the other changes that you described, right? Correct. So the liability language, the tiered for Palm Springs residents and the Coachella Valley residents, the additional outreach activities, and then keeping track of the data is what I had documented in that motion. Is that right, Council Member Kors? That is. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We'll have a roll call vote, please. Council Member Kors? Yes. Mayor Holstech? Yes. Council Member Garner? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is item 4B, overview of the fiscal year 2021-2022 comprehensive budget and five-year capital improvement program. If we can have a staff report, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, we're pleased again tonight to present to you the draft comprehensive budget. Uh, this will be your third look at the draft general fund budget as well as the draft uh, comprehensive budget, which includes all of your various funds in addition to the general fund. <clears throat> Based on your prior direction, and as we've mentioned in the staff report, we are recommending deferring the uh, increase to vacation rental permit fees. Uh, at your public hearing just earlier tonight, those fees were not included in that item. So that reduced the uh, general fund revenues by about a half million dollars. Uh, so your total uh, fiscal year 21-22 revenue is uh, around 127.7 million. Uh, your action you just took to phase in the cannabis permit fee increase will slightly reduce that revenue, uh, but it's not significant in terms of the <laughs> $127 million budget, so we're not concerned with that. Uh, the proposed revenue is uh, slightly below uh, current revenue this year, uh, and that's mainly because there's, um, there's no budgeted transfers into the general fund as there were in this current fiscal year. General fund expenditures uh, were adjusted accordingly. Uh, we, we've recommended uh, funding the additional code officers for vacation rentals through salary savings that have accumulated this fiscal year, which would be carried over into next fiscal year. <clears throat> and um, so your expenditures are now at about $127.5 million in the general fund, uh, of slightly higher than uh, actual expenditures in the prior fiscal year, 1920. And so we've presented to you basically a balanced budget with approximately $150,000 surplus. So we've talked about a number of discretionary items with you in the past two meetings. The one that's remaining for your uh, discussion tonight, the budget does include uh, IHEP and CVEP funding, uh, which includes the $125,000 CVEP membership as well as the $212,500 management fee for the IHUB. Uh, you asked for and we provided analysis on the progress and performance of CVEP and IHUB over its uh, 10 years or so. Um, so I will pause here and, and ask if there's any direction. Uh, we certainly can proceed with this budget with it appropriated and you can make a decision later to fund a portion or all of... Uh, CVEP's uh, financing requirements. Um, there was information from Mr. Wallace included in the staff report, um, but I will pause here for your direction. Any comments on that item from council members? Council member Wood. You're on mute. Yes, yeah, thank you. I was the one that asked for the analysis on the IHUB. Um, it, it appears that we've spent, um, the investment that we've spent on IHUB has been, I'm looking in the staff report, I think around $4 million. And the outcome has been minimal uh, to the city. And we just, um, I don't see a reason to continue with IHUB or CVAP. I, there's nothing compelling in the staff report that basically says that they're giving us bang for our buck or return on our investment. And we need money for roads and we need money for several other things in the city at this point. Council Member Court. 
Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the analysis in the staff report. Uh, um, and while I agree we need money for other things, I really do want to see us um, allocate funds for economic development. I think it's really important that we diversify the economy here. Um, you know, ideally, we'd have a situation like we have, whether it's with the Coachella Valley Association of Governments or the Greater Palm Springs Convention Visitors Bureau, where all the cities are contributing on some kind of formula. But that doesn't seem to be happening here at all. Um, it's mostly Palm Springs and Palm Desert, from what I can tell, and I think Indio contributes um, some more. Um, I just want to get the city manager, if you have some thoughts on sort of return on investment, is this the best investment? Would we be better off if you know, we put that into our own economic development program? Uh, I really appreciate your expertise sort of as we're discussing this, but I do want to see us appropriate funds for economic development. I think it's really important. Um, it's an area that really did get des truly decimated um, during COVID and that we, we need to get back on track. Sure. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to chime in a little bit. I certainly, I agree that overall, when you look at the investment made specifically in CVEP and IHUB, that the return as far as job creation and other value is probably not what one would expect. Now, when you look broadly at city programs, I think it's also important to recognize we invest in a lot of programs where the return I don't, I don't want to say it's questionable, but val value is very relative, is the point. We do a lot of things as a matter of course that deliver high value, whether it's law enforcement or fire or whatever, where we spend the money that needs to be spent really just because it's almost assumed that we're going to do those things continuously. Um, and we know what the outcomes are as far as keeping community safe, but point is those core programs we don't tend to question. These newer ones that get established like economic development um, tend to get a little more scrutiny. So it really begs the broader question, what is value in terms of the things that we invest in, right? Um, I think probably a very quick assessment of CVEP and IHUB is that it's not produced, but partially because it hasn't had a, a broader network of support. So uh, if you look at investment in tourist industry as a point of contrast, which is our absolute pillar of strength, you would see layer upon layer of investment, both on the public side and on the private side. You'd see synergy between lots and lots of layers of networked groups to the point where it's not just tourism as an industry, it's not just hosp hospitality, but you've got um, hoteliers, you've got convention bureaus, you've got um, you know, main street groups, sometimes the breakdown is geographic, you've got a chamber and a desert business association, you've got layers and layers of, of niche organizations, and generally every one of them is additive, right? It's, it's adding value, it, it, it has a purpose. In many instances, these niche areas of focus break off from a broader one as, as the infrastructure for tourism economic development activity matured. If you contrast that with other kinds of economic development that are intended to diversify beyond that pillar of strength, you would find just the opposite, which is really not many of those layers in place. In fact, from a city investment perspective, CVEP and IHUB might be one of the only investments that's, that's substantial. And so even if we were to assess pretty quickly that it hasn't delivered, which again, the first broad question is really how do you measure value? When you're investing in long-term future gains, you know, we take for granted that we might invest either in a golf course or a convention bureau and lots of things and measure the impact in indirect ways, not necessarily the very direct ways. But beyond that, um, it's also probably just a lack of all of that synergy. We have a a tool that I would think would belong more in the middle stage evolution of an economic development program, not at the beginning. We're a house missing a foundation, so to speak. Now it begs the question, how do you build the foundation, right, if the walls are already in place? And so I think if the council were inclined to divest from this piece of economic development, we would certainly want to set funds aside and say, how can they be reinvested in some of the earlier stage economic development activities that would be necessary to make these potentially middle stage or latter stage activities like business incubation specific to a niche like technology more successful? One way to do that is to leave that program in place and try to build around it. 
Another way to do that is to divest from those services and try to reinvest in more of those foundational type tools. It's too early in my tenure to really evaluate which of those is more appropriate, and I think, frankly, you could do either. But, but the bottom line from a, a very quick perspective is it, it probably hasn't delivered what you'd want it to, but that's not for a simple reason. It's not necessarily because that program itself has failed. It's because this is a very nascent investment in diversification, something that takes years and years and years to accomplish, as I'm sure a thriving tourist industry did, decades, generations even, and we're at the early stages of that. You kind of have to start somewhere and build, and so, you know, again, that just brings us back to either shifting these funds to that more beginning stage of development or leaving them and try to build around it to create more of the success that we're looking for. Does that help at all? Um, it does. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. I might propose. Um, hearing that and hearing the conversation from council that we allocate the funds um, in the budget for economic development. And then we have a conversation about those investments and uh, the funding to CVAP and IHUB as described in the staff report. You know, it's a 10 year relationship and program. And so I'd like to have a more thorough conversation about it, including, you know, including other stakeholders and talking about regional economic development and who's doing that. And um, I think that those conversations deserve more time um, than deciding it here tonight. So that would be my proposal. So that way we can, um, you know, keep the budget as is, including those funds, and then we can allocate them later um, as the council wishes. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, I concur with uh, your recommendation. I think that's a very uh, prudent way to uh, to proceed. We we need to be investing in broader economic outcomes, uh, and I would like to give. Uh, uh, the city manager an opportunity to uh, to work more closely uh, with CVAP and IHUB, uh, but I share frustration uh, that uh, this is supposed to be a Coachella Valley wide uh, initiative, uh, and uh, each and every year uh, we that I've been here we find ourselves looking at this program and feeling as if uh, it's ourselves and, uh, and our friends in Palm Desert, uh, uh, and, then a, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the, the Valley needs to step back and make a determination as to whether or not we believe Valley-wide in this program. Uh, because it's never going to succeed solely as the Palm Springs program. Uh, and uh, uh, so l let's, let's get those conversations and have some really frank uh, discussions uh, as to uh, can we get past uh, uh, this sense that we're going at uh, uh, with just ourselves and one other friend. Thank you. Other comments? Does that work for the other council members who raised concerns? Okay, thank you, Mayor and Council. Wood. We'll proceed accordingly. Oh. oh. Sorry, Council Member Wood, hold this hand raised. I, I just want to say that what I'm hearing, which I would agree to, is that we put the money as economic development and not as CVAP and IHOP, and then we'll have a further discussion on how to best basically expend that money. Is that the understanding? Okay, yes, I can agree with that. That sounds great. Thank you. Go ahead, Marcus. Okay, we'll proceed accordingly. <clears throat> Moving on with our presentation, and please do interrupt me if you do have questions as I proceed through the slides. Um, so as far as personnel expenditures, we've uh, discussed this in the, in the past and, and just want to emphasize we have included the funding to restore the 18 vacant positions due to the reduction in force. 
Uh, we've also recommended funding the following seven positions. You've seen these before. Uh, I will. Uh, I would like to uh, suggest to you because we've not re received any pushback from council, we'd like to actually start the recruitment process on some of these positions, uh, knowing that um, none of these positions will be filled until after July 1st. So that's our intent at this point. These are some cr key critical positions that we've identified uh, at the past um, meetings. <clears throat> uh, and as I mentioned, we're deferring the increase to the vacation rental permit fees. Uh, and we'll further evaluate full program costs and ongoing monitoring of hotline calls and our ability to provide more proactive investigations. Um, <clears throat> the budget does include uh, one code officer that will work a key shift uh, from Thursday to Sunday, 2 p.m. to 1 a.m. And then, as I've mentioned in the staff report, there's a need for a supervisor uh, so that all of the code staff seven days a week are uh, supervised by non-sworn supervisors in lieu of the lieutenant. And that supervisor would work a shift of Sunday to Wednesday, 11 to nine. And as I mentioned, we usually have significant salary savings year to year that can uh, cover that cost for the next fiscal year. And we'll evaluate that program through the next fiscal year. <clears throat> So this will change based on your direction. So the increased cannabis permit fee will be um, slightly reduced as we phase in that increase over three years. Uh, the budget does include the additional two code officers, again, to help us be more proactive and to uh, address all of the regulatory requirements of the cannabis operations. Uh, that one code officer, so those two code officers will again be uh, assigned shifts that we've evaluated our key in ensuring that we can provide those uh, facility inspections as well as proactive uh, uh, inspections and proactive monitoring for odors and other problems. Uh, and we had talked about this, but the cannabis permit fee could have been increased to 4325, but you, you've made that decision earlier tonight. <clears throat> um, an important part of the budget is your allocated positions and compensation plan. Uh, based on what we've discussed, uh, the general fund allocated positions will increase by four for those additional officers, code officers. Uh, and as I'll mention in, in the, later in this presentation, the airport fund, uh, we're expanding the maintenance staff to address all of the good things that are happening with the ticket wing expansion and the new baggage handling system. And so the allocated plan includes two positions funded at the airport, a maintenance supervisor and an executive program administrator. So the 21-22 plan will have uh, an additional six positions for a total of 516, with 24 of those remaining allocated but unfunded. Now moving on to the rest of the city's budget, um, people may not understand that there's other revenue uh, that is uh, in excess of the general fund revenue of 163 Pardon? million. Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry, um, before we get into that, can we comment on some of this that you just mentioned? Absolutely. Um, I, just because I know we're gonna get <laughs> ahead more. With the, the literacy program and, and recreation, um, one thing I noticed in the staff report was that it said literacy coordinator or equivalent number of part-time recreation program assistants. And I just wanted to, to flag that because I know that having an actual literacy coordinator was really important. Um, and at least the last time we had this position, it was, it was filled by somebody who worked at the James Jesse Center and did this work. And it was um, something that was really needed. And that was something that 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 used to happen at the Child Development Center, which of course was not connected to the city, but since it's closed, this kind of position with our city staff has been important. Um, so I would really like to see us make sure that we are focusing um, that role on literacy for, for the community, for our young kids, to make sure that they're getting that education before they, they enter the school system. Yeah, yes, absolutely, Councilmember Garner. Um, so the, the intent is to fill that position with two part-time recreation program assistants. We are providing the literacy program with those positions now. So those additional two part-time positions will be added 
to uh, Desert Highland and will expand our abilities to provide not only the literacy, literacy program, but other programs for that community. Okay, thank you. Other question now, questions about personnel. <clears throat> Marcus, I had a question just briefly. It noted in the staff report that we were increasing one of the positions um, to account for the minimum wage increase. Um, and I just had a question about if there are other positions at the city where people might be making less than $15 an hour um, or employees that we might be funding through contractors like parking enforcement with the airport or other contractors. and just, um, it's not an issue that we have to discuss now, but I think it would be helpful as councils talked about making sure everyone has a living wage in the city, that we are looking at those lowest paid employees to make sure people are getting a living wage. Yes, absolutely, Mayor. So the library page is the lowest, um, is the position with the lowest salary range. And so, yes, that salary range is being adjusted to comply with minimum wage law. When it comes to vendors or contractors, they have to comply with state state minimum wage laws. Um, but you're, you're correct. So uh, the allocated plan is adjusting that salary range to meet the minimum wage requirements. And that's the only position that's affected. Thank you. Yeah, and I... Uh obviously know that they have to meet minimum wage and so do we, but I, I meant more like looking at a living wage for the city of Palm Springs um, and making sure, you know, those people who are on that cusp um, that we're making sure that they can afford to have those jobs. So just a conversation I think for later as councils talked about um, making sure all of our employees um, are taken care of. Thank you. So can you walk us through for the public, because I don't think you included in your slides there, the difference then in the allocated and funded positions? The, the difference, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not following. Difference with what? So which positions are included in this budget then from the list? The 18 positions that were previously unfunded uh, and frozen, which <laughs> ones those are now, which would be included in the 21-22 budget? I'm sorry, it's been a long No, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I had that list in the prior staff reports, so I don't have it in front of me. Um, but that, that information is available in those uh, prior two staff reports um, that we had. And it was a range of positions, several at the um, police department. Um, many of them were in the maintenance and facilities department, including fleet mechanics and um, uh, facility maintenance staff, um, <clears throat> uh, a clerk at the fire department. So there was a whole host and range of positions that are being uh, brought back. And that actually process is underway and they're all being onboarded uh, as we speak. Thank you. Other questions on personnel? I don't see any markets. Okay, so I'll I'll just touch on highlights because we have several uh, other um, funds besides the general fund, and as I mentioned, uh, setting aside the general fund, there's another 163 million in revenue generated by all of those funds, with expenditures of 176, which uh, is a 13 million dollar deficit. But as a as an example, the Measure A. The Measure A fund or some of the other capital funds, uh, we carry over accumulated fund balance. And as we have projects that have significant expenses, that's what's paying for that additional uh, expenditure. So don't be concerned by that, um, that perceived deficit. So I'm gonna highlight some of the important funds that might or might not have an a, a impact on the general fund. Your recycling fund is a separate fund. It's a re special revenue fund that's uh, solely based on the recycling fee and solid waste charges that range from 14 cents to 24 cents a month based on the residential service. It's specifically tied to the tonnage of solid waste disposed at landfills, so it's counterintuitive. The more we're successful with diverting recycling, uh, to uh, from uh, landfills, the less money we get in recycling fees. So 
Um, but that recycling uh, revenue is what supports uh, our sustainability, sustainability manager and his assistant and all the recycling program costs. Uh, we are, are projecting uh, nominal revenue of 125000 next year. Uh, as you can see, the budget for the recycling program is, is almost 400000 We've been utilizing carryover fund balance, and uh, in the next year or two, that fund balance will be depleted, and so there'll be a need to evaluate whether we're going to subsidize the recycling fund from the general fund or uh, most likely because of all the organics uh, recycling uh, regulations that are being imposed will have to evaluate the franchise and likely increase the recycling fee so we can continue to support that cost. Uh, similar to recycling, there's a sustainability fund. Again, f this is a special revenue fund that's based on sustainability fees that are part of the solid waste fees. Again, it's based on tonnage, so the better that we do with diverting solid waste, the less revenue we get. <clears throat> it supports a half full-time position and all the sustainability program costs through the Sustainability Commission. Uh, revenue is uh, approximately just less than 400000 And again, we have expenditures exceeding that and have been utilizing the accumulated fund balance, which we are showing is depleted at the end of next fiscal year. So this will again be an item we have to carefully evaluate in the next fiscal year and determine how we can make it sustainable with uh, its own fees or we'll have to subsidize in the next fiscal year with general fund uh, revenue. So Marcus, when I'm, I have a question about the recycling fee and sustainability fees. So sure. when would we be able to assess increasing those fees? Uh, in the next, I think, three months, uh, there will be a conversation with uh, Palm Springs Disposal on a franchise amendment to address all of those new imposed regulations on organics recycling. Uh, there's a whole new you know, uh, waste stream that now has to be separated and collected and, and, and recycled. And so we're looking at a wholesale, whole scale change to the franchise. And at that time, all of it should be evaluated, including the franchise fee and these other fees that are all parts of the components of the overall solid waste charges, because there will be increases to the costs to the ratepayers because of these all the all of these imposed regulations um, from the state on organics recycling. Thank you. The Public Art Fund, uh, this is another special revenue fund. Uh, it's generated by a special fee on building permits, um, and it varies on the number and type of permits issued. It's applicable on um, residential as well as commercial and industrial buildings. It uh, covers all public art program costs, no staff costs. Uh, we're projecting conservatively 181000 in revenue next year. Uh, expenditures again exceed the revenue, but it's been uh, it has an accumulated fund balance. Um, and generally, looking historically in the past, uh, revenues are on average are, are, are right around three hundred thousand, two hundred seventy-five thousand. So, it's a constant source of revenue, um, which is dependent on uh, the the building community and the building permits that are being issued. The Quimby Fund, again, is a special revenue fund. It's generated, again, by a special fee on building permits and varies on the, t the number of permits issued, residential permits. <clears throat> and it provides, and it's limited to new park projects or new recreational amenities or facilities at existing parks. We've been using this uh, fund source for the new downtown park, and we will be using it <clears throat> um, for the... The, the new Demuth Dog Park that we have a 50% uh, 50 match requirement for the 1.3 million grant that we received from the state. We're projecting $650,000 in revenue next fiscal year. And when you gave us direction to proceed with a Demuth Dog Park grant, you uh, allocated next year's revenue as well as this year's revenue for that 50% match. And so the, the five-year CIP includes this um, uh, element in it for the Demuth Dog Park. Now I think what is of interest to most people in the community is the Measure J Fund. As we know, that's met, uh, generated, it's a special revenue fund generated through the one cent sales tax. 
Um, uh, looking at this current fiscal year, as as you know, we we're we're pleased that the pandemic didn't have the impact on sales tax that we had projected, and so we're looking at having 16 million in revenue this year, exceeding budget by 10 million. In addition to that, uh, at your recent meeting, you canceled the 2.8 million transfer that was scheduled to the general fund, given that the general fund this year is expected to be end in a surplus. And you also refinanced the downtown project bond, which reduced this year's payment by 2.4 million. So we have 15.2 million in available Measure J sales tax revenue for programming. We've been evaluating that revenue and projects with the Measure J Commission, and they did recommend the following appropriations for this current fiscal year. Uh, you did earlier approve the allocation of $6 million for street repairs, and that project will go out to bid in the near future. <clears throat> in addition, the Measure J Commission recommended the continuation of their community projects program uh, of a $1 million, and then these other projects which are moving forward through the uh, engineering um, process. Uh, these projects were recommended, and we're recommending and identifying them in the, the CIP. Uh, including all of those uh, allocations, you still have 7.2 million uh, of projected revenue that will be carried over into the next fiscal year. So I'll pause there if there's any questions with what staff and the Measure, K, Measure J Commission have recommended for this current fiscal year, because it will impact next fiscal year. Questions, Mayor Pro to Middleton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Marcus, thank you. This outstanding report. Uh, the $6 million that was allocated for street repairs, if we continue to allocate it $6 million per year going forward, do you have an estimate of how many years it will take for us to get to a point that uh, all of our uh, roads are at a satisfactory rating or above? Uh, I, I do. I'm going to go back and look at the prior staff report that was on consent because I had included mm -hmm. that information. So bear with me. I forget what item yeah. it was. <clears throat> I didn't want to pull it from consent, but I, I wanted to talk about it. I have to go through the whole alphabet. Hold on. <laughs> I don't okay. remember which one it was. <clears throat> C? It is C. Okay. I think it was early on. So, uh, as I mentioned in that staff report, we, we, um, uh, the project you approved will complete uh, reconstruction of streets up to a PCI score of about 55. <clears throat> and, um, to get to 60, which is really kind of the, the, the point where streets may or may not need to have a complete uh, rebuild, um, there's 140 street segments with 4.3 million square feet of pavement. And so that's about a $13 million cost. So just to get to all the streets with a, up to a PCI score of 60, we will need 13 million. So 6 million a year would take us to two plus years to get to that. And then going from 60 to 70, and 70 is kind of the cutoff of doing a slurry seal, which you see us doing now. Uh, there's a lot more streets. There's 345 street segments with 13.4 million square feet of pavement. So uh, we may be able to get by with a reduced cost of a grind and overlay. Uh, which has a slightly reduced cost, but even that is going to be nearly $27 million to get to the point where we've done a repair uh, of streets up to a score of 70. So that would be another uh, five years, four years uh, at $6 million a year. So $6 million is definitely the, a, a better number. You could uh, add more to it and get us there sooner but it's all about prioritizing the other important capital projects to be funded in Measure J. Well, I don't want to jump ahead of any, anyone else on uh, this issue. It's an important one, uh, but uh, 
I think we should certainly keep in mind uh, uh, as we finish our debates uh, as to whether or not we could augment this uh, uh, to get to 60 uh, clearly within uh, uh, two years uh, and uh, perhaps earlier. One of the things we learned a few years back when we made a significant uh, investment in uh, street repairs is uh, the uh, cost got much better when we were able to award uh, significantly larger contracts. Thank you. I have a question. So are we approving just the overall revenue for Measure J? I mean, there's a list of um, projects in our staff report. Usually those would come to us as a separate discussion item. And sometimes we've had even meetings with the Measure J Committee um, Commission to go over those projects, which are staff generated, which might be commission generated, which might be council priorities. Um, so the list of projects there, are we approving that in this budget or what's the process for giving input about priorities? What we're recommending uh is that you approve the allocation for these specific projects for this current fiscal year. And I'm uh, in the next slide, I'll talk about next fiscal year. Um, what we have laid out in the five-year plan as far as priorities was a method of uh, funding the majority of the projects that were canceled. So bringing back all of those projects that we had to cancel and use that funding to address the anticipated deficit in 1920 and 2021. Uh, the commission and the staff uh, evaluated some priorities and felt that was an important priority because all of those projects had been vetted and funded in the, in the past. And so um, at this point, uh, what's recommended, and, and, and a lot of these projects are park related because the parks were a priority for the commission. Um, and that's why you see those in this current fiscal year is bringing back some of that funding for the playground improvements. Thank you. So I'll let you go to the slide. I see Councilmember Clark has a question too, but I'd love to have a conversation about that process because originally Measure J, they do excellent work and, and I don't want to say anything about, you know, to show that they don't do great work, but I just have a question about process and oversight because initially it was an oversight board and I know we've given community projects so that they pick really important community projects to fund, but um, I think it might be a missed opportunity when we've talked about saving for something like a future library renovation or something like that. I mean, if it's only staff generated or commission generated um, and really council isn't giving policy input um, into those priorities. I know we said broadly, you know, parks are important, restrooms and parks are important, but do you understand what I'm saying? That I'd like an opportunity to weigh in as a council and have a clear process about um, picking priorities for Measure J so that we are able to do more longer term planning based on the community's priorities. That's a great point. Ms. Polly uh, is going to share some information because the commission is moving in that direction. And uh, I, I would venture to say it would probably be worth having a joint meeting with Measure J uh, maybe in September to discuss you know, what the council's priorities are and making sure they're consistent and, and they have the direction to move forward and uh, what to bring back in terms of project prioritization. Good evening. Um, at our last Measure J committee meeting, we had discussed options. I'm meeting with um, Don and I from engineering, are meeting with the subcommittee um, the beginning of June, and we're going to come up with a survey that we can um, have them do online. And what this is going to do is we're going to select categories, parks, facilities, library, and other items. So we're going to try to limit it to four or five items and have a survey. We're gonna to try to get that completed within the next month. Um, we're gonna post that on social media so everybody knows that there is a survey available to take. 
We're gonna to try to have hard copies at different locations. And once that survey is completed, we'd like to go through it and come up with recommendations. And we'd like to bring all of the organizations back in um, September to meet with us and give us their wish lists. So we'll have the library come, Parks and Rec Commission, and who, what other um, organizations would like to come and give us their um, ideas of what they would like to see go forward. So that's interesting. That's the first time hearing of that. Um, so I think that's a good process. It's proposed. I still want to talk about, you know, what as we're having a conversation about what's commission driven, what's council driven, you know, what's the policy, what's the oversight. I love an opportunity to, to think that through um, so that we're not you know, that we're having an opportunity to have those dialogues and get the full community's input and um, all districted council members to have input and, and those types of concerns. Because sometimes it comes to us, we've had this the last few cycles with Measure J budgets, and we don't, we haven't heard of those projects before. I'm actually not familiar with some of them on this list, even though, so I, I don't think all of them were deferred. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm just trying. So I think maybe a joint meeting would be great and a broader conversation about what's the process for Measure J projects. Council Member Kors. Um, I think you covered it, so thank you. But I agree on the joint meeting. I think when we've done that, it's really helpful. Um, and as far as met, you know, capital improvements, I think when we do our goal setting, that's an opportunity for us to discuss that as a council as well. Thank you. Council Member Woods. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I agree that um, a joint meeting might be good, and I agree that a uh, survey may be good. I would ask that that survey also include streets and other things and not just special interest groups that have a very focused interest. But it's much broader than that. I know you wanted to focus that survey, but you know, there's a lot of other things people are interested in having happen. There's people who want to change the structure of downtown, the urban form of downtown. You know, they need an opportunity that's outside the library and some of the, the standard stuff that you talked about. Marcus, you know, I, I believe, and help me if I'm understanding, we get gas tax money, which I don't think you've come to yet, and the Measure J money is filling in where gas tax doesn't allow us to maybe complete our streets in, in a timely manner, the resurfacing of our streets. Is that correct? Well, the gas tax, uh, right, it's limited to street repairs and street maintenance. It, and I, I didn't highlight it. Um, it's in the staff report. We we receive a, a nominal amount. It's $1.2 in in the traditional old gas tax. And then you have the new gas tax, which has to go specifically to street projects. Uh, um, you, you did approve uh, the funding out of the SB1 new gas tax, which is allocated uh, to those two new signals that we've talked about, as well as um, uh, another signal project. So uh, Measure J doesn't really fill in because gas tax really is, is a limited amount of money, and we use it for traditionally slurry seal overlays and some signal projects. And where does our money come from traffic money? What, what category is that in? I wasn't able to figure that out. We funded the traffic calming program in the gas tax fund. We can also fund it in the local measure A program. Uh, and so we've, that's where we've allocated those funds. Okay, you know, there is, um, we've had a lot of concern, and I know Council Member Middleton has been working on speeds within the city, but the geometrics of our streets allow for very high speeds and unsafe speeds. And we're having a lot of requests for traffic calming, and some of those requests have been in the making for years. And it, it requires maybe a redo of the street, not just putting in, you know, plastic or rubberized speed humps. And I'd like to make sure that we have money allocated for that in this budget, because it is a concern that seems to be across Palm Springs as a whole. And I don't know if that's Measure J, if that's Measure A, if it's gas tax, if it's kind of combining a bunch of them into a stew. Um, but just so that we have, because there's a lot of limitation has been, I think we only had $250,000 in that fund, which seems to be insufficient. And the good news is, is that you have sufficient Measure J revenues to program for uh, 
whatever is the pleasure of the council. So you could give direction that we identify 500,000 or a million dollars for various traffic calming or traffic improvements related to traffic calming out of the Measure J. Uh, I would caution using Measure A or gas tax. We really utilize those funds for the local match to all of the federally funded transportation projects. Um, and so I would look to the Measure J fund to start programming that money towards those those types of traffic projects that you're you're identifying. Great, thank you, thank you, Mayor. So Other I, questions on that? Go ahead, Marcus. Moving on to uh, the proposed budget for Measure J for uh, next fiscal year. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we're estimating 16 and a half million in revenue next year, plus the 7.2 million that will roll over. So you have a significant amount of money to program in the next fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> we have the five year CIP that's included uh, with this staff report. Um, Mayor, we did show, uh, a, you know, in the five year CIP, um, uh, putting money away towards the library renovation. And, and the reason we identified the library was simply because it had already been identified and some funds had been programmed for it. But you don't need to make that decision now because those are in the outer years of the five-year CIP. The focus is really just in the first year for fiscal year 21-22. So at the Measure J Commission meeting, they reviewed and suggested the following appropriations for the next fiscal year. Street repairs, uh, again, three million has been the traditional amount. You certainly can raise that to six or 10 million or whatever's the pleasure of the council. You will have sufficient funds to do that. Uh, I will strongly urge we continue to have a, 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 a consistent line item in the Measure J fund for downtown maintenance in particular because of the completed downtown park and the pol police substation. As you construct new facility projects like this, it's important that the funding for that ongoing maintenance is, is secure. Otherwise, you know what might happen with the maintenance of those facilities. Uh, the commission uh, is identifying again their million dollar uh, line item for community projects. Uh, emergency generators was a project that was canceled and is important to us and, and we would uh, urge you recommend that uh, project in the next fiscal year, as well as the recreational field LED lighting upgrade. That's gonna be a significant project over a couple of years and that uh, has a funding allocated of 600,000. Uh, the Arnico Track Sewer, this is a, a, a new project um, that Council Member Garner and I have talked about as it's in her district, and I, I, I highlighted it in the staff report, so I'll touch it on it here. Um, that, that area of the city used to be in a uh, low to moderate income census tract area, so it was eligible for CDBG funding. And over several years in the, um, in the past, uh, the city funded sewer extensions to that tract because it was uh, on septic. Uh, it was a tract that was uh, developed when that was unincorporated Riverside County, and then we later annexed it. There's one last remaining uh, segment of that tract that we were unable to fund the sewer extension after the 2010 census when that area was no longer in an eligible census tract. So. Um, uh, Measure J is an appropriate source of funds uh, for that improvement. Uh, we have to be careful, and the reason it's not in the wastewater fund is because that's an enterprise fund, and there needs to be a mechanism for funding those types of sewer extensions, much in the way as we had the discussion earlier tonight of a sewer connection fee to pay that cost. So uh, the, the appropriate mechanism here is to either fund it out of the general fund or as we're recommending in the Measure J fund. Uh, some other appropriations, uh, the fire department has a need for a new fire training tower facility. <clears throat> and uh, again, uh, we are moving through all of the parks in renovating and constructing new restrooms. Um, and I will advocate 
and 100,000 is not nearly enough, but I would really advocate in the five-year CIP plugging money away to get that roundabout completed. <clears throat> and then um, this was another project that was canceled that is necessary. It's, it's, it's not sexy, but it's important for us to have uh, the, the water treatment facilities for our hot and cold water uh, HVAC systems um, maintained. So with those items, um, you still have 13 and a half million available for additional projects and programs. So y y the point tonight is that even if, you, uh, if, if these are approved, when you have your joint meeting, you still have sufficient funds available to program for a whole host and variety of projects. I mean, with 13 and a half million, you could plug that away and, and, and tackle most of the cost for redoing Fire Station 1 as an example. So there, there's, there's still discretion in the Measure J budget for those kinds of uh, co considerations for council priorities. So I'll pause there because that's the end of the Measure J fund. Councilmember Garner. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of the sewer connections, Marcus, um, we talked a little bit about the connection fees. So because what you have in, this set, in the agenda is extending the sewer to the houses that are not currently on it, but then we also have a section that does have underlying sewer, but it hasn't been connected, right? So what would be those additional, what would be that additional cost to get them connected? It, it would probably, yeah, um, thank you for that reminder. So we would want to probably program another few hundred thousand dollars because you're right, uh, in the last phase we did, we didn't actually do the on-site connections uh, or pay the sewer connection fee. You certainly could add that so we can make sure that all of the houses in that tract are actually connected and then pay on their behalf the sewer connection fee. Um, and the beauty of it is, is you just dropped that fee to $1,000 from $3,000. So uh, we can make that adjustment if that's the discretion, uh, uh, the choice of the council. Thank you. You know, and I do want to just raise that as, you know, we did talk about all of these other sewer areas that are on subject and, um, you know, this one is a, is far smaller than any of those other areas, you know, as Marcus had described. Um, and I get a lot of feedback from people about it because it is this, this um, little row of houses in this track that already is all connected on sewer and they deal with a lot of, of, of issues. So um, I would really love council support in us being able to, to finish this last little piece, especially since it, it looks like it'll be even under a million dollars, which isn't much compared to all of those other costs we saw for the much larger sewer projects. Are there comments? Councilman Wood. Um, this is where I would like to add in um, some better, more money for uh, traffic calming. Uh, and or geometric road changes um, for speed. Um, and I also want to talk a little about the sewer funding that's brought up the, the Arminica track. Um, I believe there are other tracks without sewer that are also that are actually low income. They haven't been kicked out of low income. So how do we justify, you know, I just want to know what those all are. You know, how do we justify giving it to somebody who's no longer in a low income area, free sewer, and not somebody who's in a low income area not giving them free sewer. So I just, I think I want to be very careful. I want to be very careful in making a recommendation. I think, you know, putting sewer in is a great thing, but careful that we're not favoring a district, one district over another district when it's no longer low income. And I have some low income areas in my district that actually don't have sewer as well. Okay. Uh, can I just quickly, oops. I'm sorry, go ahead, council member. No, in, in terms of, I think, you know, that's fair to want to make sure that we're doing this in an equitable way. Um, I will say in terms of this uh, tract, what we're seeing in terms of CDBG funds and who's considered um, eligible and who's not, it, it, it hasn't been the best lately. For instance, Desert Highlands is not <laughs> part of the CDBG area right now, um, but it is more low income than a lot of other areas in our city, yet somehow they're not. CDBG right now. And this is the same with this Arnico area. So the residents that I hear from um, who are on septic, 
Uh, the majority of them are low income, and uh, there are some others who have who bought in in the recent years and um, do have more disposable income. So it, I think it's tough if we only look at CDBG because we've seen that it's it's not the most reliable, um, especially when we see that the area right next to the high school is currently considered CDBG. But I think when you drive through, you see that <laughs> there have been significant changes in that neighborhood. Um, so I don't know if we want to look at the new census information to try to get a better idea since we did a more robust push or or what. But I do I agree that we should be thinking about it equitably and in, in how we're making these changes. This goes to my point. I, I'll if I can really quickly, Mayor Pro Tem, this goes to my point of just a more thorough analysis of the Measure J budget and allocation to make sure that it's we're making comprehensive choices that go into the CIP and also go into the, uh, we had had that document that showed the condition of city buildings. And we had a conversation that many of our community centers are in poor condition. And we had a conversation that like our roads, right? When you um, invest, at one period of time in the degradation of those buildings, it's more cost effective, right, um, to fund it then versus at the very end when it needs, you know, everything. So I'm not comfortable with this Measure J budget personally. Um, I do have concerns that it's, we don't want it to be haphazard or just, you know, if certain issues are raised over others, we want it to be really comprehensive to council and the commission's priorities. So I know we could probably talk about this all night because Marcus, I'm looking for where each of these projects is described in the staff report for the public. Um, and I don't see it. Um, so if there, I know we're considering this again, um, if we can have a more targeted discussion about just measure J projects. I that would be helpful for me, and then we can address everyone's concerns and not dwell on this. But I'll go to Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, you know, when it comes to the Measure J uh, funds, uh, I'm thrilled to see these kinds of numbers. Uh, I don't think we, uh, as I understand it, have to make the commitments uh, tonight or even by June 30 as to how we are going to spend all of uh, Measure J. Uh, uh, Marcus talked about holding a joint meeting perhaps in September. So uh, I, I would like to urge us to uh, uh, put our ideas together, but uh, not try to move too quickly when it comes to finalizing what the Measure J uh, budget is going to be until after we have an opportunity to sit down with Measure uh, J Commission, as well as just get through the general fund budget uh, and have an opportunity to concentrate a little more energy uh, on these specific projects. Thank you. Well said. Okay, thank you. We, and that's act, absolutely correct. The money's just uh, appropriated, and then you can make a decision later on how you actually allocate those those funds. <clears throat> uh, moving on, uh, I'm going to highlight the airport. Uh, we we often don't talk about the airport fund. Uh, there's four different uh, enterprise funds that support the airport. Um, just briefly, Fund 405 is what we call the CFC fund, or it's customer facility charges. These are charges on car rental fees that can only go to financing car rental capital projects. <clears throat> um, we are carrying a $25 million fund balance, and that's on, par on purpose because we're working towards delivering uh, a huge project at the airport in the future. Um, which is estimated at $200 million. It's a consolidated airport car rental facility or a CONRAC. Uh, in the near future, you will um, receive a presentation of adjusting that CFC charge to be consistent with many other airports. Currently, uh, at our airport, the, the fee that's charged on car rental transactions is a $10 fixed fee. Many other airports that have had to do these expensive CONRAC projects have had to increase that fee 
Uh, what's allowed by law, I believe the maximum is $9 per day for a five-day maximum or a $45 per transaction fee. That will be what is going to be recommended to you because even with that charge, we will have insufficient revenues to be able to finance uh, what we need to, to finance in terms of the ultimate car rental facility to be built at the airport that was identified in the airport's master plan. Um, the airport PFC fund 410, that's another enterprise fund that's related to passenger facility charges. These are uh, fees levied on airline tickets to fund airport capital projects. In 2019, you actually issued revenue bonds against this uh, source of revenue to support the, the project that's underway, the ticket wing expansion project. So this fund is solely for uh, paying for the debt service of $3 million a year, uh, as well as other, um, to the extent we have revenue to support additional projects at the airport. And we're estimating uh, about $4.3 million uh, revenue, uh, and it's totally dependent on the number of passengers that fly through the airport. Uh, the operations fund 415 is basically the airport's general fund. <clears throat> its revenue is based entirely on airport uh, operations, airline fees, rental payments through concessions, food and beverage sales. As you can imagine, uh, the pandemic um, really had an impact on airports all over the country. Uh, to, to show that, in 1819, we had over 2.5 million passengers fly through the airport with revenue at just about $25 million. Uh, and as I mentioned, the COVID pandemic hit. And so this uh, table that's in the staff report shows the uh, true impacts of the pandemic. There's our 2.5 million in passengers. And last fiscal year, or I'm sorry, in 1920, we had 1.8 million. And you can see right there, uh, the shutdown that was effective in late March really had an impact in April, May, and June, and later through uh, the summer. Uh, which is what sh um, really dropped the passengers. I do, I do want to note that in this current fiscal year, March and April and projecting May, uh, we're seeing passengers um, approaching 70% of 1819 numbers and are um, tracking higher than some of the other airports. So that's, that's a good sign. But we're still tracking at even lower than last fiscal year um, in terms of total passengers. Uh, and then for the next fiscal year, we're conservatively estimating to be on track for uh, passengers that fl flew through the airport in fiscal year 1920. And that is how we estimate how we're going to have revenue for the next fiscal year. And so that revenue is shown here in, this, in that table. Um, uh, this current fiscal year, we had a budgeted revenue of $14.5 million. Now remember, uh, in 1819, we had $25 million in revenue. So you can see the impact of the pandemic on airports. We're projecting $22.5 million, which is getting close to where we were in, in the fiscal year 1819. Uh, the budget for the Airport Operations Fund is shown here. Um, so this current fiscal year, we had a budget of $25 million and a deficit of $10.9 million. <clears throat> For next fiscal year, we have a budget of $28.6 million, and we're projecting a deficit of $6 million. Uh, that might cause you concern, but uh, Congress, thankfully, knew that airports would be impacted due to the pandemic and have issued five different sources of stimulus funding that was specific to airports like Palm Springs Airport. Um, we, in fact, have over $27 million in stimulus funds that are available specifically to offset the operational deficits caused by the pandemic, and it's through this stimulus funding that we've been able to stabilize the airport operations fund. And so they basically bill against that stimulus funding, and that's how we're resolving the deficit that's projected for this current fiscal year as well as next fiscal year. Um, and so even then, uh, through these last two fiscal years, you, the airport still has $14 million, uh, in stimulus funds to help stabilize this fund uh, moving forward after the next fiscal year. Uh, I'll pause there in case there's questions on the airport fund.
Marcus, if I can, we'll hold all questions for the next remaining funds to the end. I think it'll be more, um, it'll be quicker that way, okay. more efficient. We're, we're nearing the end. <laughs> um, so just briefly, the wastewater fund, you know, I presented in on April 22nd the financial analysis of the fund. Uh, we have strategically developed a healthy fund balance to fund the five-year CIP you approved for the wastewater. Um, I just want to point out, as I did then, that our monthly sewer fees are the lowest in the region at $20 a month. And that revenue was accumulating because we have a $75 million five-year CIP that you recently approved. Next fiscal year, we have $11.8 million in revenue from the wastewater fund with operational expenditures of $7.5 million. And we're projecting $12 million in expenditures for capital projects, which shows you that we're going to have a deficit. But again, that deficit is on purpose, and we're using the fund balance to pay for those capital projects. And the last fund I'll touch on is the Gulf Fund. <clears throat> That's a separate fund we established to uh, fund the city's municipal golf course. It's a business enterprise, and it counts for all golf revenues and expenditures separate from the general fund. Uh, as you might know, the new resort course was constructed in the 1990s, and at that time, renovations were made to the Legends course, which were financed with bonds that were issued. Um, those bonds were refinanced in 2017. The debt balance on that, pr the principal on that uh, is $4.4 million, but there's also accrued interest owed uh, through the expiration of that debt service in six years. So there's annual debt payments of approximately $840,000 annually for the next six years when that debt will be retired. So if people don't know, these are the city's golf courses. This is the resort course, which is within the um, Tockwitz Creek. Um, and then the Legends course, which is further east. <clears throat> and so in the staff report, we provided um, a six-year uh, status report of the profit and loss of this business enterprise. Uh, in 1617, there was an operational deficit of 315000 we also transferred 1.7 million from the general fund to help stabilize the fund. Unfortunately, we didn't do a good job because um, there was an accrued fund deficit of 5.6 million, uh, and that was the reason for some of these healthy infusion of uh, transfers from the general fund in the next two fiscal years. In those next two fiscal years, however, actually the golf was doing great and it had an operational surplus. But we did infuse the fund with $5 million to, to get rid of that fund deficit um, as, as you're not supposed to carry a, a deficit in those types of enterprise funds. Uh, unfortunately, the, pa the pandemic hit uh, and we had flooding. And so those affected the golf course operations. And we had a $800,000 deficit in 1920. Uh, we infused the fund, a uh, golf fund, with um, 1.8 million from the general fund, uh, and that helped us stabilize that fund. Um, this current fiscal year, we had projected a two and a half million dollar deficit due to the ongoing impacts of the pandemic. Uh, I did just get information today from Century Golf. Um, they're actually projecting a much better picture for this fiscal year. Uh, they're projecting revenues instead of 2.2 million closer to 3.4 million, and they're projecting expenditures closer to 4.1 million instead of 4.7 million. So that's a swing of 1.8 million. So that deficit is likely to be only 700,000. Uh, and on that basis, um, the city manager and the finance director may evaluate whether we need to do, uh, and I don't think we will, have to transfer in this current fiscal year from the general fund as much as we intended to stabilize the fund, which is good news. Uh, and uh, as far as next fiscal year, we're being overly cautious uh, and identifying a nearly $1 million deficit uh, and a uh, corresponding transfer. Um, and that transfer, again, may or may not have to occur depending on how, uh, how, how well the golf industry recovers uh, after um, the pandemic. Uh, and then uh, that shows that we, have, we are carrying a $1.2 million fund balance. Again, this is just another cushion uh, to be able to ensure that the golf fund is, uh, is, is stable. 
Um, and, and the council could choose to have a zero fund balance. I wouldn't recommend it, but we may be able to reduce what we are transferring out of the general fund into the golf fund. And that completes my report. Um, I'm sure you have lots of questions. We're happy to take those at this time. Thank you. So I'll ask council if you have questions about the airport operations fund, the wastewater treatment fund, and the last one, which was the golf fund. Um, and then if we can um, wait and take public comment and then go back to more general discussion since it is 10 p.m. If that works for council, um, then we'll do public comment and, and come back unless you think we have momentum and you want to finish this item. It's it's up to council. But first, let's do questions about those last three funds. Councilmember Woods. Just a very quick question. So it appears that we're subsidizing the golf fund through the general fund by a tune of about a million dollars a year. Has there been a way to look at making that go? I know we had a pandemic and last year was bad. To actually promoting that golf course and trying to to reduce that deficit, that that gap. Yes, Council Member um, Century Golf. Um, they are our experts at evaluating how to market and make our golf course um, competitive. Uh, every golf course is trying to outdo the other golf course. Um, you know, gol golf courses generally. Uh, haven't really been major money makers for cities that operate municipal golf courses. So we rely on them to evaluate what rates and fees and programs to implement at the golf course to really attract uh, play. Uh, and so it's really a, a matter of how well they do in getting, uh, you know, in increasing play and in rounds of golf and generating those, those fees that support the golf fund. You know, if it weren't, weren't for the debt, it wouldn't really be an issue, and that debt again will be expired in in six years. Um, but that's that debt is really what's the the source of that transfer from the general fund. And is the contractor incentivized to try and make the golf course work more efficiently? I say efficiently, but I mean more profitably. I guess is what I want to say. Is there an incentive in the contract? There is not profit sharing. No, um, but but. It'd be better to, I'm not the expert, so it'd be better to have Century Golf perhaps come in at a later date and, and give a, a summary overview of what it is they do and how they market the, the golf course in, in, in competition with all the other golf courses in our, in our area. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Council Member Woods, for, for the questions. When I'm looking at this uh, for the golf uh, fund, uh, I find myself wanting to spread out uh, over a longer period of time our review of uh, the operational costs in particular. Uh, the effects of the flood were very dramatic in terms of costs. Uh, that's hopefully something that's not going to happen every two or three years. Uh, so I'd encourage us to uh, to step back and and look at this cost uh, over the course of uh, a decade. We've got uh, six years until we can uh, uh, pay off uh, the bonds, uh, and I'd like to see us develop a plan so that uh, we are covering the operational costs uh, through the revenues that are generated. Uh, uh, by the golf course, uh, but uh, th that we examine that in terms of that longer period of time, at least uh, uh, forecasting out until the time that we uh, expire uh, the bonds. Thank you. Other questions or comments? So, Council, would you like to continue on this item, or would you like to pause and take public comment on non-agenda items at this time. I think we should just take comments. Council Member Forbes? Uh, yeah, just a question. I mean, we're not, 
we're not voting on anything tonight on this, right? This is just a presentation ahead of the hearing next meeting, correct? That, that's correct. This was just another opportunity for the public to review and comment on the draft re uh, budget. Uh, this will be repackaged for you on June 10th for your potential adoption. Uh, and hopefully, if there's additional public comments and input, we can receive those at that time. Uh, and then, if necessary, uh, reschedule that uh, for adoption at your second meeting in June, where it will have to be adopted. Okay, thank you. I, I have the questions answered that I need for this evening. I don't know about anybody else. Uh, we're, we're not voting, uh, and I, I could move forward and defer uh, any few more questions on the budget to uh, the June 10 meeting, where hopefully we'll be able to make an uh, adoptive budget. I'm also fine with that. Okay. That works for me. I have a few other points, and but I'll raise those with staff before the June 10th meeting. So city staff, do you need any other direction from us on this item before we move on? No, nope. thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the really comprehensive presentation. Really well done, excellent staff report, and thank you for pausing so that we could grill you at each step. Thank you, Marcus and, and Nancy and everyone who worked on this. The next item is public comment on non-agenda items. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. Although the city council values your comments pursuant to the Brown Act, it generally cannot take any action on items not listed on the agenda. Two, two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. City clerk will be contacting speakers by telephone. City clerk, if you could please begin. Paula, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Paulina, I'm sorry, Angel. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Hostess, and Council. My name is Paulina Angel, and I'm speaking to you to this evening as a Coachella Valley representative of Unity Hope. As California is learning to recover from COVID, Unity Hope delivers free crisis support for Southern California communities impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a crisis counseling assistance and training program funded by FEMA and administered by the California Department of Healthcare Services through our project known as California Hope. We provide two options that our service can be uh, utilized through our warm line that people can call and speak to one of our highly trained counselors, as well as an online chat option, which you can use by your computer or your uh, mobile phone. We have a well diverse group of counselors that are uh, specialized in different communities, such as veterans, Black and African Americans, Asian and Pacific Islanders, Latinx, parents or care caregivers, youth and young adults, as well as LGBTQ. Um, I have sent your city clerk uh, the flyer that, we, that we're spreading out, and we hope that you could share that with your con constituents. And um, you can find more about us at unityhope.org. And you could uh, contact me at uh, paulina at unityhope.org as well. Um, so thank you so much for your time, and I wish everyone on council, as well as the city of Palm Springs, uh, happy uh, mental health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rogda Zachariah, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I want to congratulate you on a wonderful meeting tonight and congratulations on pushing through workforce agreement because I think it's going to be really great for uh, Palm Springs area and I hope our youth and unemployed um, um, Members will take advantage of me perhaps learning a new skill and move forward. And I just want to suggest, let the economics um, take its course and not kind of micromanage uh, 
this project. But that's not why I stayed on, on the phone till 10.15. I am calling regarding um, a subject that's an elephant in the room and what's basically about the Human Rights Commission um, and there's been a lot of news in, in, in the newspaper and I know I'm not the only one um, that were um, talking about that. It's basically would like the suggest to all of you to put this project away. Just put the cork on the bottle and let it go because this will really unify Palm Springs. It will help us all get together and get out of COVID and move to a better place. Because I know probably you don't hear too much about it, but we just don't want this idea of removing statues to to be snuck into one of your meetings and then we wake up the next morning and it's like, whoops, it happened. So if you want to unify Palm Springs and stop the division, let's just move forward and just um, just say this subject is done. We already talked about it in the, in the past. Thank you so much for a wonderful meeting tonight. I learned a lot um, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Davis, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Yes, uh, good evening, Council. My name is Mark Davis, a resident of Palm Springs full time. I wanted to talk about the placement of Maryland. I know this just keeps going on and on, but uh, my point is that this did not need to divide our community. Before the decision was made to close Museum Way, Forever Maryland wasn't even much discussed. However, since that council meeting, over 75 news articles from around the country and the world have been written about this controversy. Some of them pretty scathing about what is happening. None of it had to happen. Whether one liked the statue or not, the park location was a happy compromise, which was made with community participation. With one short discussion, Council completely disregarded and disrespected five years of community participation. And I just want to quote from a May 13 Desert Sun editorial board article, uh, quote, the way the city decided to close part of Museum Way for the Forever Maryland statue left many constituents feeling like the council was hiding behind legalese to avoid a robust public discussion. Even though it happened during a public meeting and after an alleged debate, it was a textbook example of how not to conduct the people's business, unquote. This was the third Desert Sun article, a uh, Desert Sun editorial board article. Um, the first one was about the park being the best location. The second editorial was that the city council made a mistake closing Museum Way. And the third um, editorial was a scathing indictment of the council about how these community decisions are made. I understand that the hope is that this statue will bring a lot of business in by closing off Museum Way. But from the sounds of the budget, it seems business is doing pretty well in Palm Springs, even if that is not sitting in the middle of Museum Way. So you have a whole large number of constituents who just want you to go back to the original plan put Maryland in the park that made everyone happy. It took five years of discussion to get to that point. Mr. Davis? And just go from there and put an end to this. We have much more important things to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Armstrong, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Yes, thank you. Uh, I wanna follow up on what Mark just said. Um, I'm calling in on behalf of over 41,000 people who signed a change.org petition against the Maryland statue and its placement on Museum Way. Given the huge number of people with objections and hundreds who I know have sent letters to the city council, we wonder when the city is going to address these concerns. 
as a city council, it would seem that you have a responsibility to communicate plans that affect your citizens and to respond to your constituents when there are legitimate concerns. And I hope you realize that these aren't idle complaints. These objections have attracted widespread media scrutiny throughout the state and around the country. And you must realize by now, no matter what your original intentions were, that this statue and its location are problematic um, for reasons that have been clearly outlined and stated by many others. So tonight we have a question about the claim that the statue will increase tourism for Palm Springs. Um, I have to ask, where is the data that supports this claim? And because it's not evident, we've taken a deeper look into what drives tourism in Palm Springs, and this has raised new questions about how the city's TOT funds are distributed. Given that the Maryland statue was acquired by PS Resorts, with funds generated primarily from these tax revenues, we have to wonder how these allocation decisions are being made. Is there hard data somewhere that these allocations are based on? Speaking of data, the tourism records for Maryland's visit to Palm Springs back in 2012 through 2014 reveal that the city sales taxes actually declined and hotel occupancy was flat during that period, indicating she had virtually no impact on tourism. So really, I, wanna, I just want to hope that you'll respond to the many, many concerns around the statue that have been expressed by your stakeholders. Perhaps you could place this issue on your next agenda. Um, better yet, could you call a town hall focusing on the subject where there could be an open dialogue instead of this blind sort of format of one-way calls? Um, so I hope, given the sheer number of objections and concerns, there seems to be a mandate that this should be addressed, and we hope you will. Looking forward to hearing your response. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Kitty Mahone, you're live with the Palm yes. Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, good evening, Mayor Holstead and Council members. My name is Kitty May, and I'm a full-time member, uh, resident of the city of Palm Springs. And I'm calling in opposition to the placement of the Forever Maryland statue on Museum Way. It simply does not belong there. In 2012, when Measure J was passed, an oversight commission was formed tasked with monitoring development in and around the desert fashion complex. Priority was to be given to the street and road improvements in the downtown core. And then in 2017, Measure J funded Museum Way was finally opened amidst much fanfare and touting the creation of a clear, unobstructed sight line from Palm Canyon all the way to the museum and Museum Drive. Finally, in 2019, in October, after holding multiple public comment sessions, ground was broken for a new downtown park. Included in the approved design was the placement of Forever Maryland in the park on Bellardo. What happened to the process? It was derailed. And following the November 12, 2020 City Council meeting, all of these previous agreements became null. However, Maryland was granted a prominent spot in the museum, middle of Museum Way. There was no oversight of Measure J. There was no regard for the priority of roadways. The clear sight lines are now gone, and there is no placement in the park. And now, given the absence of process, we're faced with Maryland being forever in the museum, middle of Museum Way. The council has said it's temporary, but given the, high, the history, we can't count on the process. Thank you for considering this, and do consider removing Maryland from Museum Way and placing her in the park where she belongs. Thank you, council members and mayor. Bye. Thank you. Kathy Wormick, you're live with the City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, my name is Kathy Wormick. I'm calling in tonight to thank you for your continued support for our business community's request to place the Forever Maryland statute on Museum Way. I think it's really important to show support for our businesses, our 800 businesses, as they recover from 14 months of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the Maryland statute did show a proven record of being a tourist draw, and it's my hope that you'll also draw tourists and residents into our new park, which is opening in uh, August, 
and also as well to the museum. I did want to express my concern over, uh, as a lifelong supporter of human rights and women's rights, uh, of the issue of misogyny being connected to Maryland. I don't, I don't think this is in any way an issue of misogyny. She was a clever businesswoman, an actor, comedian who had full control of how she. Uh, of how her image was projected, and I think she should be celebrated. Uh, while, while I think there's been legitimate concern over the placement uh, of where in the park or in the street she'd be placed, uh, I was a member of the committee that worked on the park for six years, and I think when we originally placed her, we overlooked the fact that people would spill into the streets um, and, and into non-pedestrian streets with the placement that we suggested. So given the park as it's being designed now, I think this is the, this is a correct placement and that it's temporary. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Michael, and if you could please uh, state your last name when you uh, speak, uh, you'll have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Shall I start now? Uh, yes. Okay, this is Michael Walliger. Thank you all. Good evening. You know, in recent years, Palm Springs has become an international art and design destination. Unfortunately, the giant Maryland sculpture by Seward Johnson makes a mockery of that reputation. And to position it in front of the Palm Springs Art Museum only adds insult to injury. Palm Springs can do better. It does not need sexist, second-rate art to attract visitors. As has been proven by Desert X, Modernism Week, and other first-class cultural events, visitors will take just as many Instagram selfies in front of a quality art piece, such as Chicago's Bean Sculpture by Anish Kapoor, as they will in front of a kitschy, offensive monument to bad taste, such as Maryland. Please reconsider this unfortunate decision, which in the long run will harm rather than help our city. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Zakowski, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I'm calling in as a concerned citizen and the voice of many, many people behind me. Um, I know that the City Council has heard many sides to the story about the placement of the Mar about the Marilyn Monroe statue. Um, I am not calling in to talk about whether we like the statue or whether we don't like the statue, whether the million dollars should have been spent to bring Marilyn back or not. What I'm calling in about is the egregious placement of the statue to block a publicly funded street in front of our class one historic site museum. It is absolutely unfeasible that the city council, the city of Palm Springs would allow this to happen. What I'm calling in to say, and again, the voice of many, many other concerned citizens is, please, let's be fair. Maryland can come to town. Maryland can be there for the people that like her and the people that don't like her. But let's put her back in the park where she was supposed to go in the first place, where it was decided in 2016 that she would go. And please, 
I ask of the city council and the city of Palm Springs that we do not block a publicly funded street and put her in front of our world-class museum that many of us through the years have helped to make the city that Palm Springs is. I, I think it is absolutely um, up to you members of the council to seriously see that both sides can be appeased if you make the right decision. Please put Marilyn back in the park where she belongs and not blocking the public street. I ask this of you. Thank you. Thank you. George Smart, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you very much. My name is George Smart. I'm the executive director and chairman of U.S. Modernist. We are the largest open digital archive for mid-century modern architecture in the world. And I was just in Palm Springs recently. We bring 30 people out every year, spend about $50,000 on the community, and are good tourists. I'm speaking today because the council has the opportunity to uniquely, in these divisive times, to make everyone happy by moving the Maryland statue to where it was originally intended, over by the parking deck on Bellardo. All the tourists will still come. All the economic development will still happen. And all the hotels who are paying for this statue will still be happy about its placement. But in addition, the Palm Springs Art Museum and the view down Museum Way will be protected. If this doesn't make sense, just imagine a giant Bob's Big Boy, 20 feet tall, placed in front of City Hall. Wouldn't make a lot of sense, although everyone would enjoy seeing the Big Boy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Harold Matzner, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Museum Way was opened in November of 2017. Many of us had fought for years to get rid of the disgusting abandoned shopping center that blocked the view of the, the, the museum from Palm Canyon. Museum Way was one of the results of the Measure J election. It was finally possible to stand on Palm Canyon and see the beautiful museum building designed by Stuart Williams. Only, only there was no way to tell what that building was, nor is there to this day. Members of the group that oppose Maryland today objected to the sign that would have brought people to the building from Palm Canyon. Maryland is 437 feet from the museum not the 50 feet suggested by the dishonest fake photos distributed by Maryland opponents. 437 feet is one and a half football fields. From the museum steps, you will not be able to tell whether Maryland is a boy, a girl, or a fish. Maryland is a free attraction that will bring huge numbers of people to Museum Way. <clears throat> from Maryland, many will go to the beautiful new park adjacent to the statue, and from there to the history of suspended time, a sculpture just across from the museum. And from there, many will go up the steps to the museum. I am one of the two largest donors in the history of the museum. And I assure you that <clears throat> Maryland will be a good thing for a museum that needs all the economic help that it can get. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Braun, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. I'm Mike. 
I'm Michael Braun, uh, President of Quick Development in Palm Springs. Uh, cities and business improvement districts worldwide have realized how important art can be to living up public spaces. For both visitors and locals, public art can really create more of a sense of community and place making, changing our experience of the city. It's the restaurants and shops that make Palm Springs special and alive. The Marilyn Monroe statue will only add to that same experience. Cities all over the world are rethinking their downtown districts and city mayors. Number one priority is getting cars off the street. The next challenge is how to get cultural institutions, shopping districts and residents to join forces and become one of the greater goods for the community. The Palm Springs Art Museum should not turn its back on the community and the downtown business district. It should seize the opportunity to tell the 1926 story of Norma Jean Morrison from her poor, humble beginnings, having a mother mentally ill and unable to care for her, that she abandoned Norma Jean. She was placed in multiple foster homes until she was 16 years old. Her tenacity, with no family or support, was so determined to overcome all odds. So much so that this young girl rose to become the international celebrity we know and honor today as Marilyn Monroe. Her statue will bring more than 500,000 people close to the downtown park and the Palm Springs Art Museum. Think new technologies activated through smartphones, recreating Norma Dean Morrison's life via augmented reality, engaging the world and with it showcasing Palm Springs. Thank you. Thank you. rear end. Margo, Leah, you're uh, live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. City Council claims the statue is honoring Marilyn Monroe, but certainly by today's standards, inviting young boys and girls and adults to look up her crotch and at her barely clad buttocks is more than inappropriate. We teach little girls to protect and cover their private parts and boys to respect that. You propose placing a misogynistic statue in a public children's park and exposing the art museum's patrons, which includes tens of thousands of children each year to an exposed rear end. While the statue may be sexy to many men and women, is this the public art we want for our girls and boys and for our city? Marilyn committed suicide at the age of 36. She was a tormented sex symbol. Would she want masses of tourists making jokes about her crotch and her bottom? Would anyone want that? Would you want a statue like that of your mother or daughter? Marilyn, is dead and she can't fight for her dignity. Marilyn deserves better, our girls, boys, and women deserve better, and Palm Springs deserves better. Please reconsider. We are a city of artists and great designers. We can do so much better than erecting this sexist schlock in our public spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Trina Turk, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Mayor and City Council, uh, regarding business impacts of Maryland, um, we opened Trina Turk on Palm Canyon Drive way back in 2002, so I know a bit about brick-and-mortar retail in Palm Springs. We've been fortunate to ride the wave of the Palm Springs Renaissance, which has generally provided an upward trajectory in our sales over the years. This upward trajectory continued after Marilyn left town in 2014, not only for our sales, but for the dollar amounts of the grants given to PS Resorts by the city. The false narrative that the statue drives revenue has yet to be supported by any data from the city or PS Resorts. I agree that it drives traffic, but traffic and Instagram posts do not pay the bills. What does pay the bills is Modernism Week and architectural and cultural tourism. Modernism has consistently been our best weeks 
of sales revenue of the year for many years. Dedicated residents and business owners have fought to preserve the mid-century architecture that defines our city and has become our brand. The Architecture and Modernism Week bring in tourists from around the world, the kind of tourists who actually support our local economy with a weekend hotel stay, multiple meals in restaurants, and shopping in shops all over town. Not those who snap a selfie, get a nice coffee, and then leave. That's why the Museum Way placement of Maryland is so absurd. Why would you place it in front of an iconic mid-century building when architecture is a driver of tourism? If you truly believe the statue is so compelling and amazing that it's gonna reverse all of the ills of the pandemic, then it should be able to do the same from the park location, the end of Andreas Road, which is visible from both Palm Canyon and Indian Canyon drives, or how about the empty lot next to Le Valeris? We're trying to suggest solutions here. City Council, what are your solutions to the controversy? This thing does not have to go on Museum Way. Please cancel the contract and figure out another location. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Horowitz, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Uh, okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Horowitz. I bought a house in Palm Springs about 10 years ago with the intention of eventually moving here full time. I was drawn to Palm Springs like so many people by the architecture. Uh, also, I'm an artist and the Palm Springs Art Museum was a big draw for me. I think it's a tremendous asset for the city. So when I learned that the Marilyn Monroe statue was going to be placed in the middle of the street in front of the museum, I was appalled. This is just so wrong in so many ways. It disrespects the museum, it disrespects architecture, it disrespects art, it disrespects women, it disrespects Meryl Monroe, and it disrespects the voters who were told that they were getting a clear, unobstructed thoroughfare to the museum with a new plan for downtown. Um, so a new line from the supporters of this statue seems to be that the sculpture is not art, but just an attraction, which somehow makes it immune to criticism I think it is art. It's just really, really bad art. Art that whitewashes the history of women being objectified, degraded, and abused by the Hollywood film industry. I, I think it needs to be noted that the statue takes the photos that it's based on one step further in its lewdness, fully exposing Marilyn's panties. Photos don't even do this. This is no way to honor Marilyn Monroe. And it's no way to represent the city of Palm Springs. I recognize that some people feel differently about this sculpture than I do. And I also recognize that it's been already been purchased using taxpayer funds, it should be noted. But it's three years stay has already been approved. So there's really um, a, a very easy solution to stop the uproar that the plans for the statue have generated. Just move the statue to a suitable location, like the spot that was originally designated for it. That's all that most of the people in opposition to the sculpture are asking for. It's that simple. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bruce Hoban, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Good evening, Council and citizens who are closing in. I am in support of the statue going in on Museum Way. I started first coming to Palm Springs in 1959 when I was four years old. I grew up in Hollywood from a showbiz family and have learned about the iconic parts of Palm Springs over the years. I've returned for many decades. Palm Springs is an iconic place. Palm Springs deserves iconic pieces. Our Modernism Week is iconic. Maryland is iconic. Maryland was an iconic businesswoman. She owned her own business studio and, um, you know, obviously became a very famous iconic actress. Um, I would also like to say that I am seriously kind of a bet by seeing the degradation of our city uh, in worldwide press. It was very disturbing this morning 
to see um, an ad that would place in the desert sun. I don't like using the word. I don't like pointing out anybody as being this personal word. But I'll just tell you that uh, saying anything about anybody that ends, starts, is three letters, starts with an A, ends with an S, um, is really disturbing. And that's how low things have gotten. So I wish to, uh, you know, support Maryland and uh, right time, right place, and right statue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeffrey Bernstein, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Mayor Holstage, Mayor Potter Middleton, Council Members Garner, Coors, and Woods, and City Manager Clifton. My name is Jeffrey Bernstein, owner of Destination PSP, a local small business, and a Measure J Oversight Commissioner. After speaking with many of our local small business owners, I want to reiterate our support for the decision of the Palm Springs City Council to offer a lease for the placement of the Forever Maryland statue. There is no doubt that the placement of the statue in the heart of downtown will help our local businesses. There are over 500 businesses located in the core of Palm Springs, mostly small businesses owned by local residents. While we have had a promising couple of months, the past year has been very tough for business owners. It may take some time for our conference and convention business to return to normal. We are in need of something to attract visitors to downtown throughout the week. While it is possible to view the museum currently from Palm Canyon Drive, the architecture will not be lost by a 25-foot statue placed four to 500 feet away. At a time when our city's local businesses have also suffered financially, the placement of a free, safe attraction in the heart of downtown will result in increased revenue to the city and thereby the community. It is important that this statue is being funded privately and there is no cost to the city, only a gain. We also know that for many, the Forever or Maryland statue provides joy when we've all had a difficult time. It's perhaps the only safe, socially distanced event we'll have for some time. While I speak for many business owners, we are also local residents. We support the arts and modernism we have had and continue to work hand in hand with the Art Museum, the Public Arts Commission, Modernism Week, the Palm Springs Modern Committee, the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation, and the Palm Springs Historical Society since their inception. We'd like that this is a temporary three-year arrangement. Let's see how it goes. If it does not work or negatively affects our city, then the council should revisit the city, the issue. We commend the city council for their efforts to consider all sides of the argument and trust that they will stand by their decision. Thank you. Thank you. Tamara Stevens, you're live at the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Tamara Stevens, and I am speaking this evening on behalf of Joel Douglas, who dictated the following message to me yesterday. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Joel Douglas. I was a resident of Palm Springs for 15 years until my wife passed. I now reside in Indian Wells. My father, Kirk Douglas, had been a resident of Palm Springs for some 45 years before he passed. The statue of Marilyn Monroe is of particular interest to me because it was created by my first cousin, Seward Johnson. When the statue was here in 2012, the financial success from a tourism point of view was self-evident. Bringing the Forever Maryland statue back to Palm Springs will create a boost for the tourism industry again. The group that is protesting the placement of Maryland is being led by an ex-director of the Palm Springs Art Museum, in parentheses, which has been in the red for quite some time, end of parentheses. I dare say that Seward Johnson's Providence can not only compete, but outshine anyone in the Palm Springs Art Museum. It is disheartening that this group is making overall statements of the piece calling it sexist and monogamous. I had spoken to Seward when he was creating the piece and he was excited to show the joy and freedom of women. 
We cannot be responsible for others' minds when they interpret the piece another way. I am very grateful that PS Resorts has seen this through. I'm sure if you ask the shop owners who were around in 2012, they will agree bringing the Forever Maryland statue back to Palm Springs will create another boost for tourism. Finally, I would like to bring your attention to the fact that the city of Palm Springs owes a debt of gratitude to that golden area of Hollywood. These people not only dedicated their time and money, they put Palm Springs on the international map. Ms. Stevens? I can't... Yes. Your time has elapsed. Thank you. Thank you. Gabe Toronto, you're live with the Palm Spring, Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Mayor Potent, and Council members. Uh, my name is Gabe Toronto, General Manager of Lulu California Bistro, and um, I'm here this evening to speak in support of the return of the Forever Maryland sculpture and its intended location on Museum Way. Uh, this is an attraction which will bring more visitors and locals to downtown Palm Springs as it did during its first basement back in 2012. You now, and having it placed on the way allows for the easy access and viewing as at the previous site at Tacos of Palm Canyon, where really now Starbucks, Kimpton, and El Corso is. Uh, much like the uh, former Palm Springs Follies and the current Desert X, this unique, one-of-a-kind Forever Maryland has the ability to attract more visitors and publicity to downtown. You know, as we all, all emerge out of this pandemic, retailers and restaurants could use the boost from Forever Maryland to bring more excuse me, shoppers to our stores and diners to our restaurant. The Museum Way location is obviously centrally located and is within walking distance to most most downtown shops, restaurants, and there's nearly 1,200-ish underground parking spaces nearby. I ask that the council please consider to keep moving this project forward and continue to support the Museum Way site. You know, every day that Maryland is delayed is a lost day of incremental sales for downtown Palm Springs businesses and a lost day of positive press. The return of a proven, and let me repeat this, the return of a proven traffic and publicity builder is a rare opportunity. I ask, again, please don't let this one slip away from us. Thank you. Thank you. Aftab Dada, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, City Council. Aftab Dada, President of Palm Springs Pro. All I can do is that it. No. Nope. Can you hear me now? Uh, let's try it again. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Aftab Dada, resident of Palm Springs for over three decades. All I can share with you is there is a small minority of residents that have divided the small community that have been so cohesive in promoting our destination for years and years. Some of these members group are not even residents of Palm Springs. Maryland has been a proven attraction. The site we selected to install her is over 437 linear feet from the entrance of the museum. The museum folks and this committee are claiming that children going in and out of the museum will be able to undergarments of Forever Maryland. Let me assure you, neither with the naked eye you'll be able to see any of her undergarments. You will need a pair of binoculars focused in order for her to see it. All I can share with you is 
Due to the pandemic, we have over 500 businesses that have suffered for the last 14, 15 months. The statue is going to be there for only three years. We have committed to do a full independent study. Guess what? This group that is opposing it has already determined that this study will be flawed. I applaud you and I support you for supporting this location. Palm Springs Resort is committed and moving forward in bringing this installation back to Palm Springs before the end of summer. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment, and I'll note that uh, Joelle Harmontree uh, withdrew her comment. Uh, Nona Watson uh, was not answering, uh, but she is out of state, and um, we don't want to continue calling her. Uh, Stephen Moses withdrew. Uh, Julie Montante did not answer. Uh, Joy Brown Meredith uh, did not answer, and Lee Morcus uh, did not answer. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk, and thank you to everyone for calling in and sharing those comments with us tonight, and thank you for participating even though it's late. Uh, we have a lot of business to do today, especially with the budget. Um, so the next item is item 5A, consideration of a, of a proposal to schedule a return of the Palm Springs Village Fest event on July 1st, 2021. Can we have a staff report, please? All right. Um, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the council. The item before you for review and consideration is a proposal to schedule the return of the Palm Springs Village Fest. On April 27th, the Village Fest board held a meeting to discuss the reopening, and the board voted 5-0 to zero to recommend the council to council that Phase 1 reopening be scheduled for July 1st, 2021. With Governor Newsom's announcing his intention to fully reopen the state, for the June 15th, we wanted to bring forward our proposal and uh, present it to you for review. Before we do that, though, I do want to highlight that we will be uh, preparing a dry run or a mock like mini village fest on June 15th on Takwitz between Palm Canyon and Indian Canyon. And while it does not fall in the footprint that is gonna be discussed tonight, um, it will allow us to fine tune some small details while celebrating the June 15th reopening of the state. Um, with that, I'm gonna invite um, our events manager, Jasmine Waits, to give you the details of what phase one reopening will look like. And then she will also tell you about phase two and then she'll be able to answer any questions or comments or concerns that you may have. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'd like to screen share if that's possible. Um, this is also the layout that is available in your um, um, staff report. My apologies, let me see if I could pull that up real quick. Um, so just to talk through it as I'm trying to um, pull up the layout, um, the original space of Village Fest ran from Amato Road to, Ta or to Baristo Road, and the Village Fest board decided that they wanted to um, bring the footprint down um, a little bit so they had um, the ability to manage it a little better. Uh, so they're proposing, I apologize, my um, Screen share is not working on my end, um, but you do have the layout that's available in your um, staff report. Um, so the layout that they are proposing in phase one approach runs from Palm Canyon Drive on a motto, from a motto road to Talkwitz Canyon Road. Um, an addition that they have added this year or, or for the phase one is to be, is to include Museum Way from Bellardo Road to Palm Canyon. Uh, where they do plan on placing vendors in that space. 
Uh, an additional closure that they are requesting is Bellardo Road from Andreas Road to Tocquitz Canyon. Um, and that, that closure will not include vendors, but is more of a pedestrian safety measure. Uh, because Maryland is scheduled to um, be installed um, along Museum Way, the board felt that it was going to be a very large attraction to attract foot traffic down Museum Way, which would be beneficial to both the vendors that will be located on Museum Way in addition to the merchants that are located um, on Museum Way. Uh, the vendors will be placed only along the north side of the street as to not impact the merchants that are located on Museum Way. Uh, the north side does not currently have any merchants. Um, it is uh, solely parking spaces along that way. Uh, so the board voted um, for this closure to be part of the phase one approach for reopening Village Fest. Um, I would really like to highlight that Talkwitz Canyon uh, traffic running east and west is to remain open, which will allow for um, the traffic to make its way around and still impact all of the merchants that are uh, south of Talkwitz Canyon along Palm Canyon Drive. Um, that was a, a consideration that the board uh, wanted to make sure was highlighted so that um, the merchants uh, north or south of uh, Talkwoods Canyon uh, continued to receive um, a great deal of uh, traffic flow. Um, I'm happy to move into phase two, or if council has any questions on phase one, I'm happy to answer questions on phase one. Can you go ahead with phase two and then we'll ask all our questions at the end. Thank you. Will do. So phase two um, is um, inclusive of phase one. So it's in addition to phase one, the closure would run from Palm Canyon Drive, um, on Palm Canyon Drive, from Talkwitz Canyon to Barista Road, which is the original footprint of Village Fest. Um, we would close Talkwitz Canyon down, which is also part of the original footprint of Village Fest. And uh, that would run from the Rowan Hotel to Indian Canyon with vendors located um, between Palm Canyon Drive and Indian Canyon. Um, the board had a great deal of discussion regarding phase two um, and the implementation of phase two and what that would look like with all of the parklets that are currently um, in the space of phase two. Uh, the board ultimately decided that um, in conjunction with the special events team, they felt it that they could comfortably place vendors um, amongst the parklets that are currently out there uh, and uh, just work in great detail with the special events team to ensure that all of the safety measures um, are in place uh, throughout the phase two of Village Fest. So that covers both phase one and phase two layouts. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, in regards to um, the Village Fest Phase 1 and Phase 2. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I see Councilmember Woods and then Councilmember Ford. Hi, Jasmine. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm very confused in looking at the map on where Phase 2 is. I, mean, I, I have no references on the map, and maybe you can, on the one that's in the staff report, um, page uh, 5A-10. Absolutely. And so I, that, the, the blue at the very top of the layout is Talkwitz Canyon. So, so we typically put vendors um, along Talkwitz Canyon uh, from Indian Canyon to Palm Canyon, and then we leave uh, the opening near the Rowan Ballet open uh, for emergency access. Uh, and then it runs Palm Canyon uh, down to Baristo Road. And the red space that is on the layout is uh, Arenas Road on the west side. Currently, the, the east side is closed for parklets for um, two separate restaurants. We do not place vendors along that area, but it is closed um, for safety precautions. So is adding Takwitz a new thing? We've, have we done that in the past? Yes, 
uh, Talkwitz Canyon is typically closed for Village Fest. I see. Okay, oh, it's closed, but we don't have necessarily have vendors on it. Yes, we have had vendors there. We, we do have, have vendors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Kors. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have questions about the layouts and really appreciate your work and the Village Fest board's work. We did get a lot of public comment with different ideas and um, as in several of the tourism meetings, Village Fest came up. Um, I just wanted to raise a couple questions uh, that I was asked and um, maybe get council input. Uh, one was, um, and you know, there are definitely some businesses that are not within the Village Fest um, footprint that feel they lose business um, on Thursday night, including some of the bars outside and restaurants. So one question was if just we could look at potentially having signage to let people know that, like, you know, there are businesses open on Arenas and on Indian um, that might help people who are at Village Fest to know there are other businesses that are open. I think that could be helpful for those businesses as well. Um, some of the businesses um, who are on the section that has been open in the past and will be open um, had asked if they want, if they could have some space in front of their business um, during Village Fest because they're blocked, um, you know, by the uh, others. Um, and, you know, if they could get that at no cost, given restaurants have gotten parklets at no cost for the last year, which I thought was a reasonable request um, as well. So just two things that uh, came up that I, I wanted to raise. Just, so to address the additional yeah. signage, um, that's absolutely doable. That's, um, um, I would be happy to address that with the Village Fest board at their next meeting to see if we can come up with a plan uh, to implement how to reach out to those potential merchants who would like some additional signage uh -huh. and uh, create a cohesive uh, uh, marketing plan that maybe uh, the Village Fest staff um, can put out on a Thursday night as we're doing part of the setup. Great, so that's you. absolutely doable. Uh, currently, merchants are allowed to participate with Village Fest. Our current rules and regulations do have a limit on how many uh, downtown and uptown merchants can participate, and they receive the space at a half-price discount. Should council decide that they would like to provide further discount, uh, obviously that's um, up to council's discretion, and they can just provide the Village Fest board with that direction, and staff will implement accordingly. Okay, thank you. I mean, from my, my vantage point, I think for our merchants um, to be able to give them that, at least for maybe six months, 12 months, given restaurants have had that, and really our retail hasn't, I think, you know, it's, it's not a great deal of money for us. Um, and I would support sort of waiving the cost for those businesses. And thank you. I appreciate those answers. Thank you, Pro Tem Middleton. Thank you. And Jasmine, Cynthia, thank you for all your work that uh, has gone into this. Do you have an anticipated date at which uh, phase two would uh, go into effect? At this time, the Village Fest board would like to readdress it, um, likely in their August meeting or early September meeting. They, would, they had hoped they could reopen the second phase sometime in October. Um, as that is the uh, start of the Village Fest season, it's when our, our um, seasons change over. It's the first Thursday in October. Um, however, they wanted to kind of assess what is happening in phase one and then also assess what's going to happen long term with the parklet and what, what impact that's going to have, uh, not only on Village Fest, but on, uh, you know, events that take place in downtown during the fall uh, period. So um, it. The, the hope would be October, um, but the board is not set on that date. Um, it's somewhat of a process that they want to evaluate over the next couple months. Okay. We uh, received, and I think it's been made quite public, uh, a letter from a number of individuals in the business community uh, reimagining uh, Village Fest. And uh, I certainly think it's appropriate for us to uh, re-begin uh, on the very sure footing of the kinds of programs that we've done in the past. But could you outline for us uh, what you think would be a responsible process 
for evaluating the many re uh, recommendations for reimagining uh, Village Fest, including whether or not uh, an alternative to uh, Thursday evening is, uh, is most appropriate. Absolutely. So um, from a staff perspective, I believe we need to seek out some additional data. Um, you know, like most big changes, um, obviously Village Fest is a 30-year tradition in Palm Springs and has always been on a Thursday night. And um, as the staff report reflects, it works very closely with the Bureau of Tourism and uh, hoteliers on um, marketing Village Fest as a way to come in a day early, um, stay in our hotels or stay in our Airbnbs, come and enjoy Village Fest the day before you normally would. So um, I believe we would need to uh, seek some, some data on the impact, not only to those uh, hoteliers, um, but also uh, the restaurants that um, could be impacted negatively by a change of date. Um, it, it has, um, a study was conducted recently um, by the International Festival and Events that association that discussed big changes done for events. And um, it stated that there was a five to seven year uh, impact, negative impact to an event to reestablish itself. And the longer the event that that the longer the event took place, the more uh, the longer the time it took to reestablish reestablish itself. So I would really like to evaluate um, merchants, restaurant owners, and um, hoteliers, and as well as try and get some additional input from um, the convention center, Bureau of Tourism, and talk more about what that impact looks long term. Um, before making a major decision about um, uh, making a significant change to Village Fest is changing the date. Um, is it doable? Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure it's doable before July 1st, but um, I love a good challenge, so I could try and make it happen. Um, but I do think that um, a change of date is a very significant change into the way Village Fest um, is marketed and how it originally started as an intent to try and bring people in a day early. So it does kind of change the uh, character of the event. Uh, very good uh, answer. Uh, and uh, what I would ask is just let's take the time and uh, be respectful of both the past and uh, the recommendations that are coming so that uh, we think this through fully before we make uh, any changes. Absolutely. Councilmember Wood. I, I, Jasmine, you know, I, I see the, um, the traffic planning um, and it seems to be very thorough, but I'm wondering if we, if I, maybe you already have done this, but if we don't have temporary wayfinding to get people into the underground garage, um, you, you, you know, and maybe having that in a format that is um, consistent in its look. They could be temporary signs that we put up, A-frame signs, whatever we use. Um, I don't know if that's, if you've given that any thought or where that might stand now. I have not given it any thought. Um, I did see that as a suggestion um, that came uh, from, I believe, the Main Street Board. Uh, so, Yes, it's absolutely doable, um, and I think it is a uh, great suggestion, and I will um, put that on the agenda for the Village Fest Board to discuss at their next meeting and uh, present some proposals for um, a pretty cohesive look so that uh, when we put that type of uh, material out on the street on a, on a Thursday night, uh, it's, it markets well to, to those who are driving and looking for uh, additional parking space. Great, thank you. Jasmine, I have a few questions. It's good to see you. I always see you at community <laughs> events and it's been a while. Thank yeah. you for your amazing work. Um, My pleasure. Special pleasure. events and Village Fest. Um, so one, could you just explain the need for a phased approach? I was sort of confused. Um, with why it's needed. So it sounds a little bit because it's about the parklets and is it about concerns about COVID? I'm a little um, 
concerned isn't the right word, but to think about we wouldn't have a full village fest until October or maybe later with sort of no date set. Um, I know the community has really been asking for this event to come back for a really long time. Um, and so I'm wondering about why we need to have a reduced footprint, especially maybe for so long. So the phased approach was um, first intended for um, COVID. We wanted to, uh, when the board first decided that they wanted to, to bring it in in a phased approach, the idea was they wanted to just start a little bit smaller, um, create an event that felt comfortable for the public, uh, for the vendors, um, and also for the city. Uh, the intent was they didn't want to have to backtrack and have some sort of outbreak that was um, uh, centered around Village Fest. So they thought we'd start small, we'd spread vendors out, um, monitor it, and then open up to uh, the full length of Village Fest. A secondary concern for the board was uh, the parklets and how to manage vendors around the parklets. And since the discussion of parklets has been very active and the time frame in which they may or may not be on the street, the board thought, let's wait and see what happens with the parklets before we make a decision on uh, the second phase of Village Fest. So um, number one, it was uh, COVID related and they just wanted to kind of take a, a small step back into it. And then the secondary uh, was the parklets and the impact to um, the vendors as well as impacts to the merchants and the restaurants and how um, the setup process would take place for the vendors and the teardown process or for the merchants and um, restaurant owners. Thanks. Um, and I want to defer to staff and the board here, which really does this detailed work. Um, so, you know, I just, in thinking through that, it sounds like the outbreak risk is very, very low for outdoor events based on the CDC recommendation. We know a lot more um, now that the state is pretty much opening up completely um, in two weeks almost. Um, you know, I, I just wonder if maybe the, the board and staff can consider um, when a second phase might be able to be implemented without a ton of delay, because I think that's what our residents want. And I think it would also jumpstart our economy and help with tourism. And it seems like from a public health perspective and a legal perspective with the current rules, there isn't a large need to wait. If it's a practical issue about implementation with the parklets, you know, that's a different story. But I do think the community wants to see this come back fully rather than phase. Okay, absolutely. I'm happy to address that uh, with the Village Fest Board at their next meeting. Um, if council could just provide direction um, at the, at when you take a vote as to if we want to approve phase one and phase two, it will allow us just to open up the phase two um, at a sooner date. Do you think a phased approach is needed, like the one that's proposed? I do. Great. Thank you. Council Member Kors? Yeah, no, I um, agree with your comments, Mayor. Um, I appreciate if, you know, staff and the board wants a little time, but I'm almost more concerned we're going to have way more people than we're going to have um, vendors. Uh, and so we may have that opposite effect. Uh, and um, given where we are, assuming things open on the 15th, yeah, I mean, and I'll support just doing both now to give the flexibility for staff to work with the board uh, to move that forward. So I think those are really, really good points, uh, Mayor. I appreciate those. Thanks. I agree. And I'm a little worried, too, that as we're reintroducing this event, even though it is a long-term event, um, if it's unsuccessful because there aren't enough vendors and, you know, there's too many people that, you know, that would be a bad reintroduction to the community, if that makes sense. So I think the um, thinking through, you know, a complete event sooner rather than later would be good for the overall success of the event. And also, um, if I can follow up on that, uh, Jasmine, so how is the board deciding which vendors get to start now versus the ones who have to wait? 
Very good question. Uh, so the Village Press Board met uh, last week to discuss a process for uh, receiving vendors uh, into the phase one and then the phase two portion of Village Press, just so that we could get a head start on uh, ensuring that we had vendors to fill the space. So I'll tell you, I, at this point, we do not foresee there being an issue with filling the spaces with mm -hmm. vendors. Uh, in the current layout, there is uh, a about 78 spaces available, and we have about 90 vendors on the waiting list. And that waiting list was uh, created by vendors who uh, reached out to us about when we were starting and when they can participate. So once we do an outreach to all of our current vendors, uh, which is well over 200 vendors, to let them know that we have a tentative start date of reopening, I think that number will significantly grow and we'll easily be able to fill in both the phase one and phase two uh, portions of, of Village Fest. Uh, the board um, talked about creating some criteria uh, so that the, the 90 or so vendors that we currently have on our waiting list, ha we have the ability to decipher them. Uh, some of that criteria was uh, whether they've had violations in the past, uh, if uh, where they were located, they wanted to start uh, with the Palm Springs area and then work our way out to the Coachella Valley area and then High Desert and then work our way um, through California uh, to uh, accept vendors back. Uh, we, uh, staff is creating a list based on the criteria that the board provided and at their meeting, uh, I believe it's June 8th, they will review that criteria, those vendors, they will review their uh, applications that they, um, uh, their application packets, which includes pictures of their setup, pictures of their product, and they will decide uh, from there the highest quality vendors uh, and a good breakup of those vendors so that we have a, a very nice diverse breakup of vendors on the street. And then staff will uh, engage them to come back to Village Fest, ideally, um, if the council decides uh, for the opening of July 1st. So um, just to follow up, so, uh, and I appreciate all the work they do to have a good mix of different kind of vendors. Um, and it sounded like they were gonna give preference to Palm Springs. Um, Vendors first, so that's really, really good to hear. That's going to be my next question, because uh, I know a lot of our, you know, folks, especially people who, you know, work from home and design things, um, really have had a real challenge during COVID. So I'm really glad they're going to uh, give some preference first local and then to the valley. So that was that was great to hear. So thank you for that. Absolutely. I have one more question, if I can. So I see that there's new safety measures. Um, which generally looks fine to me. Um, again, I think we should come from a public health perspective about what we know now um, versus, you know, what just looks like making it safer without, without actually making it safer. Um, but the only one I had a question about was the removal of the food court tables and chairs. I know we already have some issues with people uh, you know, not having places to eat downtown and eating on park benches. And I know that's a really popular part of Village Fest. And so I'm concerned if there are going to be food vendors where people are going to eat. So um, restaurants are allowed and parklets are allowed. These don't have restaurant workers. So I'm confused why that wouldn't be allowed. So originally when um, the board reviewed all of these guidelines, uh, it, this was a recommendation from the Riverside County Health Department. Um, though there's, a, there's a possibility that those uh, guidelines have changed in the last few weeks, and I'm more than happy to reach out to them uh, to discuss their uh, current recommendations and or how they foresee the recommendations uh, July 1 and whether that would be a major, uh, if that could be a change. Uh, I will tell you that the board was not necessarily in favor of this, but for health standards, because we wanted to ensure that uh, Village Fest maintained a safe event, they were willing to implement that guideline. But it is definitely possible that it has changed over the last few weeks as uh, health department regulations have changed quite frequently. 
Yeah, I know it's hard to plan an event like this when we don't know what it might look like on June 15th or July 1st. So um, that sounds good. So maybe staff will just work with the city attorney's office and the public health department to follow the current protocol as allowed. Absolutely. Council member Wood. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jasmine, I have an organizational question and forgive me for my ignorance on this, but is, is Village Fest completely run by city staff or is there a hired manager? No, Village Fest is administrated uh, completely by city staff. Everything from um, the processing of vendors and permits uh, to the street closures and the maintenance th throughout the event, the safety of the event um, is all done by City of Palm Springs employees. It is. And so like bringing the extra trash cans in and things of that nature, that's all done by city employees? Correct. By our facilities and maintenance department, including the street closure. And, and, and this may be um, a question for someone else, but does Village Fest pay for itself or is it um, kind of a lost leader? In, in the past, Village Fest has been a, a pretty close to cost neutral event. Um, this particular phased approach is going to impact that pretty significantly as uh, the way we generate funds is uh, based on uh, vendor fees and we are going to significantly cut those vendor, vendor fees uh, by uh, just opening a portion of Village Fest. So there likely would have to be some uh, subsidizing by the city for uh, Village Fest, at least in the current year. And then bringing in the picnic tables that the mayor referred to and everything, was that done by city staff or did the restaurant, the food trucks bring those in? So that's a requirement in our current rules and regulations that each uh, food service vendor must bring in their own table and uh, I believe six folding chairs need to be supplied by each vendor. Okay, great. Great. Um, I, I agree with the comments from my fellow council members as well. So thank you. Other questions or comments? So I might ask that we are, I'll just make a motion to authorize the return of the Village Fest event to be scheduled for July 1st contingent on the state's plan for reopening of June 15th. Um, to me, you know, I'm happy to defer to staff and the board about a phased approach. I'm concerned about the success of the event in a phased approach. I'm concerned what I just heard about the a revenue for vendor fees and the loss of revenue for a delayed um, approach. So I would like to just authorize the return, both phase one and phase two now. Um, and then you can have the authorization that you need and work on a plan to fully reopen. So I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Is there further discussion? Mayor, if I could just um, also double check. I know it was mentioned just very early on in the introduction of this item, the idea of having kind of a, a, a mini type event or activity on June 15th to celebrate that kind of lifting of restrictions. Does your motion contemplate approval to proceed with that as well? Yes, I think that's really important. Uh, event and celebration for our residents and businesses who've gone through so much this year. And um, I, I really love that idea and I um, would be happy to include that in my motion. Thank you. Uh, and Mayor, um, up, up to you if you want to include this, but for I know there's a limited number of um, sort of spots for our brick and mortar businesses um, that are within the footprint, but uh, given we've given uh, so much free space to restaurants for this time, I'd like to see us do that for our local merchants for some period moving forward. If you're open to that as a friendly amendment. I'm open to that. I'll accept that friendly amendment. Does that work for Mayor Pro Tem Middleton? Who seconded? It does. Thank you. Any further discussion? Council Member Woods. Uh, what would that period of time be? I mean, you know, we're, we're I just think we need a time on that period of, you know. Well, I suggest. I suggested a year since we've done the parklets for about a year, you know, with no fee. Uh, 
for the restaurants, and we really haven't done that much of anything for our sort of brick and mortar retail. And what happens if every brick and mortar wants to put a booth out there? Well, I think there's a limited number of spots um, that currently exist, and I would, I'm not suggesting we change that. Just sort of waive the fee for the ones who, you know, have been doing it. And how many, do you have an estimate, Jasmine, how many of those that would be? I believe the current rules and regulations say it's 6% of the entire event. 6%. I do know that the board discussed um, dropping that number slightly for the phased one approach and then readjusting it for when we open to full capacity. Uh, so if Council is uh, amenable to the board's discretion on that, we can maintain that guideline that they voted on at their last uh, commission meeting. So another question just about our local brick and mortar, if I could, Mayor. Um, Jasmine, I, again, I'm not sure of all the rules and regulations, but let's say that one of our um, cannabis facilities, let's take a dispensary, wants to have a booth and give out, a, you know, you can't sell cannabis on the street, but you can give a 10% coupon, 10% off coupon to the thing. Is that allowed? Something like that would, that, would that be a brick and mortar that would be allowed? So currently our guidelines for uh, merchants are considered retail merchants that sell a product. We have um, we, we have a commercial category, which in the past that type of vendor or that type of merchant would fall under, which is a, a completely different um, category and, and fee-based. It is our most expensive category, which really limits the amount of uh, commercial vendors who join to participate with Village Fest. Uh, so the, the retail was really designed for um, retail, retail shops. Now, I, I understand downtown has kind of evolved, and that is probably something we should address with uh, the city clerk's office, or I'm sorry, the city attorney's office. We haven't had to address that um, yet, so I would probably defer that question to um, the city attorney's office on how we would like Village Fest for to proceed with that type of product. I think at some point it should be discussed, just so in case it comes up, we, we have a plan. Yes, and it sounds as if it will come up very soon. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. I have another question. <laughs> it's late, um, but I wanna do this right. So can you explain to me, so how many total vendor spots are there usually in Village Fest? And then how many will there be in phase one with the reduced footprint and the six foot distancing? So typically there's just slightly less than about 200 vendors. Uh, in phase one, we will have, there's, there's enough space for about 98 vendors, but we added some space um, between the vendors uh, for COVID to be a little bit more COVID friendly and uh, provide a little more visibility to some of our, our, our merchants in the downtown quarter who obviously have suffered quite a great deal over the last few months. So we've created more space. We are looking at filling um, about 78 spaces in space in, uh, I'm sorry, phase one. And then we, there's an, I, once phase two opens up, due to the parklets that are currently out there. Now that has the ability to change uh, based on either reduction and or additions to uh, the parklets. We will add an additional uh, probably 60-ish spots to, to the space. And the six foot distancing, is that required by public health? It is not required. It was just part of the conversation with the board about how we could be a little bit more COVID friendly. So we do have the ability to fulfill close to the 100 spots that are available in phase one. Thanks. I'm just asking because it seems like we want to do it from a public health perspective about what's safe based on their guidance as opposed to, I mean, it matters to how it appears safe and, you know, customer safe feelings of safety. But do you know what I mean? Some of this Absolutely. is more for show than um, actually needed to prevent the spread. Absolutely. So you'll work with the public health officer and um, department to work on that. Thank you. So there's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? 
Council Member Wood. I just want to really give a shout out to everyone who's on Village Best. It is absolutely one of those boards and commissions that we have where it's a roll up your sleeves and you have to do the work. And I really want to acknowledge not only the staff for all the work it's done, but all those people that are on the Village Fest board. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge the work that they're doing in this. So thank you to everyone who's involved. Nice. Thank you, Council Member Wood. So can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Holstich? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton? Aye. Council Member Garner? Yes. Council Member Kors? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is City Council and City Manager request for upcoming agenda development. Um, does any City Council member have a request at this time? Councilmember Garner. I just have a request regarding meeting in chambers at our next meeting. <laughs> I don't I don't know how that needs to be done, but I wanted to put that out there formally. City staff, do you have a reply for that? So I had the same question, Mayor and Council. Um, it does occur to me that our next meeting is scheduled for June 10th, which is just prior to the state lifting restrictions that would eliminate physical distancing and some of the other things that have been the primary logistical concerns about meeting in chambers. So um, one option for Council to consider would be that we might have one more uh, kind of fully remote meeting, but then June 24th after restrictions are lifted and we could presumably accommodate uh, people without the the distancing uh, might be a good opportunity to return to a full in-person meeting. But certainly up to council on that to do it sooner or later. And those distancing requirements are for if the public were to also be in chambers and it would be a larger gathering, is that right? Or would it apply to just if council was in chambers? No, that was presuming that the public would be invited to attend. So if council were thinking to just re resume having the five of you in chambers, that would be just fine. Um, separate from that, if the, that's the direction you want to go, I think staff would be curious to know what your thoughts are on resuming uh, public attendance at the meeting as well. Thank you. City Attorney, are we able to discuss this? It's not really an item that we would vote on, but it's not agendized. Um, actually, you can discuss uh, where you're going to meet, meet. That would be um, one of the kind of logistical requirements of, of the Brown Act, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, thoughts from Council? Council Member Garner? I, I was thinking that just the five of us would meet in chamber along with city staff and that we would continue to do um, phone calls for public comment until we find out for sure what the state says and then evaluate from there. Council Member Wood? I'm a little different opinion. Um, I really don't want to sit through a meeting with masks on. If masks have to be indoors, I don't, I don't people can't, facial expressions to our constituents are very important. Um, and I would, when the mask restriction for indoor is lifted, I would be much more comfortable um, meeting and maybe that's after our August recess. So city staff, that requirement would still apply indoors if we're in chambers? As it stands right now, um, I, you know, I'd have to review the guidelines to recall uh, if we do need to wear masks inside, I believe so, even with small numbers. Um, I, I believe it won't be until the 15th that that requirement will go away. At, at least, yes. Yeah, yeah, at least then. And, and in fact, good, good point, especially for members of the public without distancing, there would still be a mask requirement likely, at least for uh, persons unvaccinated. Other thoughts, comments? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton? I think all of us are anxious to get back on the dais as soon as we possibly can. Uh, but I, I'd concur with Councilmember Woods that uh, 
being on the dais mask and not uh, and the public not able to see our facial expressions would not uh, would not be appropriate. Uh, so what I would ask is uh, this is a, a a moving area of uh, rules and law, uh, and we want to be as open. For business in a traditional way as soon as we can and defer to staff to bring back uh, their recommendations uh, and be willing to change uh, very quickly uh, as the rules change. Thank you. So what I'm hearing is the next meeting before the state's reopening might be just remote like this and then hopefully we can move to chambers with a plan to invite the public as well in this either then or in the future. Is that right? Other comments? Yeah, I think um, sort of what Mayor Pro Tem said is, you know, if the state changes things before then, you know, just give the staff, I think, the guidance that we want to meet as soon as we can do so without having to wear masks. I would very much like to be in chambers together and not be floating heads on Zoom. I think we do better work when we're together. So that would be great. Other re council requests? City Manager, do you have any requests at this time for agenda development? I don't have any requests. I just want to point out that we did give you the tentative upcoming meeting schedule and that we did make a couple changes from the last time you saw it. Specifically, we did move uh, the leaf blower ordinance and outdoor merchandise to the June 24th meeting. The idea was just to, to kind of balance the, the timing a little bit. Um, and and uh, at one point it was anticipated that the business retention a group would discuss both parklets and outdoor merchandise, but really only got to the parklet discussion. So it seemed okay to, at the staff level to split those, um, even though they were kind of similar uh, topics. So just wanted to point out those changes and make sure that council is okay with uh, the June 10th meeting as it's been adjusted a little bit. Comments from council? I saw a thumbs up. Thank you. So then we will move to adjournment. The next regular city council meeting will be held on June 10th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. Thank you all. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, before we adjourn, do you have an announcement? No, we were going to do a tribute to uh, two individuals that we lost this month. Thank you. If you want to go ahead and proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we lost uh, in the first week of May to uh, individuals uh, who had been uh, residents of our uh, community for some time. Uh, the first uh, was Phil Strout, who uh, was uh, previously the uh, chair of 1PS. He was one of uh, the remarkable people uh, in the development of 1PS chair. Uh, for a number of years of the Los Compadres Neighborhood Organization. Uh, Phil was uh, 72 at the time of his death. He had been born in uh, Brownsville, Texas, raised on Long Island. Uh, he and uh, his husband, Sam, uh, met each other at the Georgetown Bar and Grill in 1974. Uh, they were together from uh, the time they met until... Uh, Phil's passing earlier this uh, month. Uh, Phil uh, and Sam were never more at home than they were at home. Here in Palm Springs, they were a part of our community. Uh, and uh, uh, I know Sam uh, is, uh, is deeply uh, in sorrow over the loss of uh, his husband and all of us uh, who have been associated with 1PS uh, are truly uh, at loss uh, with uh, uh, losing uh, Phil Strout. Second individual that we lost uh, was also uh, married to his spouse uh, for uh, over 50 years, uh, and that was Rick Supple. Uh, he and his wife uh, 
Rosine came to uh, to Palm Springs. It was a second marriage for both of them. Both of them had lost uh, spouses at a very early uh, age. Met uh, at a Stanford uh, uh, University reunion uh, and uh, quickly became a couple. During the course of their many decades in Palm Springs, uh, they were responsible for helping to establish the Palm Springs International Film Festival, supported the hospital, hospital districts, donated to the high school. Uh, they started a radio station and many other enterprises, not the least of which they were responsible for uh, the Camelot Theater, which helped to develop Cinema Diverse, the short uh, the short film festival, the American Documentary Film Festival, and then their lasting legacy to our city, uh, turning the Camelot Theater into the Palm Springs Cultural Center uh, that has been now left for generations of future Palm Springs High School students as well are, excuse me, future generations of people to enjoy the Cultural Center here in Palm Springs. Lastly, their generosity was responsible for uh, the renewal of the Richard Center at Palm Springs High School, which has been, uh, which will be an incredible resource for generations of students to come in Palm Springs. Uh, two remarkable men and just simply uh, a great loss for our city, but another tribute to the kind of city that attracts uh, individuals like Phil Strout and Rick Supple. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Appreciate that. So we will adjourn tonight in honor of Rick Supple and Phil Strout. Thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you.